Publisher's Preface to Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by K. Hand. Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. Publisher's Preface. This being the last possible volume in the series of Beacon Lights of History from the pen of Dr. Lord, its readers will be interested to know that it contains all the lectures that he had completed, although not all that he had projected, for his review of certain of the chief men of letters. Lectures on other topics were found among his papers, but none that would perfectly fit into this scheme, and it was thought best not to attempt any collection of his material which he himself had not deemed worthy or appropriate for use in this series, which embodies the best of his life's work, all of his books and his lectures that he wished to have preserved. For instance, the old Roman world, enlarged in scope and rewritten, is included in the volumes on old pagan civilizations, ancient achievements, and imperial antiquity, much of his modern Europe reappears in great rulers, modern European statesmen, and European national leaders, etc. The consideration of great writers was reserved by Dr. Lord for his final task, a task interrupted by death and left unfinished. In order to round out and complete this volume, recourse has been had to some other masters in literary art whose productions are added to Dr. Lord's final writings. In the present volume, therefore, are included the paper on Shakespeare by Emerson, reprinted from his Representative Men, by permission of Messrs. Houghton, Mifflin, and Company, the authorized publishers of Emerson's works, the famous essay on Milton by Macaulay, the principal portion, biographical and generally critical, of the article on Goethe from Hours with the German Classics, by the late Dr. Friedrich H. Hedge, by permission of Messrs. Little, Brown, and Company, the publishers of that work, and a chapter on Tennyson, The Spirit of Modern Poetry, by G. Mercer Adam. A certain advantage may accrue to the reader in finding these masters side by side for comparison and for gauging Dr. Lord's unique life work by recognized standards, keeping well in view the purpose no less than the perfection of these literary performances, all of which, like those of Dr. Lord, were aimed at setting forth the services of selected forces in the world's life. New York, September 15th, 1902. End of the Publisher's Preface Section 1 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by K. Hand. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Part 1, 1712 to 1778, Socialism and Education. Two great political writers in the 18th century, of antagonistic views, but both original and earnest, have materially affected the whole science of government, and even of social life, from their day to ours, and in their influence really belong to the 19th century. One was the Apostle of Radicalism, the other of conservatism. The one, more than any other single man, stimulated, though unwittingly, the French Revolution. The other opposed that mad outburst with equal eloquence and caused in Europe a reaction from revolutionary principles. While one is far better known today than the other, to the thoughtful, both are exponents and representatives of conflicting political and social questions which agitate this age. These men were Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Edmund Burke, one Swiss and the other English. Burke I have already treated of in a former volume. His name is no longer a power, but his influence endures in all the grand reforms of which he was a part, and for which his generation in England is praised, while his writings remain a treasure house of political and moral wisdom, sure to be drawn upon during every public discussion of governmental principles. Rousseau, although a writer of a hundred years ago, seems to me a fit representative of political, social, and educational ideas in the present day, because his theories are still potent, and even in this scientific age, more widely diffused than ever before. Not without reason, it is true, for he embodied certain germinant ideas in a fascinating literary style. But it is hard to understand how so weak a man could have exercised such far-reaching influence. 
himself a genuine and passionate lover of nature recognizing in his principles of conduct no duties that could conflict with personal inclinations born in democratic and freedom-loving switzerland and early imbued through his reading of german and english writers with ideas of liberty which in those conservative lands were wholesome he distilled these ideas into charming literary creations that were eagerly read by the restless minds of france and wrought in them political frenzy the reforms he projected grew out of his theories of the rights of man without reference to the duties that limit those rights and his appeal for their support to men's passions and selfish instincts and to a sentimental philosophy in an age of irreligion and immorality aroused a political tempest which he little contemplated in an age so infidel and brilliant as that which preceded the french revolution the writings of rousseau had a peculiar charm and produced a great effect even on men who despised his character and ignored his mission he engendered the robespierres and condorcets of the revolution those sentimental murderers who under the guise of philosophy attacked the fundamental principles of justice and destroyed the very rights which they invoked jean jacques rousseau was born at geneva in the year seventeen twelve when voltaire was first rising into notice he belonged to the plebeian ranks being the son of a watchmaker was sickly miserable and morbid from a child was poorly educated but a great devourer of novels which his father sentimental as he read with him poetry and gushing biographies although a little later he became with impartial facility equally delighted with the sturdy plutarch his nature was passionate and inconstant, his sensibilities morbidly acute, and his imagination lively. He hated all rules, precedents, and authority. He was lazy, listless, deceitful, and had a great craving for novelties and excitement. As he himself says, feeling everything and knowing nothing. At an early age, without money or friends, he ran away from the engraver to whom he had been apprenticed, and after various adventures was first kindly received by a Catholic priest in Savoy then by a generous and erring woman of wealth lately converted to catholicism and again by the priests of a catholic seminary in sardinia under whose tuition and in order to advance his personal fortunes he abjured the religion in which he had been brought up and professed catholicism this however cost him no conscientious scruples for his religious training had been of the slimmest and principles he had none we next see rousseau as a footman in the service of an italian countess where he was mean enough to accuse a servant girl for a theft he had himself committed thereby causing her ruin again employed as a footman in the service of another noble family his extraordinary talents were detected and he was made secretary but all this kindness he returned with insolence and again became a wanderer in his isolation he sought the protection of the swiss lady who had before befriended him madame de warrens he began as her secretary and ended in becoming her lover in her house he saw society and learned music a fit of caprice induced rousseau to throw up this situation and then he taught music in chambere for a living studied hard read voltaire descartes locke hobbes leibnitz and puffendorf and evinced an uncommon vivacity and talent for conversation which made him a favorite in social circles his chief labor however for five years was in inventing a system of musical notation which led him to Lyon, and then, in 1741, to Paris. He was now twenty-nine years old, a visionary man, full of schemes with crude opinions and unbounded self-conceit, but poor and unknown, a true adventurer with many agreeable qualities, irregular habits, and not very scrupulous morals. Favored by letters of introduction to ladies of distinction, for he was a favorite with the ladies who liked his enthusiasm, freshness, elegant talk, and grand sentiments, he succeeded in getting his system of musical notation examined although not accepted by the french academy and secured an appointment as secretary in the suite of the ambassador to venice in this city rousseau remained but a short time being disgusted with what he called official insolence which did not properly recognize native genius he returned to paris as poor as when he left it and lived in a cheap restaurant there he made the acquaintance of his therese a healthy amiable woman but low illiterate unappreciative and coarse the author of many of his subsequent miseries she lived with him till he died first as his mistress and housekeeper although later in life he married her she was the mother of his five children every one of whom he sent to a foundling hospital 
justifying his inhumanity by those sophistries and paradoxes with which his writings abound. Even in one of his letters appealing for pity because he had never known the sweetness of a father's embrace. With extraordinary self-conceit, too, he looked upon himself all the while, in his numerous illicit loves, as a paragon of virtue, being apparently without any moral sense or perception of moral distinctions. It was not till Rousseau was thirty-nine years of age that he attracted public attention by his writings, although earlier known in literary circles, especially in that infidel Parisian coterie where Diderot, Grimm, Dolbach, D'Alembert, David Hume, the Marquis de Mirabeau, Heveltius, and other wits shined, in which circle no genius was acknowledged and no profundity of thought was deemed possible unless allied with those pagan ideas which St. Augustine had exploded and Pascal had ridiculed. Even while living among these people, Rousseau had all the while a kind of sentimental religiosity which revolted at their ribald scoffing, although he never protested. He had written some fugitive pieces of music, and had attempted and failed in several slight operettas, composing both music and words, but the work which made Rousseau famous was his essay on a subject propounded in 1749 by the Academy of Dijon. Has the progress of science and the arts contributed to corrupt or to purify morals? This was a strange subject for a literary institution to propound, but one which exactly fitted the genius of Rousseau. The boldness of his paradox for he maintained the evil effects of science and art, and the brilliancy of his style secured readers, although the essay was crude in argument and false in logic. In his confessions, he himself condemns it as the weakest of all his works, although full of force and fire, and he adds, with whatever talent a man may be born, the art of writing is not easily learned. It has been said that Rousseau got the idea of taking the off side of this question from his literary friend Diderot, and that his unexpected success with it was the secret of his lifelong career of opposition to all established institutions. This is interesting, but not very authentic. The next year, his irregular activity having been again stimulated by learning that his essay had gained the premium at Dijon, and by the fact of its great vogue as a published pamphlet, another performance fairly raised Rousseau to the pinnacle of fashion, and this was an opera which he composed, Le Divine du Village the village sorcerer, which was performed at Fontainebleau before the court and received with unexampled enthusiasm. His profession, so far as he had any, was that of a copyist of music, and his musical taste and facile talents had at last brought him an uncritical recognition. But Rousseau soon abandoned music for literature. In 1753 he wrote another essay for the Academy of Dijon on the Origin of the Inequality of Man, full of still more startling paradoxes than his first, in which he attempted to show, with great felicity of language, the superiority of savage life over civilization. At the age of 42, Rousseau revisited Protestant Geneva, abjured in its turn the Catholic faith, and was offered the post of librarian of the city. But he could not live out of the atmosphere of Paris, nor did he wish to remain under the shadow of Voltaire, living in his villa near the city gate of Geneva, who had but little admiration for Rousseau, and whose superior social position excited the latter's envy. Yet he professed to hate Paris with its conventionalities and fashions, and sought a quiet retreat where he could more leisurely pursue his studies and enjoy nature, which he really loved. This was provided for him by an enthusiastic friend, Madame de Epinay, in the beautiful valley of Montmorency, and called the Hermitage, situated in the grounds of her Chateau de la Chevrette. Here he lived with his wife and mother-in-law, he himself enjoying the hospitalities of the chateau besides, society of a most cultivated kind, also woods, lawns, parks, gardens, all for nothing, the luxuries of civilization, the glories of nature, and the delights of friendship combined. It was an earthly paradise given him by enthusiastic admirers of his genius and conversation. In this retreat, one of the most favored which a poor author ever had, Rousseau, ever craving some outlet for his passionate sentiments, created an ideal object of love. He wrote imaginary letters, dwelling with equal rapture on those he wrote and those he fancied he received in return, and which he read to his lady friends, after his rambles in the forests and parks, during the reunions at the supper table. Thus was born the Nouvelle Eloise, a novel of immense fame, in which the characters are invested with every earthly attraction, 
living in voluptuous peace, yet giving vent to those passions which consume the unsatisfied soul. It was the forerunner of Corinne, the sorrows of Werther, Thaddeus of Warsaw, and all those sentimental romances which amused our grandfathers and grandmothers, but which increased the prejudice of religious people against novels. It was not until Sir Walter Scott arose with his wholesome manliness that the embargo against novels was removed. The life which Rousseau lived at the Hermitage, reveries in the forest, luxurious dinners, and sentimental friendships, led to a passionate love affair with the Comtesse de Houle de Tot, a sister-in-law of his patroness, Madame de Epinay, a woman not only married, but who had another lover besides. The result, of course, was miserable. Jealousies, piques, humiliations, misunderstandings, and the sundering of the ties of friendship, which led to the necessity of another retreat. A real home the wretched man never had. This was furnished, still in the vicinity of Montmorency, by another aristocratic friend, the Maréchal de Luxembourg, the fiscal agent of the Prince de Condé. And nothing to me is stranger than that this wandering, morbid, irritable man, without birth or fortune, the father of the wildest revolutionary and democratic doctrines, and always hated both by the court and the church, should have found his friends and warmest admirers and patrons in the highest circles of social life. It can be explained only by the singular fascination of his eloquence, and by the extreme stolidity of his worshippers in appreciating his doctrines, and the state of society to which his principles logically led. In this second retreat, Rousseau had the entree to the palace of the Duke of Luxembourg, where he read to the friends assembled at its banquets his new production, Emile, a singular treatise on education, not so faulty as his previous works, but still false in many of its principles, especially in regard to religion. This book contained an admirable and powerful impulse away from artificiality and towards naturalist and education, which has exerted an immense influence for good. We shall revert to it later. A few months before the publication of Emile, Rousseau had issued The Social Contract, the most revolutionary of all his works, subversive of all precedents in politics, government, and the organization of society, while also confounding Christianity with ecclesiasticism and attacking its influence in the social order. All his works obtained a wide fame before publication by reason of his habit of reading them to enthusiastic and influential friends who made them known. The social contract, however, dangerous as it was, did not, when published, arouse so much opposition as Emile. The latter book, as we now see, contained much that was admirable, but its freedom and looseness in religious discussion called down the wrath of the clergy, excited the alarm of the government, and finally compelled the author to fly for his life to Switzerland. Rousseau is now regarded as an enemy to Christian doctrine, even as he was a foe to the existing institutions of society. In Geneva, his books are publicly burned. Henceforth, his life is embittered by constant persecution. He flies from canton to canton in the freest country in Europe, obnoxious not only for his opinions but for his habits of life. He affectedly adopts the Arminian dress, with its big fur bonnet and long girdled caftan, among the Swiss peasantry. He is as full of personal eccentricities as he is of intellectual crochets. He becomes a sort of literary vagabond with every man's hand against him. He now writes a series of essays called Letters from the Mountain, full of bitterness and anti-Christian sentiments. So incensed by these writings are the country people among whom he dwells that he is again forced to fly. David Hume, regarded him as a mild, affectionate, and persecuted man, gives Rousseau a shelter in England. The wretched man retires to Derbyshire and there writes his confessions, the most interesting and most dangerous of his books showing a diseased and irritable mind and most sophistical views on the immutable principles of both morality and religion. A victim of mistrust and jealousy, he quarrels with Hume, who learns to despair his character while pitying the sensitive sufferings of one whom he calls a man born without skin. Rousseau returns to France at age of 55. After various wanderings, he is permitted to settle in Paris, where he lives with great frugality in a single room, poorly furnished, supporting himself by again copying music, sought still in high society, yet shy, reserved, forlorn, bitter. Occasionally making new friends who are attracted by the infantine simplicity of his manners and apparent amiability, but losing them almost as soon as made by his petty jealousies and irritability, being equally indignant at neglect and intolerant of attention. 
Rousseau's declining health and the fear of his friends that he was on the borders of insanity led to his last retreat, offered by a munificent friend at Hermenonville, near Paris, where he died at 66 years of age in 1778, as some think from poison administered by his own hand. The Revolutionary National Assembly of France in 1790 bestowed a pension of 1,500 francs on his worthless widow, who had married a stable boy soon after the death of her husband. Such was the checkered life of Rousseau. As to his character, Lord Brougham says that, Never were so much genius before united with so much weakness. The leading spring of his life was egotism. He never felt himself wrong, and the sophistries he used to justify his immoralities are both ludicrous and pitiable. His treatment of Madame de Warrens, his first benefactor, was heartless, while the abandonment of his children was infamous. He twice changed his religion without convictions for the advancement of his fortunes. He pretended to be poor when he was independent in his circumstances. He supposed himself to be without vanity while he was notoriously the most conceited man in France. He quarreled with all his friends. He made war on society itself. He declared himself a believer in Christianity, but denied all revelation, all miracles, all inspiration, all supernaturalism, and everything he could not reconcile with his reason. His bitterest enemies were the atheists themselves, who regarded him as a hypocrite, since he professed to believe in what he undermined. The hostility of the church was excited against him, not because he directly assailed Christianity, but because he denied all its declarations and sapped its authority. Rousseau was, however, a sentimentalist rather than a rationalist, an artist rather than a philosopher. He was not a learned man, but a bold thinker. He would root out all distinctions in society because they could not be reconciled with his sense of justice. He preached a gospel of human rights based not on Christianity, but on instinct. He was full of impracticable theories. He would have no war, no suffering, no hardship, no bondage, no fear, and even no labor, since these were evils, and according to his notions of moral government, unnecessary. But in all his grand theories he ignored the settled laws of providence, even those of that nature he so fervently worshipped, all that is decreed concerning man or woman, all that is stern and real in existence, and while he uttered such sophistries, he excited discontent with the inevitable condition of man, he loosened family ties, he relaxed wholesome restraints, he infused an intense hatred of all conditions subject to necessary toil. The life of this embittered philanthropist was as great a contradiction as were his writings. This benevolent man sends his own children to a foundling hospital. This independent man lives for years on the bounty of an erring woman whom at last he exposes and deserts. This high-minded idealizer of friendship quarrels with every man who seeks to extricate him from the consequences of his own imprudence. This affectionate lover refuses a seat at his table to the woman with whom he lives and who is the mother of his children. This proud Republican accepts a pension from King George III and lives in the houses of aristocratic admirers without payment. This religious teacher rarely goes to church or respects the outward observances of the Christianity he affects. This moral theorizer, on his own confession, steals and lies and cheats. This modest innocent corrupts almost every woman who listens to his eloquence. This lofty thinker consumes his time in frivolity and senseless quarrels. This patriot makes war on the institutions of his country and even of civilized life. This humble man turns his back on everyone who will not do him reverence. Such was this precursor of revolutions, this agitator, this hypocrite, this egotist, this lying prophet, a man admired and despised, brilliant but indefinite, original but not true, acute but not wise, logical but reasoning on false premises, advancing some great truths but spoiling their legitimate effect by sophistries and falsehoods. Why then discuss the ideas and influence of so despicable a creature? Because, sophistical as they were, those ideas contained truths of tremendous germinant power, because in the rank soil of his times they produced a vast crop of bitter poisonous fruit, while in the more open, better, aerated soil of this century they have borne and have yet to bear a fruitage of universal benefit. God's ways seem mysterious. It is for men patiently to study, understand, and utilize them. Let us turn to the more definite consideration of the writings which have given this author so brilliant a fame. I omit any review of his operas and his system of musical notation as not bearing on the opinions of society. The first work, as I have said, which brought Rousseau into notice was the Treatise for the Academy of Dijon, 
as to whether the arts and sciences have contributed to corrupt or to purify morals. Rousseau followed the bent of his genius in maintaining that they have done more harm than good, and he was so fresh and original and brilliant that he gained the prize. This little work contains the germ of all his subsequent theories, especially that in which he magnifies the state of nature over civilization. An amazing paradox which, however, appealed to society when men were wearied with the very pleasures for which they lived. Rousseau's cant about the virtues engendered by ignorance, idleness, and barbarism is repulsive to every sound mind. Civilization may present greater temptations than a state of nature, but these are inseparable from any growth and can be overcome by the valorous mind. Who but a madman would sweep away civilization with its factitious and remediable evils for barbarism with its untutored impulses and animal life? Here Rousseau makes war upon society, upon all that is glorious in the advance of intellect and the growth of morality, upon the reason and aspirations of mankind. Can inexperience be a better guide than experience when it encounters crime and folly? Yet on the other hand, a plea for a greater simplicity of life, a larger study of nature, and a freer enjoyment of its refreshing contrasts to the hothouse life of cities is one of the most responsible and healthful impulses of our own day. What can be more absurd, although bold and striking, than Rousseau's essay on the origin of human inequalities? In this, he pushes out the doctrine of personal liberty to its utmost logical sequence, so as to do away with government itself and with all regulation for the common good. We do not quarrel with his abstract propositions in respect to political equality, but his deductions strike a blow at civilization, since he maintains that inequalities of human condition are the source of all political and social evils, while Christianity, confirmed by common sense, teaches that the source of social evils is in the selfish nature of man rather than in his outward condition. And further, if it were possible to destroy the inequalities of life, they would soon again return, even with the most boundless liberty. Here, common sense is sacrificed to a captivating theory, and all the experiences of the world are ignored. This shows the folly of projecting any abstract theory, however true, to its remote and logical sequence. In the attempt, we are almost certain to be landed in absurdity, so complicated are the relations of life, especially in governmental and political science. What doctrine of civil or political economy would be applicable in all ages and all countries and all conditions? Like the ascertained laws of science or the great and accepted truths of the Bible, political axioms are to be considered in their relation with other truths equally accepted, or men are soon brought into a labyrinth of difficulties and the strongest intellect is perplexed. And especially will this be the case when a theory under consideration is not a truth, but an assumption. That was the trouble with Rousseau. His theories, disdainful of experience, however logically treated, became in their remotest sequence and application insulting to the human understanding, because they were often not only assumptions, but assumptions of what was not true, although very specious and flattering to certain classes. Rousseau confounded the great truth of the justice of moral and political equality with the absurd and unnatural demand for social and material equality. The great modern cry for equal opportunity for all is sound and Christian, but any attempt to guarantee individual success in using opportunity to ensure the lame and the lazy an equal rank in the race must end in confusion and distraction. The evil of Rousseau's crude theories or false assumptions was practically seen in the acceptance of their logical conclusions, which led to anarchy, murder, pillage, and outrageous excess. The great danger attending his theories is that they are generally half-truths, truth and falsehood blended. His writings are sophistical. It is difficult to separate the truth from the error by reason of the marvelous felicity of his language. I do not underrate his genius or his style. He was doubtless an original thinker and a most brilliant and artistic writer, and by so much did he confuse people, even by the speciousness of his logic. There is nothing indefinite in what he advances. He is not a poet dealing in mysticisms, but a rhetorical philosopher propounding startling theories, partly true and partly false, which he logically enforces with matchless eloquence. End of section one. Section two of Beacon Lights of History, volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Part 2. 
Probably the most influential of Rousseau's writings was The Social Contract, the great textbook of the Revolution. In this famous treatise, he advanced some important ideas which undoubtedly are based on ultimate truth, such as that the people are the source of power, that might does not make right, that slavery is an aggression on human rights. But with these ideal truths, he combines the assertion that government is a contract between the governor and the governed. In a perfect state of society, this may be the ideal, but society is not and never has been perfect. And certainly, in all the early ages of the world, governments were imposed upon people by the strong hand, irrespective of their wills and wishes. And these were the only governments which were fit and useful in that elder day. Governments, as a plain matter of fact, have generally arisen from circumstances and relations with which the people have had little to do. The Oriental monarchies were the gradual outgrowth of patriarchal tradition and successful military leadership, and in regard to them, the people were never consulted at all. The Roman Empire was ruled without the consent of the governed. Feudal monarchies in Europe were based on the divine rights of kings. There was no state in Europe where a compact or social contract had been made or implied. Even later, when the French elected Napoleon, they chose a monarch because they feared anarchy without making any stipulation. There were no contracting parties. The error of Rousseau was in assuming a social contract as a fact and then reasoning upon the assumption. His premises are wrong, or at least they are nothing more than statements of what abstractly might be made to follow from the assumption that the people actually are the source of power, a condition most desirable and, in the last analysis, correct. Even since military despots use the power of the people in order to oppress the people, but which is practically true only in certain states. Yet, after all, when brought under the domain of law by the sturdy sense and utilitarian sagacity of the Anglo-Saxon race, Rousseau's doctrine of the sovereignty of the people is the great political motor of this century, in republics and monarchies alike. Again, Rousseau maintains that whatever acquisitions an individual or a society may make, the right to this property must always be subordinate to the right which the community at large has over the possessions of all. Here is the germ of much of our present-day socialism. Whatever element of truth there may be in the theory that would regard land and capital, the means of production, as the joint possession of all the members of the community, the basic doctrine of socialism, any forcible attempt to distribute present results of individual production and accumulation would be unjust and dangerous to the last degree. In the case of the furious carrying out of this doctrine by the crazed French revolutionists, it led to outrageous confiscation, on the ground that all property belonged to the state, and therefore the representatives of the nation could do what they pleased with it. This shallow sophistry was accepted by the French National Convention when it swept away estates of nobles and clergy, not on the tenable ground that the owners were public enemies, but on the baseless pretext that their property belonged to the nation. From this sophistry about the rights of property, Rousseau advanced another of still worse tendency, which was that the general will is always in the right and constantly tends to the public good. The theory is inconsistent with itself. Light and truth do not come from the universal reason, but from the thoughts of great men stimulated into growth among the people. The teachers of the world belong to a small class. Society is in need of constant reforms which are not suggested by the mass, but by a few philosophers or reformers, the wise men who save cities. Rousseau further says that a whole people can never become corrupted, a most barefaced assertion. Have not all nations suffered periods of corruption? This notion that the whole people cannot err opens the door for any license. It logically leads to that other idea of the native majesty of man and the perfectibility of society, which this sophist boldly accepted. Rousseau thought that if society were released from all law and all restraint, the good impulses and good sense of the majority would produce a higher state of virtue and wisdom than what he saw around him, since majorities could do no wrong and the universal reason could not err. In this absurdity lay the fundamental principle of the French Revolution, so far as it was produced by the writings of philosophers. This doctrine was eagerly seized upon by the French people, maddened by generations of oppression, poverty, and degradation because it appealed to the pride and vanity of the masses, at that time congregated bodies of ignorance and wickedness. Rousseau had an unbounded trust in human nature, that it is good and wise and will do the best thing if left to itself. 
but can anything be more antagonistic to all the history of the race? I doubt if Rousseau had any profound knowledge or even really extensive reading. He was a dreamer, a theorist, a sentimentalist. He was the arch-priest of all sensationalism in the guise of logic. What more acceptable to the vile people of his age than the theory that in their collective capacity they could not err, that the universal reason was divine? What more logical than its culmination in that outrageous indecency, the worship of reason in the person of a prostitute? Again, Rousseau's notion of the limitations of law and the prerogative of the people carried out would lead to the utter subversion of central authority and reduce nations to an absolute democracy of small communities. They would divide and subdivide until society was resolved to its original elements. This idea existed among the early Greek states when a state rarely comprised more than a single city or town or village, such as might be found among the tribes of North American Indians. The great political question in ancient Greece was the autonomy of cities, which kept the whole land in constant wars and dissensions and quarrels and jealousies, and prevented that centralization of power which would have made Greece unconquerable and the mistress of the world. Our wholesome American system of autonomy and local affairs with a common authority in matters affecting the general good is organized liberty. But the ancient and outgrown idea of unregulated autonomy was revived by Rousseau, and though it could not be carried out by the French revolutionists who accepted nearly all of his theories, it led to the disintegration of France and the multiplication of offices fatal to a healthy central power. Napoleon broke up all this in his centralized despotism, even if, to keep the revolutionary sympathy, he retained the departments which were substituted for the ancient provinces. The extreme spirit of democratic liberty, which is the characteristic of Rousseau's political philosophy, led to the advocacy of the wildest doctrines of equality. He would prevent the accumulation of wealth, so that, to use his words, no one citizen should be rich enough to buy another, and no one so poor as to be obliged to sell himself. He would have neither rich people nor beggars. What could flow from such doctrines but discontent and unreasonable expectations among the poor, and a general fear and sense of insecurity among the rich? This state of nature, moreover, in his view, could be reached only by going backward and destroying all civilization, and it was civilization which he ever decried, a very pleasant doctrine to vagabonds, but likely to be treated with derisive mockery by all those who have something to conserve. Another and most dangerous principle which was advocated in the social contract was that religion has nothing to do with the affairs of civil and political life, that religious obligations do not bind a citizen, that Christianity, in fact, ignores all the great relations of man and society. This is distinct from the Puritan doctrine of the separation of the church from the state, by which simply meant that priests ought not interfere in matters purely political, nor the government meddle with religious affairs, a prime doctrine in a free state. But no body of men were ever more ardent defenders of the doctrine that all religious ideas ought to bear on the social and political fabric than the Puritans. They would break up slavery if it derogated from the doctrine of the common brotherhood of man as declared by Christ. They would use their influence as Christians to root out all evil institutions and laws and bring the sublime truths of the master to bear on all the relations of life, on citizens at the ballot box, at the helm of power, and in legislative bodies. Christianity was to them the supreme law with which all human laws must harmonize. But Rousseau would throw out Christianity altogether as foreign to the duties and relations of both citizens and rulers, pretending that it ignored all connection with mundane affairs and had reference only to the salvation of the soul, as if all Christ's teachings were not regulative of the springs of conduct between man and man, as indicative of the relations between man and God. Like Voltaire, Rousseau had the excuse of a corrupt ecclesiasticism to be broken into, but the church and Christianity are two different things. This he did not see. No one was more impatient of all restraints than Rousseau, yet he maintained that men, if calling themselves Christian, must submit to every wrong and injustice, looking for a remedy in the future world, thus pouring contempt on those who had no right, according to his view of their system, to complain of injustice or strive to rise above temporal evils. Christianity, he said, inculcates servitude and dependence. Its spirit is favorable to tyrants. True Christians are formed to be slaves, and they know it, and never will trouble themselves about conspiracy and insurrections, since this transitory world has no value in their eyes. He denied that Christians could be good soldiers, 
a falsehood rebuked for us by the wars of the reformation by the troops of cromwell and gustavus adolphus by our american soldiers in the late civil war thus he would throw away the greatest stimulus to heroism even the consciousness of duty and devotion to great truths and interests i cannot follow out the political ideas of rousseau in his various other treatises in which he prepared the way for revolution and for the excesses of the reign of terror the truth is rousseau's feelings were vastly superior to his thinking whatever of good is to result from his influence will arise out of the impulse he gave toward the search for ideals that should embrace the many as well as the few in their benefits when he himself attempted to apply this impulse to philosophic political thought his unregulated mind went all astray let us now turn to consider a moment his doctrines pertaining to education as brought out in his greatest and most unexceptionable work his emile in this remarkable book everything pertaining to human life appears to be discussed the duty of parents child management punishments perception and the beginning of thinking toys games catechisms all passions and sentiments religion friendship love jealousy pity the means of happiness the pleasures and profits of travel the principles of virtue of justice and liberty language books the nature of man and woman the arts of conventional life politeness riches poverty society marriage on all these and other questions he discourses with great sagacity and good sense and with unrivalled beauty of expression often rising to great eloquence never dull or uninstructive aiming to present virtue and vice in their true colors inspiring exalted sentiments and presenting happiness in simple pleasures and natural life this treatise is both full and original the author supposes an imaginary pupil named emile and he himself entrusted with the care of the boy's education attends him from his cradle to his manhood assists him with the necessary directions for his general improvement and finally introduces him to an amiable and unsophisticated girl whose love he wins by his virtues and whom he honorably marries so that although a treatise the work is invested with the fascination of a novel in reading this book which made so great a noise in europe with so much that is admirable i find but little to criticize except three things which mar its beauty and make it both dangerous and false in which the unsoundness of rousseau's mind and character the strange paradoxes of his life in mixing up good with evil are brought out and that so forcibly that the author was hunted and persecuted from one part of europe to another on account of it the first is that he makes all natural impulses generous and virtuous and man therefore naturally good instead of perverse thus throwing not only christianity but experience entirely aside and laying down maxims which logically carried out would make society perfect if only nature were always consulted this doctrine indirectly makes all the treasures of human experience useless and untutored impulse the guide of life it would break the restraints which civilization and a knowledge of life impose and reduce man to a primitive state in the advocacy of this subtle falsehood rousseau pours contempt on all the teachings of mankind on all schools and colleges on all conventionalities and social laws yea on learning itself he always stigmatizes scholars as pedants second he would reduce woman to insignificance having her rule by arts and small devices making her the inferior of man on whom she is dependent and to whose caprice she is bound to submit a sort of toy or slave engrossed only with domestic duties like the woman of antiquity he would give new rights and liberties to man but none to woman as man's equal thus keeping her in a dependence utterly irreconcilable with the bold freedom which he otherwise advocates the dangerous tendency of his writings is somewhat checked however by the everlasting hostility with which women of character and force of will such as they call strong-minded will ever pursue him he will be no oracle to them but a still more marked defect weakens emile as one of the guide-books of the world great as are its varied excellencies the author undermines all faith in christianity as a revelation or as a mean of man's communion with the divine for guidance consolation or inspiration nor does he support one of his moral or religious doctrines by an appeal to the sacred scriptures which have been so deep a well of moral and spiritual wisdom for so many races of men practically he is infidel and pagan although he professes to admire some of the moral truths which he never applies to his system he is a pure theist or deist recognizing like the old greeks no religion but that of nature 
and valuing no attainments but such as are suggested by nature and reason, which are the gods he worships from first to last in all his writings. The Confession of Faith by the Savoyard Vicar, introduced into the fourth of the six books of this work, which having nothing to do with his main object, he unnecessarily drags in, is an artful and specious onslaught on all doctrines and facts revealed in the Bible, on all miracles, all prophecies, and all supernatural revelation, thus attacking Christianity in its most vital points and making it of no more authority than Buddhism or Mohammedanism. Faith is utterly extinguished. A cold reason is all that he would leave to man, no consolation but what the mind can arrive at unaided, no knowledge but what can be reached by original scientific investigation. He destroys not only all faith but all authority, by a low appeal to prejudices and by vulgar wit such as the infidels of a former age used in their heartless and flippant controversies. I am not surprised at the hostility displayed even in France against him by both Catholics and Protestants. When he advocated his rights of man, from which Thomas Paine and Jefferson himself drew their maxims, he appealed to the self-love of the great mass of men ground down by feudal injustices and inequalities. To the sense of justice, sophistically it is true, but in a way which commanded the respect of the intellect. When he assailed Christianity in its innermost fortresses, while professing to be a Christian, he incurred the indignation of all Christians and the contempt of all infidels, for he added hypocrisy to skepticism, which they did not. Diderot, d'Alembert, and others were bold unbelievers, and did not veil their hostilities under a weak disguise. I have never read a writer who in spirit was more essentially pagan than Rousseau, or who wrote maxims more entirely antagonistic to Christianity. Aside from these great falsities, the perfection of natural impulse, the inferiority of woman, and the worthlessness of Christianity, as inculcated in this book, Emile must certainly be ranked among the great classics of educational literature. With these expurgated, it confirms the admirable methods inspired by its unmethodical suggestions. Noting the oppressiveness of the usual order of education through books and apparatus, he scorns all tradition and cries, let the child learn direct from nature. Himself sensitive and humane, having suffered as a child from the tyranny of adults, he demands the tenderest care and sympathy for children a patient study of their characteristics, a gentle progressive leading of them to discover for themselves rather than a cramming of them with facts. The first moral education should be negative, no preaching of virtue and truth, but shielding from vice and error. He says, take the very reverse of the current practice and you will almost always do right. This spirit indeed is the key to his entire plan. His ideas were those of the 19th, not the 18th century. Free play to childish vitality, punishment the natural inconvenience consequent on wrongdoing, the incitement of the desire to learn, the training of sense activity rather than reflection. In early years, the acquirement of the power to learn rather than the acquisitions of learning. In short, the natural and scientifically progressive rather than the bookish and analytically literary method was the end and aim of Emile. Actually, this book accomplished little in its own time, chiefly because of its attack on established religion. Influentially, it reappeared in Pestalozzi, the first practical reformer of methods, in Frabel, the inventor of the kindergarten, in Spencer, the great systematizer of the philosophy of development, and through these its spirit pervades the whole world of education at the present time. In Rousseau's New Heloise, there are the same contradictions, the same paradoxes, the same unsoundness as in his other works, but it is more eloquent than any. It is a novel in which he paints all the aspirations of the soul, all its unrest, all its indefinite longings, its raptures, and its despair, in which he unfetters the imagination and sanctifies every impulse, not only of affection, but of passion. This novel was the pioneer of the sentimental romances which rapidly followed in France and England and Germany. Worse than our sensational literature, since the author veiled his immoralities by painting the transports of passion under the guise of love, which ever has its seat in the affections and is sustained only by respect. Here, Rousseau was a disguised seducer, a poisoner of the moral sentiments, a foe to what is most sacred and he was the more dangerous from his irresistible eloquence. His sophistries in regard to political and social rights may be met by reason, but not his attacks on the heart with his imaginary sorrows and joys. 
his painting of raptures which can never be found. Here he undermines virtue as he had undermined truth and law. Here reprobation must become unqualified, and he appears one of the very worst men who ever exercised a commanding influence on a wicked and perverse generation. And this view of the man is rather confirmed by his own confessions, a singularly attractive book, yet from which, after the perusal of the long catalogue of his sorrows, joys, humiliations, triumphs, ecstasies, and miseries, glories, and shame, one rises with great disappointment, since no great truths, useful lessons, or even ennobling sentiments are impressed upon the mind to make us wiser or better. The confessions are only a revelation of that sensibility, excessive and morbid, which reminds us of Byron and his misanthropic poetry, showing a man defiant, proud, vain, unreasonable, unsatisfied, supremely worldly, and egotistic. The first six books are merely annals of sentimental debauchery, the last six a kind of thermometer of friendship, containing an accurate account of kisses given and received, with slights, huffs, visits, quarrels, suspicions, and jealousies, interspersed with grand sentiments and profound views of life and human nature, yet all illustrative of the utter vanity of earth and the failure of all moral pleasures to satisfy the cravings of an immortal mind. The confessions remind us of Manfred and Ecclesiastes blended. Exceedingly readable and often unexceptionable, where virtue is commended and vice portrayed in its true light, but on the whole, a book which no unsophisticated or inexperienced person can read without the consciousness of receiving a moral taint, a book in no respect leading to repose or lofty contemplation, or to submission to the evils of life, which it catalogues with amazing detail, a book not even conducive to innocent entertainment. It is the revelation of the inner life of a sensualist, an egotist, and a hypocrite, with a maudlin, although genuine, admiration for nature and virtue and friendship and love. And the book reveals one of the most miserable and dissatisfied men that ever walked the earth, seeking peace in solitude and virtue, while yielding to unrestrained impulses. A man of morbid sensibility, ever yearning for happiness and pursuing it by impossible and impracticable paths. No sadder autobiography has ever been written. It is a lame and impotent attempt at self-justification, revealing on every page the writer's distrust of the virtues which he exalts, and of man whose reason and majesty he deifies, even of the friendships in which he sought consolation, and of the retirements where he hoped for rest. The book reveals the man. The writer has no hope or repose or faith. Nothing pleases him long, and he is driven by his wild and undisciplined nature from one retreat to another, by persecution more fancied than real, until he dies not without suspicion of having taken his own life. Such was Rousseau, the greatest literary genius of his age, the apostle of the reforms which are attempted in the French Revolution, and of ideas which still have a wondrous power, some of which are grand and true, but more of which are sophistical, false, and dangerous. His theories are all plausible, and are all enforced with matchless eloquence of style, but not with eloquence of thought or true feeling, like the soaring flights of Pascal, in every respect his superior in genius because more profound and lofty. Rousseau's writings, like his life, are one vast contradiction, the blending of truth with error, the truth valuable even when commonplace, the error subtle and dangerous, so that his general influence must be considered bad wherever man is weak or credulous or inexperienced or perverse. I wish I could speak better of a man whom so many honestly admire, and whose influence has been so marked during the last hundred years, and will be equally great for a hundred years to come a man from whom Madame de Stal, Jefferson, and Lamartine drew so much of their inspiration, whose ideas about childhood have so helpfully transformed the educational method of our own time. But I must speak my honest conviction from the light I have, at the same time hoping that fuller light may justify more leniency to one of the oracles whose doctrines are still cherished by many of the guides of modern thought. End of section 2 Section 3 of Beacon Lines of History, Volume 13, Great Writers, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Sir Walter Scott, Part 1. 1771 to 1832. The Modern Novel. 
In the early decades of the 19th century, the two most prominent figures in English literature were Sir Walter Scott and Lord Byron. They are still read and admired, especially Scott, but it is not easy to understand the enormous popularity of these two men in their own day. Their busts or pictures were in every cultivated family and in almost every shop window. Everybody was familiar with the lineaments of their countenances and even with every peculiarity of their dress. Who did not know the shape of the Byronic collar and the rough, plated form of the Wizard of the North? Who could not repeat the most famous passages in the writings of these two authors? Is it so now? If not, what a commentary might be written on human fame? How transitory are the judgments of men in regard to everyone whom fashion stamps? The verdict of critics is that only some half-dozen authors are now read with the interest and glow which their works called out a hundred years ago. Even the novels of Sir Walter, although to be found in every library, kindle but little enthusiasm compared with that excited by the masterpieces of Thackeray, Dickens, George Eliot, and of the favorites of the passing day. Why is this? Will these later lights also cease to burn? Will they too pass away? Is this age so much advanced that what pleased our grandfathers and grandmothers has no charm for us, but is often flat, stale, and unprofitable? At least, decidedly uninteresting? I am inclined to the opinion that only a very small part of any man's writings is really immortal. Take out the elegy in a country churchyard and how much is left of gray for other generations to admire. And so of Goldsmith, besides the vicar of Wakefield and the deserted village, there is little in his writings that is likely to prove immortal. Johnson wrote but little poetry that is now generally valued. Certainly his own dictionary, his greatest work, is not immortal, and is scarcely a standard. Indeed, we have outgrown nearly everything which was prized so highly a century ago, not only in poetry and fiction, but in philosophy, theology, and science. Perhaps that is least permanent which once was regarded as most certain. If, then, the poetry and novels of Sir Walter Scott are not so much read or admired as they once were, we only say that he is no exception to the rule. I have in mind but two authors in the whole range of English literature that are read and prized as much today as they were two hundred years ago. And if this is true, what shall we say of rhetoricians like Macaulay, of critics like Carlyle, of theologians like Jonathan Edwards, of historians like Hume and Guizot, and of many other great men of whom it has been the fashion to say that their works are lasting as the language in which they are written? Some few books will doubtless live, but alas, how few! Where now are the 800,000 in the Alexandrian library, which Ptolemy collected with so great care? What, even their titles? Where are the writings of Varro, said to have been the most learned man of all antiquity? I make these introductory remarks to show how shallow is the criticism passed upon a novelist or poet like Scott, in that he is not now so popular or so much read as he was in his own day. It is the fate of most great writers, the Augustines, the Voltaires, the Bales of the world. It is enough to say that they were lauded and valued in their time, since this is about all we can say of most of the works supposed to be immortal. But when we remember the enthusiasm with which the novels of Scott were at first received, the great sums of money which were paid for them, and the honors he received from them, he may well claim a renown and a popularity such as no other literary man ever enjoyed. His eyes beheld the glory of a great name, his ears rang with the plaudits of idolaters. He had the consciousness of doing good work, universally acknowledged and gratefully remembered. Scarcely any other novelist ever created so much healthy pleasure combined with so much sound instruction. And further, he left behind him a reproachless name, having fewer personal defects than any literary man of his time, being everywhere beloved, esteemed, and almost worshipped whom distant travelers came to see, sure of kind and gracious treatment, a hero in their eyes to the last, with no drawbacks such as marred the fame of Byron or of Burns. That so great a genius as Scott is fading in the minds of this generation may be not without comfort to those honest and hard-working men in every walk of human life who can say, we too were useful in our day and had our share of honors and rewards, all perhaps that we deserved or even more. What if we are forgotten, as most men are destined to be? To live in the mouths of men is not the greatest thing or the best. Act well your part, there all the honor lies. 
for life, after all, is a drama or a stage. The supremest happiness is not in being praised, it is in the consciousness of doing right and being possessed with the power of goodness. When, however, a man has been seated on such a lofty pinnacle as was Sir Walter Scott, we wish to know something of his personal traits and the steps by which he advanced to fame. Was he overrated, as most famous men have been? What is the niche he will probably occupy in the temple of literary fame? What are the characteristics of his productions? What gave him his prodigious and extraordinary popularity? Was he a born genius like Byron and Burns, or was he merely a most industrious worker, aided by fortunate circumstances and the caprices of fashion? What were the intellectual forces of his day, and how did he come to be counted among them? All these points it is difficult to answer satisfactorily, but some light may be shed upon them. The bulky volumes of Lockhart's biography constitute a mine of information about Scott, but are now heavy reading, without much vivacity, affording a strong contrast to Boswell's Life of Johnson, which concealed nothing that we would like to know. A son-in-law is not likely to be a dispassionate biographer, especially when family pride and interest restrain him. On the other hand, it is not wise for a biographer to be too candid and belittle his hero by the enumeration of foibles not consistent with the general tenor of the man's life. Lockhart's knowledge of his subject and his literary skill have given us much, and with Scott's own letters and the critical notice of his contemporaries, both the man and his works may be fairly estimated. Most biographers aim to make the birth and parentage of their heroes as respectable as possible. Of authors who are nobly born, there are very few. Most English and Scotch literary men are descended from ancestors of the middle class, lawyers, clergymen, physicians, small landed proprietors, merchants, and so on, who were able to give their sons an education in the universities. Sir Walter Scott traced his descent to an ancient Scottish chief. His grandfather, Robert Scott, was bred to the sea, but being shipwrecked near Dundee, he became a farmer and was active in the cattle trade. Scott's father was a writer to the signet in Edinburgh, what would be called in England a solicitor, a thriving, respectable man having a large and lucrative legal practice and being highly esteemed for his industry and integrity. A zealous Presbyterian, formal and precise in manner, strict in the observance of the Sabbath and of all that he considered to be right. His wife, Anne Rutherford, was the daughter of a professor of medicine in the University of Edinburgh, a lady of rather better education than the average of her time, a mother whom Sir Walter remembered with great tenderness and to whose ample memory and power of graphic description he owed much of his own skill in reproducing the past. Twelve children were the offspring of this marriage, although only five survived very early youth. Walter, the ninth child, was born on the 15th of August, 1771, and when quite young, in consequence of a fever, lost for a time the use of his right leg. By the advice of his grandfather, Dr. Rutherford, he was sent into the country for his health. As his lameness continued, he was, at the age of four, removed to Bath, going to London by sea. Bath was then a noted resort, and its waters were supposed to cure everything. Here, little Walter remained a year under the care of his aunt when he returned to Edinburgh to his father's house in George Square, which was his residence until his marriage, with occasional visits to the county seat of his maternal grandfather. He completely regained his health, although he was always lame. From the autobiography which Scott began but did not complete, it would appear that his lameness and solitary habits were favorable to reading, that even as a child he was greatly excited by tales and poems of adventure, and that as a youth he devoured everything he could find pertaining to early Scottish poetry and romance, of which he was passionately fond. He was also peculiarly susceptible to the beauties of Scottish scenery, being thus led to enjoy the country and its sports at a much earlier age than is common with boys, which love was never lost, but grew with his advancing years. Among his fellows, he was a hardy player, a forward fighter in boyish bickers, and a teller of tales that delighted his comrades. He was sweet-tempered, merry, generous, and well-beloved, yet peremptory and pertinacious in pursuit of his own ideas. In 1779, Walter was sent to the high school in Edinburgh, but his progress here was by no means remarkable, although he laid a good foundation for the acquisition of the Latin language. He also had a tutor at home, and from him learned the rudiments of French. With a head all on fire for chivalry and Scottish ballads, he admired the old Tory cavaliers and hated the roundheads and Presbyterians. In three years, he had become fairly familiar with Caesar, Livy, Sallust, Virgil, Horace, and Terence. 
He also distinguished himself by making Latin verses. From the high school, he entered the University of Edinburgh, very well grounded in French and Latin. For Greek and mathematics, he had an aversion, but made up for this deficiency by considerable acquisitions in English literature. He was delighted with both Ossian and Spencer, and could repeat the Fairy Queen by heart. His memory, like that of Macaulay, was remarkable. What delighted him more than Spencer were Houle's translations of Tasso and Aristotle. Later, he learned Italian and read these in the original. And Percy's Relics of Ancient Poetry. At college, he also read the best novels of the day, especially the works of Richardson, Fielding, and Smollett. He made respectable progress in philosophy under the teaching of the celebrated Dugald Stewart and Professor Bruce, and in history under Lord Wodehousley. On the whole, he was not a remarkable boy, except for his notable memory, which, however, kept only what pleased him, and his very decided bent toward the poetic and chivalric in history, life, and literature. Walter was trained by his father to the law, and on leaving college he served the ordinary apprenticeship of five years in his father's office and attendance upon the law classes in the university, but the drudgery of the law was irksome to him. When the time came to select his profession, as writer to the signet or an advocate, he preferred the latter, although success here was more uncertain than as a solicitor. Up to the time of his admission to the bar, he had read an enormous number of books in a desultory way, and made many friends, some of whom afterwards became distinguished. His greatest pleasures were in long walks in the country with chosen companions. His love of nature amounted to a passion, and in his long rambles he acquired not only vigorous health, but the capacity of undergoing great fatigue. Scott's autobiography closes with his admission to the bar. From his own account, his early career had not been particularly promising, although he was neither idle nor immoral. He was fond of convivial pleasures, but never had uncommon self-control. All his instructors were gentlemanly, and he had access to the best society in Edinburgh, when that city was noted for its number of distinguished men in literature and in the different professions. His most intimate friends were John Irving, Sir Archibald Campbell, the Earl of Dalhousie, and Adam Ferguson, with whom he made excursions to the Highlands, into ruined castles and abbeys of historic interest, following with tireless search the new trail of an old border ballad, or taking a thirty-mile walk to clear up some local legend of battle, foray, or historic event. In all these antiquarian raids, the young fellows mingled freely with the people, and tramped the counties round about in a most hilarious mood, by no means escaping the habits of the day in tavern sprees and drink abouts, although Scott's companions testify to his temperate indulgence. The young lawyer was, indeed, unwittingly preparing for his mission to paint Scottish scenery so vividly, and Scottish characters so charmingly, that he may almost be said to have created a new country which succeeding generations delight to visit. No man was ever a greater benefactor to Scotland, whose glories and beauties he was the first to reveal, showing how the most thrifty, practical, and parsimonious people may be at the same time the most poetic. Here Burns and he go hand in hand, although as a poet, Scott declared that he was not to be named in the same day with this most unfortunate man of genius that his country and his century produced. How singular that in all worldly matters the greater genius should have been a failure, while he who was born a poet was the lesser light, should have been the greatest popular success of which Scotland can boast. And yet there is something almost as pathetic and tragical in the career of the man who worked himself to death as in that of the man who drank himself to death. The most supremely fortunate writer of his day came to a mournful end, notwithstanding his unparalleled honors and his magnificent rewards. At the time Scott was admitted to the bar, he was not, of course, aware of his great original creative powers, nor could he have had very sanguine expectations of a brilliant career. The profession he had chosen was not congenial with his habits or his genius, and hence, as a lawyer, he was not a success. And yet he was not a failure, for he had the respect of some of the finest minds in Edinburgh, and at once gained as an advocate enough to support himself, respectively, among aristocratic people. Aided, no doubt, by his father, who, as a prosperous writer to the signet, threw business into his hands. Amid his practice at the courts, he found time to visit some of the most interesting spots in Scotland, and he had money enough to gratify his tastes. He was a thriving rather than a prosperous lawyer, that is to say, he earned his living. But Scott was too much absorbed in literary studies and in writing ballads to give to his numerous friends the hope of a distinguished legal career. No man can serve two masters. His heart was in the highlands a chase in the deer, 
or ransacking distant villages for antiquarian lore, or collecting ancient Scottish minstrelry, or visiting moss-covered and ivy-clad ruins, famous before John Knox swept monasteries and nunneries away as cages of unclean birds. But most of all, he was interested in the feuds between the lowland and highland chieftains, and in the contest between roundheads and cavaliers when Scotland lost her political independence. He did, however, find much in Scotch law to enrich his mind, with entanglements and antiquarian records, as well as the humors and tragedies of the courts, and of this his writings show many traces. No young lawyer ever had more efficient friends than Walter Scott, and richly he deserved them, for he was generous, companionable, loyal, a brilliant storyteller, a good hunter and sportsman, bright, cheerful, and witty, doubtless one of the most interesting young men in his beautiful city, modest, too, and unpretentious, yet proud, claiming nothing that nothing might be denied him, a favorite in the most select circles. His most striking peculiarity was his good sense, keeping him from all exaggerations which were always offensive to him. He was a Tory indeed, but no aristocrat ever had a more genial humanity, taking pleasure in any society where he could learn anything. His appetite was so healthy from his rural sports and pedestrian feats that he could dine equally well on a broiled haddock or a saddle of venison, although from the minuteness of his descriptions of Scottish banquets, one might infer that he had great appreciation of the pleasures of the table. It is not easy to tell when Scott began to write poetry, but probably when he was quite young. He wrote for the pleasure of it, without any idea of devoting his life to literature. Writing ballads was the solace of his leisure hours. His acquaintance with Francis, Lord Geoffrey, began in the 1791 at a club, where he read an essay on ballads which so much interested the future critic that he sought an introduction to its author. And, the acquaintance thus begun between these two young men, both of whom unconsciously stood on the threshold of great careers, ripened into friendship. This happened before Scott was called to the bar in 1792. It was two years afterwards that he produced a poem which took by surprise a literary friend, Miss Cranston, and caused her to exclaim, Upon my word, Walter Scott is going to turn out a poet, something of a cross between Burns and Gray. In 1795, Scott was appointed one of the curators of the Advocates' Library, a compliment bestowed only on those members of the bar known to have a zeal in literary affairs. But I do not read that he published anything until 1796, when appeared his translation from the German of Berger's Ballads, The Wild Huntsman, and Lenore. This called out high commendation from Dugald Stewart, the famous professor of moral philosophy in the University of Edinburgh, and from other men of note, but obtained no recognition in England. It was during one of his rambles with his friend Ferguson to the English Lakes in 1797 that Scott met Miss Charlotte Margaret Carpenter, or Charpentier, a young French lady of notable beauty and lovely character. She had an income of about 200 pounds a year, which, added to his earnings as an advocate, then about 150 pounds, encouraged him to offer to her his hand. For a young couple just starting in life, 350 pounds was an independence. The engagement met with no opposition from the lady's family, and in December of 1797, Scott was married and took a modest house in Castle Street, being then 26 years of age. The marriage turned out to be a happy one, although Covenants had something to do with it. Of course, so healthy and romantic a nature as Scott's had not passed through the susceptible time of youth without a love affair. From so small a circumstance as the lending of his umbrella to a young lady, Margaret, the beautiful daughter of Sir John Belches, he enjoyed five years of affection and of what seems to have been a reasonable hope, which, however, was finally ended by the young lady's marrying Mr. William Forbes, a well-to-do banker, and later one of Scott's best friends. Three years of dreaming and two years of waking, Scott calls it in one of his diaries, 30 years later, and then his own marriage followed within a year after that of his lost love. With an income sufficient only for the necessities of life, as a married man in society, Scott had not much to spare for expensive dinners, although given to hospitality. What money he could save was spent for books and travel. At 26, he had visited what was most interesting in Scotland, either in scenery or historical associations, and some parts of England, especially the Cumberland Lakes. He took a cottage at Laswade, near Edinburgh, and began there the fascinating pursuit of tree planting and place making. His vacations when the courts were not in session were spent in excursions to mountain scenery 
and those retired villages where he could pick up antiquarian lore, particularly old border ballads, heroic traditions of the times of chivalry, and of the conflicts of Scottish chieftains. Concerning these, no man in Scotland knew so much as he, his knowledge furnishing the foundation alike of his lays and his romances. His enthusiasm for these scenic and historic interests was unquenchable, a source of perpetual enjoyment which made him a most acceptable visitor wherever he chose to go, both among antiquaries and literary men, and ladies of rank and fashion. In March 1799, Mr. and Mrs. Scott visited London, where they were introduced to many distinguished literary men. On their return to Edinburgh, the office of Sheriff Depute of Selkirkshire having become vacant, worth £300 a year, Scott received the appointment which increased his income to about £700. Although his labors were light, the office entailed the necessity of living in that county a few months in each year. It was a pastoral, quiet, peaceful part of the country belonging to the Duke of Buckley, his friend and patron. He published translation in this year of Goethe's Getz of Berklagen, added to his growing reputation, and led him on towards his career. End of section 3. Section 4 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Sir Walter Scott, Part Two. With a secure and settled income, Scott now meditated a literary life. A hundred years ago, such a life was impossible without independent means, if a man would mingle in society and live conventionally and what was called respectably. Even Burns had to accept a public office, although it was a humble one and far from lucrative, but it gave him what poetry could not, his daily bread. Hogg, peasant poet of the Ettrick Forest, was supported in all his earlier years by tending sheep and borrowing money from his friends. The first genuine literary adventure of Scott was his collection of A Scottish Minstelsry, printed for him by James Ballantyne, a former schoolfellow, who had been encouraged by Scott to open a shop in Edinburgh. The preparation of this labor of love occupied the editor a year, assisted by John Layden, a man of great promise, who died in India in 1811, having made a mark as an Orientalist. About this time began Scott's memorable friendship with George Ellis, the most discriminating and useful of all his literary friends. In the same year he made the acquaintance of Thomas Campbell, the poet, who had already achieved fame by his Pleasures of Hope. It was in 1802 that the first and second volumes of The Minstrelsy appeared, in an edition of 800 copies, Scott's share of the profit amounting to £78.10, shillings which did not pay him for the actual expenditure in the collection of his materials. The historical notes with which he elucidated the value of the ancient ballads, and the freshness and vigor of those which he himself wrote for the collection, secured warm commendations from Ellis Ritson and other friends, and the whole issue was sold, yet the work did not bring him wide fame. The third and last volume was issued in 1803. The work is full of Scott's best characteristics, wide historical knowledge, wonderful industry, humor, pathos, and a sympathetic understanding of life, that of the peasant as well as the knight, such as seizes the imagination. Lockhart quotes a passage of Scott's own self-criticism. I am sensible that if there be anything good about my poetry or prose either, it is a hurried frankness of composition, which pleases soldiers, sailors, and young people of bold and active dispositions. His ability to toil terribly in accumulating choice material and then fusing it in his own spirit, to throw it forth among men with this hurried frankness that stirs the blood, was the secret of his power. Scott did not become famous, however, until his first original a poem appeared, The Lay of the Last Minstrel, printed by Ballantine in 1805 and published by Longman of London and Constable of Edinburgh. It was a great success. Nearly 50,000 copies were sold in Great Britain alone by 1830. For the first edition of 750 copies quarto, Scott received 169 pounds 6 shillings and then sold the copyright for 500 pounds. In the meantime, a rich uncle died without children and Scott's share of the property enabled him, in 1804, to rent from his cousin, Major General Sir James Russell, the pretty property called Ass Hestiel, a cottage and farm on the banks of the Tweed, altogether a beautiful place, where he lived when discharging his duties of Sheriff of Selkirkshire. 
he has celebrated the charms of Asestiel in the canto production to Marmion. His income at this time amounted to about a thousand pounds a year, which gave him a position among the squires of the neighborhood, complete independence, and leisure to cultivate his taste. His fortune was now made, with poetic fame besides, and powerful friends, he was a man every way to be envied. The lay of the last minstrel placed Scott among the three great poets of Scotland for originality and beauty of rhyme. It is not marked by pathos or by philosophical reflections. It is a purely descriptive poem of great vivacity and vividness, easy to read and true to nature. It is a tale of chivalry and is to poetry what Froissart's chronicles are to history. Nothing exactly like it had before appeared in English literature. It appealed to all people of romantic tastes and was reproachless from a moral point of view. It was a book for a lady's bower, full of chivalric sentiments and stirring incidents, and of unflagging interest from beginning to end, partly warlike and partly monastic, describing the adventures of knights and monks. It deals with wizards, harpers, dwarfs, priests, warriors, and noble dames. It sings of love and wassailings, of gentle ladies' tears, of castles and festal halls, of pennons and lances, of ancient deeds so long forgot, of feuds whose memory was not, of forests now laid waste and bare, of towers which harbor now the hare. In the lay of the last minstrel, there is at least one immortal stanza which would redeem the poem, even if otherwise mediocre. How few poets can claim as much as this. Very few poems live except for some splendid passages which cannot be forgotten and which give fame. I know nothing, even in Burns, finer than the following lines. Breathes there the man, with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said, This is mine own, my native land, whose heart hath ne'er within him burned, as home his footsteps he hath turned from wandering on a foreign strand. If such there breathe, go mark him well, for him no minstrel raptures swell. High though his titles, proud his name, boundless wealth as wish can claim. Despite those titles, power and pelf, the wretch, concentred all in self, living shall forfeit far renown, and doubly dying shall go down to the vile dust from whence he sprung, unwept, unhonored, and unsung. The favor with which the lay of the last minstrel was received, greater than that of any narrative poem of equal length which had appeared for two generations, even since Dryden's day, naturally brought great commendation from Geoffrey, the keenest critic of the age, in the famous magazine of which he was the editor. The Edinburgh Review had been started only in 1802 by three young men of genius, Geoffrey, Brougham, and Sidney Smith, and had already attained great popularity but not such marvelous influence as it wielded ten years afterwards, when 9,000 copies were published every three months, and at such a price as gave to its contributors a splendid remuneration, and to its editors absolute critical independence. The only objection to this powerful periodical was the severity of its criticisms, which often also were unjust. It seemed to be the intent of the reviewers to demolish everything that was not of extraordinary merit. Fierce attacks are not criticism. The articles in the Edinburgh Review were of a different sort from the polished and candid literary dissections which made the St. Bev so justly celebrated. In the beginning of the century, however, these savage attacks were all the fashion and to be expected, yet they stung authors almost to madness, as in the case of the review of Byron's early poetry. Literary courtesy did not exist. Justice gave place generally to ridicule or sarcasm. The Edinburgh Review was a terror to all pretenders, and often to men of real merit. But it was published when most judges were cruel and severe, even in the halls of justice. The friendship between Scott and Geoffrey had been very close for ten years before the inception of the Edinburgh Review, and although Scott was, perhaps growing out of his love for antiquarian researches and admiration of things that had been, an inveterate conservative and Tory, while the new review was slashingly liberal and progressive, he was drawn in by friendship and literary interest to be a frequent contributor during its first three or four years. The politics of the Edinburgh Review, however, and the establishment in 1808 of the Conservative Quarterly Review caused a gradual cessation of this literary connection without marring the friendly relations between the two men. About this time began Scott's friendship with Wordsworth, for whom he had great respect. 
Indeed, his modesty led him to prefer everybody's good poetry to his own. He felt himself inferior not only to Burns, but also to Wordsworth and Camel and Coleridge and Byron, as in many respects he undoubtedly was. But it requires in an author discernment and humility of a rare kind to make him capable of such a discrimination. More important to him than any literary friendship was his partnership with James Ballantine, the printer, whom he had known from his youth. This, in the end, proved unfortunate and nearly ruined him. For Ballantine, though an accomplished man and a fine printer, as well as enterprising and sensible, was not a safe businessman, being over-sanguine. For a time, however, this partnership, which was kept secret, was an advantage to both parties, although Scott embarked in the enterprise his whole available capital, about £5,000. In connection with the publishing business, soon added to the printing, with James Ballantine's brother John as figurehead of the concern, a talented but dissipated and reckless good fellow with no more head for business than either James Ballantyne or Scott. The association bound Scott hand and foot for twenty years and prompted him to adventurous undertakings. But it must be said that the Ballantynes always deferred to him, having for him a sentiment little short of veneration. One of the first results of this partnership was an eighteen-volume edition of Dryden's poems with a life which must have been to Scott little more than drudgery. He was well paid for his work, although it added but little to his fame, except for intelligent literary industry. Before Dryden, however, in the same year, 1808, appeared the poem of Marmion, A Tale of Flodden Field, which was received by the public with great avidity and unbounded delight. Geoffrey wrote a chilling review for which Scott with difficulty forgave him, since with all his humility and amiability he could not bear unfriendly or severe criticism. In a letter to Joanna Bailey, Scott makes some very sensible remarks as to the incapability of such a man as Geoffrey appreciating a work of the imagination, distinguished as he was. I really have often told him that I think he wants the taste for poetry which is essentially necessary to enjoy, and of course to criticize with justice. He is learned with the most learned in its canons and laws, skilled in its modulations, and an excellent judge of the justice of the sentiments which it conveys but he wants that enthusiastic feeling which, like sunshine upon a landscape, lights up every beauty and palliates if it cannot hide every defect. To offer a poem of imagination to a man whose whole life and study have been to acquire a stoical indifference towards enthusiasm of every kind would be the last, as it would surely be the silliest, action of my life. As stated above, it was about this time that Scott broke off his connection with the Edinburgh Review. Perhaps that was what Geoffrey wished, since the review became thenceforth more intensely partisan, and Scott's Toryism was not what was wanted. It is fair to add that in 1810, Geoffrey sent Scott advance proofs of his critique on The Lady of the Lake, with a frank and friendly letter in which he says, I am now sensible that there were needless asperities in my review of Marmion, and from the hurry in which I have been forced to write, I dare say there may be some here also. I am sincerely proud both of your genius and of your glory, and I value your friendship more highly than most either of my literary or political opinions. Southey, Ellis, and Wordsworth, Erskine, Heber, and other friends wrote congratulatory letters about Marmion with slight allusions to minor blemishes. Lockhart thought that it was on the whole the greatest of Scott's poems in strength and boldness. Most critics regarded the long introduction to each canto as a defect, since it broke the continuity of the narrative, but it may at least be said that these preludes give an interesting insight into the author's mood and views. The opinions of literary man, of course, differ as to the relative excellence of the different poems. Marmion certainly had great merit and added to the fame of the author. There is here more variety of meter than in his other poems, and also some passages of such beauty as to make the poem immortal, like the death of Marmion, and those familiar lines in reference to Clara's constancy. O woman, in our hours of ease, uncertain, coy, and hard to please, and variable as the shade by the light quivering aspen made, when pain and anguish wring the brow, a ministering angel thou. The sale of Marmion ultimately reached 50,000 copies in Great Britain. The poem was originally published in a luxurious quarto at 31 and a half shillings. Besides 1,000 guineas in advance, half the profits went to Scott and must have reached several thousand pounds, a great sale, when we remember that it was confined to libraries and people of wealth. In America, the poem was sold for two or three shillings, less than one-tenth of what it cost the English reader. 
A successful poem or novel in England is more remunerative to the author from the high price at which it is published than in the United States, where prices are lower and royalties rarely exceed 10%. It must be borne in mind, however, that in England, editions are ordinarily very small, sometimes consisting of not more than 250 copies. The first edition of Marmion was only of 2,000 copies. The largest edition published was in 1811 of 5,000 copies octavo, but even this did not circulate largely among the people. The popularity of Scott in England was confined chiefly to the upper classes, at least until the copyright of his books had expired. The booksellers were not slow in availing themselves of Scott's popularity. They employed him to edit an edition of Swift for £1,500 and tried to induce him to edit a general edition of English poets. The scheme was abandoned in consequence of a disagreement between Scott and Murray, the London publisher, as to the selection of poets. I think the quarrels of authors 80 or 100 years ago with their publishers were more frequent than they are in these times. We read of a long alienation between Scott and Constable, the publisher, who enjoyed a sort of monopoly of the poet's contributions to literature. Constable soon after found a great rival in Murray, who was at this time an obscure London bookseller in Fleet Street. Both these great publishers were remarkable for sagacity and were bold in their ventures. The foundation of Constable's wealth was laid when he was publishing the Edinburgh Review. In 1809, Murray started the Quarterly Review, its great political rival, and with the aid of Scott, who wrote many of its most valuable articles, and William Guilford, satirist and critic, became its first editor. Growing out of the quarrel between Scott and Constable was the establishment of John Ballantyne and Co. as publishers and booksellers in Edinburgh. Shortly after the establishment of the Quarterly Review as a Tory journal, Scott began his third great poem, The Lady of the Lake, which was published in 1810, in all the majesty of a quarto, at the price of two guineas a copy. He received for it 2,000 guineas. The first edition of 2,000 copies disappeared at once and was followed the same year by four octavo editions. In a few months, the sale reached 20,000 copies. The poem received great commendation both from the Quarterly and the Edinburgh Review. Mr. Ellis, in his article in the Quarterly, thus wrote, There is nothing in Scott of the severe majesty of Milton, or of the terse composition of Pope, or the elaborate elegance of Campbell, or the flowing and redundant diction of Southey, but there is a medley of bright images, and a diction tinged successively with a careless richness of Shakespeare, the antique simplicity of the old romances, the homeliness of vulgar ballads, and the sentimental glitter of the most modern poetry passing from the borders of the ludicrous to the sublime, alternately minute and energetic, sometimes artificial and frequently negligent, but always full of spirit and vivacity, abounding in images that are striking at first sight to minds of every contexture, and ever expressing a sentiment which it can cost the most ordinary reader any exertion to comprehend. This seems to me to be a fair criticism, although the lucidity of Scott's poetry is not that which is most admired by modern critics. Fashion in these times delights in what is obscure and difficult to be understood, as if depth and profundity must necessarily be unintelligible to ordinary readers. In Scott's time, however, the fashion was different and the popularity of his poems became almost universal. However, there are the same fire, vivacity, and brilliant coloring in all three of these masterpieces, as they were regarded two generations ago, reminding one of the witchery of Aristo. Yet, there is no great variety in these poems such as we find in Byron, no great force of passion or depth of sentiment, but a sort of harmonious rhythm, more highly prized in the earlier part of the century than in the latter, since Wordsworth and Tennyson have made us familiar with what is deeper and richer, as well as more artistic, in language and versification. But no one has denied Scott's originality and high merits, in contrast with the pompous, tameness, and conventionality of the poetry which arose when Johnson was the oracle of literary circles, and which still had the stage in Scott's day. Even Scott's admirers, however, like Canning and Ellis, did not hesitate to say that they would like something different from anything he had already written. But this was not to be, and perhaps the reason why he soon after gave up writing poetry was the conviction that his genius as a poet did not lie in variety and richness, either of style or matter. His great fame was earned by his novels. One thing greatly surprises me. Scott regarded Joanna Bailey as the greatest poetical genius of that day and he derived more pleasure from reading Johnson's London and The Vanity of Human Riches than from any other poetical composition. Indeed, there is nothing more remarkable in literary history than Scott's admiration of poetry inferior to his own, 
and his extraordinary modesty in the estimate of his own productions. Most poets are known for their morbid vanity, their self-consciousness, their feeling of superiority, and their deprecation of superior excellence. But Scott had eminently a healthy mind, as he had a healthy body, and shrank from exaggeration as he did from vulgarity in all its forms. It is probable that his own estimate of his poetry was nearer the truth than that of his admirers, who were naturally inclined to be partial. There has been so much poetry written since The Lady of the Lake was published, not only by celebrated poets like Wordsworth, Southey, Moore, Byron, Campbell, Keats, Shelley, Tennyson, Browning, Longfellow, Lowell, Whittier, Bryant, but also by many minor authors, that the standard is now much higher than it was in the early part of the century. Much of that which then was regarded as very fine is now smiled at by the critics and neglected by cultivated readers generally, and Scott has not escaped unfavorable criticism. It has been my object to present the subject of this lecture historically rather than critically, to show the extraordinary popularity of Scott as a poet among his contemporaries, rather than to estimate his merit at the present time. I confess that most of Marmion, as also of The Lady of the Lake, is tame to me, and deficient in high poetic genius. Doubtless, we are all influenced by the standards of our own time, and the advances making in literature as well as in science and art. Yet this change in the opinions of critics does not apply to Byron's Child Herald, which is as much, if not as widely, admired now as when it was first published. We think as highly, too, of The Deserted Village, The Elegy in a Country Churchyard, and The Cotter's Saturday Night, as our fathers did. And men now think much more highly of the merits of Shakespeare than they have at any period since he lived, so that, after all, there is an element in true poetry which does not lose by time. In another hundred years, the verdicts of critics as to the greater part of the poems of Tennyson, Wordsworth, Browning, and Longfellow may be very different from what they are now, while some of their lyrics may be, as they are now, produced immortal. Poetry is both an inspiration and an art. The greater part of that which is now produced is made, not born. Those daintily musical and elaborate measures which are now the fashion, because they claim novelty or reproduce the quaintness of an art so old as to be practically new, perhaps will soon again be forgotten or derided. What is simple, natural, appealing to the heart rather than the head, may last when more pretentious poetry shall have passed away. Neither criticism nor contemporary popularity can decide such questions. Scott himself seemed to take a true view. In a letter to Miss Seward, he said, The immortality of poetry is not so firm a point in my creed as the immortality of the soul. I've lived too long and seen the death of much immortal song. Nay, those that have really attained their literary immortality have gained it under very hard conditions. To some, it has not attached till after death. To others, it has been the means of lauding personal vices and follies which had otherwise been unremembered in their epitaphs, and all enjoy the same immortality under a condition similar to that of Nureddin in an Eastern tale. Nureddin, you remember, was to enjoy the gift of immortality, but with this qualification, that he was subjected to long naps of forty, fifty, or a hundred years at a time. Even so, Homer and Virgil slumbered through whole centuries. Shakespeare himself enjoyed undisturbed sleep from the age of Charles I until Garrick waked him. Dryden's fame has nodded, that of Pope begins to be drowsy, Chaucer is as sound as a top, and Spencer is snoring in the midst of his commentators. Milton indeed is quite awake, but observe, he was at his very outset refreshed with a nap of half a century, and in the midst of all this we sons of degeneracy talk of immortality. Let me please my own generation, and let those who come after us judge of their facts and my performances as they please. The anticipation of their neglect or censure will affect me very little. End of section 4 Section 5 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Sir Walter Scott, Part 3. In 1812, the poet lawyer was rewarded with the salary of a place whose duties he had for some years performed without pay, that of clerk of sessions, worth £800 per annum. Thus, having now about £1,500 as an income, independently of his earnings by the pen, Scott gave up his practice as an advocate and devoted himself entirely to literature. 
At the same time, he bought a farm of somewhat more than a hundred acres on the banks of the beautiful Tweed, about five miles from Ashestiel, and leaving to its owners the pretty place in which he had for six years enjoyed life and work, he removed to the cottage at Abbotsford, for thus he named his new purchase, in memory of the abbots of Melrose, who formerly owned all the region, and the ruins of whose lovely abbey stood not far away. Of the four thousand pounds for this purchase, half was borrowed from his brother, and the other half on the pledge of the profits of a poem that was projected but not written, Rokeby. Scott ought to have been content with a hestial, or, since every man wishes to own his home, he should have been satisfied with the comfortable cottage which he built at Abbotsford, and the modest improvements that his love for trees and shrubs enabled him to make. But his aspirations led him into serious difficulties. With all his sagacity and good sense, Scott never seemed to know when he was well off. It was a fatal mistake both for his fame and happiness to attempt to compete with those who are called great in England and Scotland, that is, peers and vast landed proprietors. He was not alone in this error, for it has generally been the ambition of fortunate authors to acquire social as well as literary distinction, thus paying tribute to riches and virtually abdicating their own true position, which is higher than any that rank or wealth can give. It has too frequently been the misfortune of literary genius to bow down to vulgar idols, and the worldly sentiments which this idolatry involves are seen in almost every fashionable novel which has appeared for a hundred years. In no country is this melancholy social slavery more usual than in England, with all its political freedom, although there are notable exceptions. The only great flaw in Scott's character was this homage to rank and wealth. On the other hand, rank and wealth also paid homage to him as a man of genius. Both Scotland and England received him into the most select circles, not only of their literary and political, but of their fashionable life. In 1811, Scott published The Lord of the Isles, and in 1813, Rokeby, neither of which was remarkable for either literary or commercial success, although both were well received. In 1814, he edited a 19-volume edition of Dean Swift's works with a life, and in the same year began, almost by accident, the real work of his own career in Waverley. If public opinion is far different today from what it was in Scott's time in reference to his poetry, we observe the same change in regard to the source of his widest fame, his novels, but not to so marked a degree, for it was in fiction that Scott's great gifts had their full fruition. Many a fine intellect still delights in his novels, though cultivated readers and critics differ as to their comparative merits. No two persons will unite in their opinions as to the three of those productions which they like most or least. It is so with all famous novels. Then, too, what man of seventy will agree with a man of thirty as to the comparative merits of Scott, Dickens, Thackeray, Trollope, George Eliot, Eugene Sue, Victor Hugo, Balzac, George Sand? How few read Uncle Tom's Cabin compared with the multitudes who read that most powerful and popular book forty years ago? How changing, if not transient, is the fame of the novelist as well as of the poet. With reference to him, even the same generation changes its tastes. What filled us with the delight as young men or women of twenty is at fifty spurned with contempt or thrown aside with indifference. No books ever filled my mind and soul with the delight I had when at twelve years of age I read The Children of the Abbey and Thaddeus of Warsaw. What man of eighty can forget the enthusiasm with which he read Old Mortality or Ivanhoe when he was in college? Perhaps one test of a great book is the pleasure derived from reading it over and over again, as we read Don Quixote, or the dramas of Shakespeare, of whose infinite variety we never tire. Measured by this test, the novels of Sir Walter Scott are among the foremost works of fiction which have appeared in our world. They will not all retain their popularity from generation to generation, like Don Quixote, or The Pilgrim's Progress, or The Vicar of Wakefield, but these are single productions of their authors. While not a few of Scott's many novels are certainly still read by cultivated people, if not with the same interest they excited when first published, yet with profit and admiration. They have some excellencies which are immortal, elevation of sentiment, chivalrous regard for women, fascination of narrative, after one has waded through the learned historical introductory chapters, the absence of exaggeration, the vast variety of characters introduced and vividly maintained, and above all, the freshness and originality of description, both of nature and of man. Among the severest and most bigoted of New England Puritans, none could find anything corrupting or demoralizing in his romances, 
whereas Byron and Bulwer were never mentioned without a shudder, and even Shakespeare was locked up in bookcases as unfit for young people to read, and not particularly creditable for anybody to own. The unfavorable comments which the most orthodox ever made upon Scott were as to the repulsiveness of the old covetanters, as he described them, and his sneers at Puritan perfections. Scott, however, had contempt not for the Puritans, but for many of their peculiarities, especially for their Kant when it degenerated into hypocrisy. One thing is certain, that no works of fiction have had such universal popularity both in England and America for so long a period as the Waverley novels. Scott reigned as the undisputed monarch of the realm of fiction and romance for 25 years. He gave undiminished entertainment to an entire generation, and not that merely, but instruction in his historical novels, although his views were not always correct, as whose ever are. He who could charm millions of readers, learned and unlearned, for a quarter of a century must have possessed remarkable genius. Indeed, he was not only the central figure in English literature for a generation, but he was regarded as peculiarly original. Another style of novels may obtain more passing favor with modern readers, but Scott was justly famous. His works are today in every library and form a delightful part of the education of every youth and maiden who cares to read at all. And he will, as a novelist, probably live after some who are now prime favorites will be utterly forgotten or ignored. About 1830, Bulwer was in his early successes. About 1840, Dickens was the rage of his day. About 1850, Thackeray had taken his high grade, and it was about 1860 that George Eliot's power appeared. These still retain their own peculiar lines of popularity. Bulwer with a romantic few, Thackeray with the appreciative intelligent, George Eliot with a still wider clientage, and Dickens with everybody, on account of his appeal to the universal sentiments of comedy and pathos. Scott's influence, somewhat checked during the growth of these reputations and the succession of fertile and accomplished writers on both sides of the Atlantic, including the introspective analysts of the past 15 years, has within a decade been rising again and has lately burst forth in a new group of historical romancers who seem to have harked back from the subjective fad of our day to Scott's healthy, adventurous objectivity. Not only so, but new editions of the Waverly novels are coming one by one from the shrewd publishers who keep track of the popular taste, one of the most attractive being issued in Edinburgh at half a crown a volume. The first of Scott's remarkable series of novels, Waverly, published in 1814 when the author was 43 years of age and at the height of his fame as a poet, took the fashionable and literary world by storm. The novel had been partly written for several years, but was laid aside as his edition of Swift and his essays for the supplement of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and other prose writings, employed all the time he had to spare. This hack work was done by Scott without enthusiasm to earn money for his investment in real estate, and is not of transcendent merit. Obscurer men than he had performed such literary drudgery with more ability, but no writer was ever more industrious. The amount of work which he accomplished at this period was prodigious, especially when we remember that his duties as sheriff and clerk of sessions occupied eight months of the year. He was more familiar with the literary history of Queen Anne's reign than any subsequent historian, if we accept Macaulay, whose brilliant career had not yet begun. He took, of course, a different view of Swift from the writers of the Edinburgh Review, and was probably too favorable in his description of the personal character of the Dean of St. Patrick's, who is now generally regarded as inordinately ambitious, arrogant, and selfish, of a morose, vindictive, and haughty temper, utterly destitute of generosity and magnanimity, as well as of tenderness, fidelity, and compassion. Lord Jeffrey, in his review, attacked Swift's moral character with such consummate ability as to check materially the popularity of his writings, which are universally admitted to be full of genius. His superb intellect and his morality present a sad contrast, as in the cases of Bacon, Burns, and Byron which Scott, on account of the force of his Tory prejudices, did not sufficiently point out. But as to the novel, when it suddenly appeared, it is not surprising that Waverley should at once have attained an unexampled popularity when we consider the mediocrity of all works of fiction at that time, if we accept the Irish tales of Maria Edgeworth. Scott received from Constable £1,000 for this romance, then deemed a very liberal remuneration for what cost him but a few months' work. The second and third volumes were written in one month. He wrote with a remarkable rapidity when his mind was full of the subject, and his previous studies as an antiquary and as a collector of Scottish poetry and legends fitted him for his work, 
which was in no sense a task, but a most lively pleasure. It is not known why Scott published this strikingly original work anonymously. Perhaps it was because of his unusual modesty and the fear that he might lose the popularity he had already enjoyed as a poet. But it immediately placed him on a higher literary elevation since it was generally suspected that he was the author. He could not altogether disguise himself from the keen eyes of Geoffrey and other critics. The book was received as a revelation. The first volume is not particularly interesting, but the story continually increases in interest to its close. It is not a dissection of the human heart. It is not even much of a love story, but a most vivid narrative without startling situations or adventures. Its great charm is its quiet humor, not strained into witty expressions which provoke laughter, but a sort of amiable delineation of the character of a born gentleman with his weaknesses and prejudices, all leaning to virtue's side. It is a description of manners peculiar to the Scottish gentry in the middle of the 18th century, especially among the Jacobite families then passing away. Of course, the popularity of this novel at that time was chiefly confined to the upper classes. In the first place, the people could not afford to pay the price of the book, and secondly, it was outside their sympathies and knowledge. Indeed, I doubt if any commonplace person, without culture or extended knowledge, can enjoy so refined a work, with so many learned allusions and such exquisite humor, which appeals to a knowledge of the world in its higher aspects. It was one of the last books that an ignorant young lady brought up on the trash of ordinary fiction would relish or comprehend. Whoever turns uninterested from Waverley is probably unable to see its excellencies or enjoy its peculiar charms. It is not a book for a modern schoolboy or schoolgirl, but for a man or woman in the highest maturity of mind, with a poetic or imaginative nature, and with a leaning perhaps to aristocratic sentiments. It is a rebuke to vulgarity and ignorance, which the minute and exaggerated descriptions of low life in the pages of Dickens certainly are not. In February 1815, Guy Mannering was published, the second in the series of the Waverley novels, and it was received by the intelligent reading classes with even more eclat than Waverley, to which it is superior in many respects. It plunges at once in medias res, without the long and labored introductory chapters of its predecessor. It is interesting from first to last, and is an elaborate and well-told tale, written con amore, when Scott was in the maturity of his powers. It is full of incident and is delightful in humor. Its chief excellence is in the loftiness of its sentiments, being one of the healthiest and wholesomest novels ever written, appealing to the heart as well as to the intellect, to be read over and over again like The Vicar of Wakefield, without weariness. It may be too aristocratic in its tone to please everybody, but it portrays the sentiments of its age in reference to squires and Scottish lairds, who were more distinguished for uprightness and manly duties than for brains and culture. The fascination with which Scott always depicts the virtues of hospitality and trust in humanity makes a strong impression on the imagination. His heroes and heroines are not remarkable for genius, but shine in the higher glories of domestic affection and fidelity to trusts. Two characters in particular are original creations, Domini Sampson and Meg Marills, whom no reader can forget, the one ludicrous for his simplicity, and the other a gypsy woman, weird and strange, more like a witch than a sibyl, but intensely human and capable of the strongest attachment for those she loved. The easy and transparent flow of the style of this novel, its beautiful simplicity, the wild magnificence of its sketches of scenery, the rapid and ever-brightening interest of the narrative, the unaffected kindness of feeling, the manly purity of thought, everywhere mingled with a gentle humor and homely sagacity, but above all the rich variety and skillful contrast of character and manners, at once fresh in fiction and stamped with the unforgeable seal of truth and nature, spoke to every heart and mind, and the few murmurs of pedantic criticism were lost in the voice of general delight, which never fails to welcome the invention that introduces to the sympathy of the imagination a new group of immortal realities. Scott received about £2,000 for this favorite romance, one entirely new in the realm of fiction, which enabled him to pay off his most pressing debts and indulge his taste for travel. He visited the field of Waterloo and became a social lion in both Paris and London. The Prince of Wales sent him a magnificent snuff box set with diamonds and entertained him with admiring cordiality at Carlton House, for his authorship of Waverley was more than surmised, while his fame as a poet was second only to that of Byron. Then, in the spring of 1815, took place the first meeting of these two great bards, and their successive interviews were graced with mutual compliments. 
Scott did not think that Byron's reading was extensive either in poetry or history, in which opinion the industrious Scottish bard was mistaken. But he did justice to Byron's transcendent genius, and with more charity than severity, mourned over his departure from virtue. After a series of brilliant banquets at the houses of the great, both of rank and fame, Scott returned to his native land to renew his varied and exhausting labors, having furnished his publishers with a volume of letters on the subjects which most interested him during his short tour. Everything he touched now brought him gold. Paul's letters to his kinfolk, as he called the volume concerning his tour, was well received, but not with the enthusiasm which marked the publication of Guy Mannering. Indeed, it had no special claim to distinction. The Antiquary followed in May of the next year, and though it lacked the romance of Waverley and the adventure of Guy Mannering, it had even a larger sale. Scott himself regarded it as superior to both, but an author is not always the best judge of his own productions, and we do not accept his criticism. It probably cost him more labor, but it is an exhibition of his erudition rather than a revelation of his self or of nature. It is certainly very learned, but learning does not make a book popular, nor is a work of fiction the place for a display of learning. If The Antiquary were published in these times, it would be pronounced pedantic. Readers are apt to skip names and learned allusions and scraps of Latin. As a story, I think it inferior to Guy Mannering, although it has great merits, a kind of simple unsought charm, and is a transcript of actual Scottish life. It had a great success. Scott says in a letter to his friend Terry, It is at press again, 6,000 having been sold in six days. Before the novel was finished, the lawyer had already projected his Tales of My Landlord. Scott was now at the flood tide of his creative power, and his industry was as remarkable as his genius. There was but little doubt in the public mind as to the paternity of the Waverly novels, and whatever Scott wrote was sure to have a large sale, so that every publisher of note was eager to have a hand in bringing his productions before the public. In 1816 appeared the Edinburgh Annual Register, containing Scott's sketch of the year 1814, which, though very good, showed that the author was less happy in history than in fiction. The first series of Tales of My Landlord was published by Murray and not by Constable, who had bought out Scott's other's works, and the book was received with unbounded enthusiasm. Many critics place old mortality in the highest niche of merit and fame. Frere of the Quarterly Review, Hallam, Boswell, Lamb, Lord Holland, all agree that it surpassed his other novels. Bishop Hebert said, There are only two men in the world, Walter Scott and Lord Byron. Lockhart regarded old mortality as the marmion of Scott's novels, but the painting of the Covenanters gave offense to the more rigid of the Presbyterians. For myself, I have a doubt as to the correctness of their criticisms. Old mortality, in contrast with the previous novels of Scott, has a place similar to the later productions of George Eliot as compared with her earlier ones. It is not so vivid a sketch of Scotch life as is given in Guy Mannering. Like The Antiquary, it is bookish rather than natural. From a literary point of view, it is more artistic than Guy Mannering and more learned. The canvas is a broader one. Its characters are portrayed with great skill and power, but they lack the freshness which comes from actual contact with the people described and with whom Scott was familiar as a youth in the course of his wanderings. It is more historical than realistic. In short, Old Mortality is another creation of its author's brain rather than a painting of real life. But it is justly famous, for it was the precursor of those brilliant historical romances from which so much is learned of great men already known to students. It was a new departure in literature. Before Scott arose, historical novels were comparatively unknown. He made romance instructive rather than merely amusing, and added the charm of life to the dry annals of the past. Cervantes does not portray a single great character known in Spanish history in his Don Quixote, but he paints life as he has seen it. So does Goldsmith. So does George Eliot in Silas Marner. She presents life, indeed, in Romola, not, however, as she had personally observed it, but as drawn from books, recreating the atmosphere of a long-gone time by the power of imagination. The earlier works of Scott are drawn from memory and personal feeling, rather than from knowledge he had gained by study. Of old mortality, he writes to Lady Louisa Stewart, I am complete master of the whole history of these strange times, both of persecutors and persecuted, so I trust I have come decently off. The divisional grouping of these earlier novels by Scott himself is interesting. In the advertisement to The Antiquary, he says, The present work completes a series of fictitious narratives intended to illustrate the manners of Scotland at three different periods. Waverley embraced the age of our fathers, tis sixty years since. 
Guy Mannering, that of our own youth, and the antiquary refers to the last ten years of the 18th century. The dedication of Tales of My Landlord describes them as tales illustrative of ancient Scottish manners and of the traditions of their, his countrymen's, respective districts. They were first series The Black Dwarf and Old Mortality, second series The Heart of Midlothian, third series The Bride of Lammermoor and A Legend of Montrose, fourth series Count Robert of Paris and Castle Dangerous. These all, except the fourth series in 1832, appeared in the six years from 1814 to 1820, and besides these, Rob Roy, Ivanhoe, and the Monastery. End of section 5. Section 6 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Sir Walter Scott, Part 4. With the publication of Old Mortality in 1816, then, Scott introduced the first of his historical novels, which had great fascination for students. Who ever painted the old Cameronian with more felicity? Who ever described the peculiarities of the Scottish Calvinists during the reign of the last of the Stuarts with more truthfulness? Their severity, their strict and Judaical observance of the Sabbath, their hostility to popular amusements, their rigid and legal morality— their love of theological dogmas, their inflexible prejudices, their lofty aspirations. Where shall we find in literature a sterner fanatical Puritan than John Balfour of Burley, or a fiercer royalist than Graham of Claverhouse? As a love story, this novel is not remarkable. It is not in the description of passionate love that Scott anywhere excels. His heroines, with two or three exceptions, would be called rather tame by the modern reader, although they win respect for their domestic virtues and sterling elements of character. His favorite heroes are either Englishmen of good family or Scotchmen educated in England, gallant, cultivated, and reproachless, but without any striking originality or intellectual force. Rob Roy was published in the latter part of 1817 and was received by the public with the same unabated enthusiasm which marked the appearance of Guy Mannering and the other romances. An edition of 10,000 was disposed of in two weeks and the subsequent sale amounted to 40,000 more. The scene of this story is laid in the highlands of Scotland with an English hero and a Scottish heroine, and in this fascinating work the political history of the times, 40 years earlier than the period of Waverley, is portrayed with great impartiality. It is a description of the first Jacobite rising against George I in the year 1715. In this novel, one of the greatest of Scott's creations appears in the heroine, Diana Vernon, rather wild and masculine, but interesting from her courage and virtue. The character of Bailey Jarvie is equally original and more amusing. The general effect of Rob Roy, as well as of Waverley and Old Mortality, was to make the Scottish Highlanders and Jacobites interesting to English readers of opposite views and feelings, without arousing hostility to the reigning royal family. The Highlanders, a hundred years ago, were viewed by the English with sentiments nearly similar to those with which the Puritan settlers of New England looked upon the Indians, at any rate, as freebooters, robbers, and murderers, who were dangerous to civilization, and the severities of the English government towards these lawless clans, both as outlaws and as foes of the Hanoverian succession, were generally condoned by public opinion. Scott succeeded in producing a better feeling among both the conquerors and the conquered. He modified general sentiment by his impartial and liberal views and allayed prejudices. The Highlanders thenceforth were regarded as a body of men with many interesting traits and capable of becoming good subjects of the crown while their own hatred and contempt of the lowland Saxon were softened by the many generous and romantic incidents of these tales. Two hitherto hostile races were drawn into neighborly sympathy. Travelers visited the beautiful highland retreats and returned with enthusiastic impressions of the country. To no other man does Scotland owe so great a debt of gratitude as to Walter Scott, not only for his poetry and novels, but for showing the admirable traits of a barren country and a fierce population and contributing to bring them within the realm of civilization. A century or two ago, the highlands of Scotland were peopled by a race in a state of perpetual conflict with civilization, adverse to labor, gaining, except such of them as were enrolled in the English army, a precarious support by plunder, blackmailing, smuggling, and other illegal pursuits. Now they compose a body of hard-working, intelligent, and law-abiding laborers, cultivating farms, raising cattle and sheep, and pursuing the various branches of industry which lead to independence, if not to wealth. 
the traveler among the highlands feels as secure and is made as comfortable as in any part of the island, while revelations of their shrewd intelligence and unsuspected wit in the stories of Barry and Crockett show what a century of Calvinistic theology, as the chief mental stimulant, has done, has done in developing blossoms from that thistle-like stock. Scott had now all the fame and worldly prosperity which any literary man could attain to, for his authorship of the novels, although unacknowledged, was more and more generally believed, and after 1821 not denied. He lived above the atmosphere of envy, honored by all classes of people, surrounded with admiring friends and visitors. He had an income of at least £10,000 a year. Wherever he journeyed, he was treated with the greatest distinction. In London, he was cordially received as a distinguished guest in any circle he chose. The highest nobles paid homage to him. The king made him a baronet, the first purely literary man in England to receive that honor. He now became ambitious to increase his lands, and the hundred acres of farm at Abbotsford were enlarged by new purchases, picturesquely planted with trees and shrubberies, while the cottage grew to a mansion and the mansion to a castle, with its 1,200 surrounding acres, cultivated and made beautiful. Scott's correspondence with famous people was immense, besides his other labors as a farmer, lawyer, and author. Few persons of rank or fame visited Edinburgh without paying their respects to its most eminent citizen. His country house was invaded by tourists. He was on terms of intimacy with some of the proudest nobles of Scotland. His various works were the daily food, not only of his countrymen, but of all educated Europe. Station power, wealth, beauty, and genius strove with each other in every demonstration of respect and worship. And yet, in the midst of this homage and increasing prosperity, one of the most fortunate of human beings, Scott's head was not turned. His habitual modesty preserved his moral health amid all sorts of temptation. He never lost his intellectual balance. He assumed no airs of superiority. His manners were simple and unpretending to the last. He praised all literary productions except his own. His life in Edinburgh was plain, though hospitable and free, and he seemed to care for few luxuries aside from books, of which life made a large collection. The furniture of his houses in Edinburgh and at Abbotsford was neither showy nor luxurious. He was extraordinarily fond of dogs and all domestic animals, who, sympathetic creatures as they are, unerringly sought him out and lavished affection upon him. When Scott lived in Castle Street, he was not regarded by Edinburgh society as particularly brilliant in conversation, since he never aspired to lead by learned disquisitions. He told stories well, with great humor and pleasantry, to amuse rather than to instruct. His talk was almost homely. The most notable thing about it was common sense. Lord Cockburn said of him that his sense was more wonderful than his genius. He did not blaze like Macaulay or Mackintosh at the dinner table, nor absorb conversation like Coleridge and Sidney Smith. He disliked, says Lockhart, mere disquisitions in Edinburgh and prepared impromptus in London. A doctrinaire in society was to him an abomination. Hence, until his fame was established by the admiration of the world, Edinburgh professors did not see his greatness. To them he seemed commonplace, but not to such men as Hallam or Moore or Rogers or Crocker or Canning. Notwithstanding, Scott gave great dinners occasionally, and they appear to have been a bore to him, as he very rarely went out to evening entertainments, although at public dinners his wit and sense made him a favorite chairman. He retired early at night and rose early in the morning, and his severest labors were before breakfast, his principal meal. He always dined at home on Sunday with a few intimate friends, and his dinner was substantial and plain. He drank very little wine and preferred a glass of whiskey toddy to champagne or port. He could not distinguish between Madeira and Sherry. He was neither an epicure nor a gourmand. After Scott had become world famous, his happiest hours were spent in enlarging and adorning his land at Abbotsford, and in erecting and embellishing his baronial castle. In this, his gains were more than absorbed. He loved that castle more than any of his intellectual creations, and it was not completed until nearly all his novels were written. Without personal extravagance, he was lavish in the sums he spent on Abbotsford. Here he delighted to entertain his distinguished visitors, of whom no one was more welcome than Washington Irving whom he liked for his modesty and quiet humor and unpretending manners. Lockhart writes, It would hardly, I believe, be too much to affirm that Sir Walter Scott entertained under his roof, in the course of the seven or eight brilliant seasons when his prosperity was at its height, as many persons of distinction in rank, in politics, in art, in literature, and in science, as the most princely nobleman of his age ever did in the like space of time. 
one more unconscious, apparently, of his great powers, has been rarely seen among literary men, especially in England and France, affording a striking contrast in this respect to Dryden, Pope, Voltaire, Byron, Bulwer, Macaulay, Carlyle, Hugo, Dumas, and even Tennyson. Great lawyers and great statesmen are rarely so egotistical and conceited as poets, novelists, artists, and preachers. Scott made no pretensions which were offensive or which could be controverted. His greatest aspiration seems to have been to be a respectable landed proprietor and to found a family. An English country gentleman was his beau ideal of happiness and contentment. Perhaps this was a weakness, but it was certainly a harmless and amiable one, not so offensive as intellectual pride. Scott, indeed, while without vanity, had pride, but it was of a lofty kind, disdaining meanness and cowardice as worse even than transgressions which have their origin in unregulated passions. From the numerous expletives which abound in Scott's letters, such as are not now considered in good taste among gentlemen, I infer that, like most gentlemen of his social standing, in those times he was in the habit of using, when highly excited or irritated, what is called profane language. After he had once given vent to his feelings, however, he was amiable and forgiving enough for a Christian sage, who never harbored malice or revenge. He had great respect for the military profession, probably because it was the great prop and defense of government and established institutions, for he was the most conservative of aristocrats. And yet his aristocratic turn of mind never conflicted with his humane disposition, never made him a snob. He abhorred all vulgarity. He admired genius and virtue in whatever garb they appealed. He was as kind to his servants and to poor and unfortunate people as he was to his equals in society, being eminently big-hearted. It was only fools who made great pretensions that he despised and treated with contempt. No doubt, Scott was bored by the numerous visitors, whether invited or uninvited, who came from all parts of Great Britain, from America, and even from continental Europe, to do homage to his genius or to gratify their curiosity. Sometimes as many as thirty guests sat down to his banqueting table at once. He entertained in baronial style, but without ostentation or prodigality, and on old-fashioned dishes. He did not like French cooking, and his simple taste in the matters of beverage we have already noted. The people to whom he was most attentive were the representatives of ancient families, whether rich or poor. Scott was very kind to literary men in misfortune, and his chosen friends were authors of eminence, like Miss Edgeworth, Joanna Bailey, Thomas Moore, Crabbe, Southey, Wordsworth, Sir Humphrey Davy, Dr. Wollaston, the chemist, Henry Mackenzie, etc., he was very intimate with the Duke of Buckley, Lord Montague, and other noblemen. He was visited by dukes and princes, as well as by ladies of rank and fame. George the Fourth sent him valuable presents and showed him every mark of high consideration. Cambridge and Oxford tendered to him honorary degrees. Wherever he traveled, he was received with honor and distinction and flatteries. But he did not like flatteries, and this was one reason why he did not openly acknowledge his authorship of his novels, until all doubt was removed by the masterly papers of John Leicester Adolphus in 1821. Scott's correspondence must have been enormous, for his postage bills amounted to £150 per annum, besides the aid he received from Franks, which, with his natural economy, he made no scruple in liberally using. Perhaps his most confidential letters were, like Byron's, written to his publishers and printers, though many such were addressed to his son-in-law Lockhart and to his dearest friend William Erskine. But he had also some admirable women friends with whom he corresponded freely. Some of the choicest of his recently published letters are to Lady Abercorn, who was an intimate and helpful friend, to Miss Anna Seward, a literary confidant of many years, to Lady Louisa Stewart, daughter of the Earl of Butte and granddaughter of Mary Wortley Montague, one of the few who knew from the first of his Waverley authorship, and to Mrs. John Hughes, an early and most affectionate friend whose grandson, Thomas Hughes, has made famous the commonplace name of Tom Brown in our own day. Scott's letters show the man, frank, cordial, manly, tender, generous, finding humor in difficulties, pleasure in toil, satisfaction in success, a proud courage in adversity, and the purest happiness in the affection of his friends. How Scott found time for so much work is a mystery, writing nearly three novels a year, besides other literary labors, attending to his duties in the courts, overlooking the building of Abbotsford and the cultivation of his 1,200 acres, and entertaining more guests than Voltaire did at Fernay. 
He was too much absorbed by his legal duties and his literary labors to be much of a traveler, yet he was a frequent visitor to London, saw something of Paris, journeyed through Ireland, was familiar with the lake region in England, and penetrated to every interesting place in Scotland. He did not like London and took little pleasure in the ovations he received from people of rank and fashion. As a literary lion at the tables of the great, he disappointed many of his admirers since he made no effort to shine. It was only in his modest den in Castle Street, or in rambles in the country, or at Abbotsford, that he felt himself at home and appeared to the most advantage. It would be pleasant to leave this generally great man in the full flush of health, creative power, inward delight, and outward prosperity, but that were to leave unwritten the finest and noblest part of his life. It is to the misfortunes which came upon him that we owe both a large part of his splendid achievements in literature and our knowledge of the most admirable characteristics of the man. My running records of his novels last mentioned The Monastery, issued in 1820, in the same year with perhaps the prime favorites of all his works, Ivanhoe, the romantic tale of England in the crusading age of Rich and the Lionhearted. In 1821, he put forth the fascinating Elizabethan tale of Kenilworth. In 1822 came The Pirate, the tale of sea and shore that inspired James Fenimore Cooper to write The Pilot and his other sea stories, and The Fortunes of Nigel. In 1823, Peveril of the Peak and Quentin Durward, both among his best. In 1824, St. Ronan's Well and Red Gauntlet. And in 1825, two more tales of the Crusaders, The Betrothed and The Talisman, the latter probably sharing with Ivanhoe the greatest popularity. In the winter of 1825 to 1826, a widespread area of commercial distress resulted in the downfall of many firms and among others to succumb were Hurst and Robinson, publishers, whose failure precipitated that of Constable and Company, Scott's publishers, and of the Ballantines, his printers, with whom he was a secret partner, who were largely indebted to the Constables and so to the creditors of that house. The crash came January 16, 1826, and Scott found himself in debt to the amount of £147,000, or nearly $735. Such a vast misfortune, overwhelming a man at the age of 55, might well crush out all life and hope and send him into hopeless bankruptcy, with the poor consolation that, though legally responsible, he was not morally bound to pay other people's debts. But Scott's own sanguine carelessness had been partly to blame for the Ballantine failure, and he faced the billow as it suddenly appeared, bowed to it in grief but not in shame, and while not pretending to any stoicism, instantly resolved to devote the remainder of his life to the repayment of the creditors. The solid substance of manliness, honor, and cheerful courage in his character, the genuine piety with which he accepted the dispensation, and wrote, Blessed be the name of the Lord, the unexampled steadiness with which he comforted his wife and daughters, while girding himself to the daily work of intellectual production amidst his many distresses the sweetness of heart with which he acknowledged the sympathy and declined the offers of help that poured in upon him from every side. One poor music teacher offering his little savings of 600 pounds, and an anonymous admirer urging upon him a loan of 30,000 pounds. All this is the beauty that lighted up the black cloud of Scott's adversary. His efforts were finally successful, although at the cost of his bodily existence. Lockhart says, He paid the penalty of health and life, but he saved his honor and his self-respect. The glory dies not, and the grief is past. Woodstock, then about half done, was completed in 69 days and issued in March 1826, bringing in about $41,000 to his creditors. His Life of Napoleon, published in June 1827, produced $90,000. In 1827 also, Scott issued Chronicles of the Cannon Gate, first series, several minor stories, and the first series of Tales of a Grandfather in 1828, The Fair Maid of Perth, second series of the Chronicles, and more tales of a grandfather. In 1829, Anne of Geierstein, more tales of a grandfather, the first volume of A History of Scotland, and a collective edition of the Waverley novels in 48 volumes with new introductions, notes, and careful corrections and improvements of the text throughout. In itself, an immense labor. In 1830, more tales of a grandfather, a three-volume history of France, and volume two of the History of Scotland. In 1831, and finally, a fourth series of Tales of My Landlord, including Count Robert of Paris and Castle Dangerous. This completes the list of Scott's greater productions, but it should be remembered that during all the years of his creative work, he was incessantly doing critical and historical writing, producing numerous reviews, essays, ballads, 
Introductions to Diverse Works, Biographical Sketches for Ballantine's Novelists Library, The Works of 15 Celebrated English Writers of Fiction, Fielding, Smollett, etc., Letters and Pamphlets, Dramas, Even a Few Religious Discourses, and his very extensive and interesting private correspondence. He was such a marvel of productive brain power as has seldom, if ever, been known to humanity. The illness and death of Scott's beloved wife, but four short months after his commercial disaster, was a profound grief to him, and under the exhausting pressure of incessant work during the five years following, his bodily power began to fail. So that in October 1831, after a paralytic shock, he stopped all literary labor and went to Italy for recuperation. The following June, he returned to London, weaker in both mind and body, was taken to Abbotsford in July, and on the 21st, September, 1832, with his children about him, the kindly, manly, brave, and tender spirit passed away. At the time of his death, Sir Walter had reduced his great indebtedness to $270,000, a life insurance of $110,000, $10,000 in the hands of his trustees, and $150,000 advanced by Robert Cadell, an Edinburgh bookseller, on the copyrights of Scott's works, cleared away the last remnant of the death, and within twenty years Cadell had reimbursed himself and made a handsome profit for his own accounts and that of the family of Sir Walter. The moneyed details of Scott's literary life have been made a part of this brief sketch, both because his phenomenal fecundity and popularity offer a convenient measure of his power, and because the fiscal misfortune of his later life revealed a simple grandeur of character even more admirable than his mental force. Scott ruined, exclaimed the Earl of Dudley when he heard of the trouble. The author of Waverley ruined. Good God, let every man to whom he has given months of delight give him a sixpence, and he will rise tomorrow morning richer than Rothschild. But the sturdy Scotchman accepted no dole. He set himself to work out his own salvation. William Howitt, in his Homes and Haunts of Eminent British Poets, estimated that Scott's works had produced as profits to the author or his trustees at least 500,000 pounds, nearly $2,500,000. This in 1847, over 50 years ago, and only 45 years from Scott's first original publication. Add the results of the past 50 years, and, remembering that this gives but the profits, conceive the immense sums that have been freely paid by the intelligent British public for their enjoyment of this great author's writings. Then, besides all this, recall the myriad volumes of Scott sold in America, which paid no profit to the author or his heirs. There is no parallel. Voltaire's renown and monetary rewards as the master writer of the 18th century offered the only case in modern times that approaches Scott's success. Yet Voltaire's vast wealth was largely the result of successful speculation. As a purely popular author whose wholesome fancy, great heart, and tireless industry has delighted millions of his fellow men, Scott stands alone, while as a man he holds the affection and respect of the world. Even though it be that the fashion of his workmanship passeth away, wonder not, lament not. With Mithridates, he could say, I have lived. What great man can say more? End of section six. Section seven of Beacon Lights of History, volume 13, Great Writers, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Lord Byron, Part 1. 1788 to 1824. Poetic Genius. It is extremely difficult to depict Lord Byron, and even presumptuous to attempt it. This is not only because he is a familiar subject, the triumphs and sorrows of whose career have been often portrayed, but also because he presents so many contradictions in his life and character, lofty yet degraded, earnest yet frivolous, an impersonation of noble deeds and sentiments, and also of almost every frailty which Christianity and humanity alike condemn. No great man has been more extravagantly admired, and none more bitterly assailed, but generally he is regarded as a fallen star, a man with splendid gifts which he wasted, for whom pity is the predominant sentiment in broad and generous minds." With all his faults, the English-speaking people are proud of him as one of the greatest lights in our literature. And in view of the brilliancy of his literary career, his own nation in particular does not like to have his defects and vices dwelt upon. It blushes and condones. 
It would fain blot out his life and much of his poetry if, without them, it could preserve the best and grandest of his writings. That ill-disguised autobiography which goes by the name of Child Harold's Pilgrimage, in which he soars to loftier flights than any English poet from Milton to his own time. Like Shakespeare, like Dryden, like Pope, like Burns, he was born a poet, while most of the other poets, however eminent and excellent, were simply made, made by study and labor on a basis of talent, rather than exalted by native genius as he was, speaking out what he could not help, and reveling in the richness of unconscious gifts, whether for good or evil. Byron was a man with qualities so generous, yet so wild, that Lamartine was in doubt whether to call him an angel or devil. But whether angel or devil, his life is the saddest and most interesting among all the men of letters in the 19th century. Of course, most of our material comes from his life and letters, as edited by his friend and brother poet Thomas More. This biographer, I think, has been unwisely candid in the delineation of Byron's character, making revelations that would better have remained in doubt, and on which friendship at least should have prompted him to a discreet silence. Lord Byron was descended from the Byrons of Normandy who accompanied William the Conqueror in his invasion of England, of which illustrious lineage the poet was prouder than of his poetry. In the reign of Henry VIII, on the dissolution of the monasteries, a Byron came into possession of the old medieval abbey of Newstead. In the reign of James I, Sir John Byron was made a knight of the Order of the Bath. In 1784, the father of the poet, a dissipated captain of the guards, being in embarrassed circumstances, married a rich Scotch heiress of the name of Gordon. Handsome and reckless, mad Jack Byron speedily spent his wife's fortune, and when he died, his widow, being reduced to a pittance of 150 pounds a year, retired to Scotland to live with her infant son who had been born in London. She was plain Mrs. Byron, widow of a younger son, with but little expectation of future rank. She was a woman of caprices and eccentricities, and not at all fitted to superintend the education of her wayward boy. Hence, the childhood and youth of Byron were sad and unfortunate. His temper was violent and passionate. A malformation of his foot made him peculiarly sensitive, and the unwise treatment of his mother, fond and harsh by turns, destroyed maternal authority. At five years of age, he was sent to a day school in Aberdeen, where he made but slim attainments. Though excitable and ill-disciplined, he is said to have been affectionate and generous, and perfectly fearless. A fit of sickness rendered his removal from this school necessary, and he was sent to a summer resort among the Highlands. His early impressions were therefore favorable to the development of the imagination, coming as they did from mountains and valleys, rivulets and lakes, near the sources of the Dee. At the age of eight, he wrote verses and fell in love, like Dante at the age of nine. On the death of the grandson of the old Lord Byron in 1784, this unpromising youth became the heir apparent to the barony. Nor did he have to wait long, for soon after his granduncle died, and the young Byron, whose mother was struggling with poverty, became a ward of chancery, and the Earl of Carlisle, one of the richest and most powerful noblemen of the realm, a nephew by marriage of the deceased peer, was appointed his guardian. This cold, formal, and politic nobleman took but little interest in his ward, leaving him to the mismanagement of his mother, who, with her boy at the age of ten, now removed to Newstead, the seat of his ancestors. The government, meanwhile, for some reason which is not explained, having conferred on her a pension of three hundred pounds a year. One of the first things that Mrs. Byron did on her removal to Newstead was to entrust her son to the care of a quack in Nottingham in order to cure him of his lameness. As the doctor was not successful, the boy was removed to London with the double purpose of effecting a cure under an eminent surgeon and of educating him according to his rank, for his education thus far had been sadly neglected, although it would appear that he was an omnivorous reader in a desultory kind of way. The lameness was never cured, and through life was a subject of bitter sensitiveness on his part. Dr. Glennie of Dulwich, to whose instruction he was now confided, found him hard to manage because of his own undisciplined nature and the perpetual interference of his mother. His progress was so slow in Latin and Greek that at the end of two years, in 1801, he was removed to Harrow, 
one of the great public schools of England, of which Dr. Drury was headmaster. For a year or two, owing to that constitutional shyness which is so often mistaken for pride, young Byron made but few friendships, although he had for school fellows many who were afterwards distinguished, including Sir Robert Peel. Before he left this school for Cambridge, however, he had made many friends whom he never forgot, being of a very generous and loving disposition. I think that those years at Harrow were the happiest he ever knew, for he was under a strict discipline and was too young to indulge in those dissipations which were the bane of his subsequent life. But he was not distinguished as a scholar in the ordinary sense, although in his schoolboy days he wrote some poetry remarkable for his years and read a great many books. He read in bed, read when no one else read, read while eating, read all sorts of books, and was capable of great sudden exertions, but not of continuous drudgeries, which he always abhorred. In the year 1803, when a youth of fifteen, he formed a strong attachment for a Miss Chaworth, two years his senior, who, looking upon him as a mere schoolboy, treated him cavalierly, and made some slighting allusion to that lame boy. This treatment both saddened and embittered him, when he left school for college, he had the reputation of being an idle and a willful boy, with a very imperfect knowledge of Latin and Greek. Young Byron entered Trinity College in 1805, poorly prepared, and was never distinguished there for those attainments which win the respect of tutors and professors. He wasted his time, and gave himself up to pleasures, riding, boating, bathing, and social hilarities, yet reading more than anybody imagined, and writing poetry, for which he had an extraordinary facility yet not contending for college prizes. His intimate friends were few, but to his chosen circle he was faithful and affectionate. No one at this time would have predicted his future eminence. A more unpromising youth did not exist within the walls of his college. He had a most unfortunate temper, which would have made him unhappy under any circumstances in which he could be placed. This temper, which he inherited from his mother, passionate, fitful, defiant, restless, wayward, melancholy, inclined him naturally to solitude, and often isolated him even from his friends and companions. He brooded upon supposed wrongs and created in his soul strong likes and dislikes. What is worse, he took no pains to control this temperament, and at last it mastered him, drove him into every kind of folly and rashness, and made him appear worse than he really was. This inborn tendency to moodiness, pride, and recklessness should be considered in our estimate of Byron, and should modify any harshness of judgment in regard to his character, which, in some other respects, was interesting and noble. He was not at all envious, but frank, warm-hearted, and true to those he loved, who were, however, very few. If he had learned self-control and had not been spoiled by his mother, his career might have been far different from what it was, and would have sustained the admiration which his brilliant genius called out from both high and low. As it was, Byron left college with dangerous habits, with no reputation for scholarship, with but few friends, and an uncertain future. His bright and witty bursts of poetry, wonderful as the youthful effusions of Dryden and Pope, had made him known to a small circle, but had not brought fame, for which his soul passionately thirsted from first to last. For a nobleman he was poor and embarrassed, and his youthful extravagances had tied up his inherited estate. He was cast upon the world like a ship without a rudder and without ballast. He was aspiring indeed, but without a plan, tired out and disgusted before he was twenty-one, having prematurely exhausted the ordinary pleasures of life and being already inclined to that downward path which leadeth to destruction. This was especially marked in his relations with women, whom he generally flattered, despised, and deserted, as the amusements of an idle hour and yet whose society he could not do without in the ardor of his impulsive and ungoverned affections. In that early career of unbridled desire for excitement and pleasure, nowhere do we see a sense of duty, a respect for the opinions of the good, a reverence for religious institutions, or self-restraint of any kind. But these defects were partly covered over by his many virtues and his exalted rank. Thus far, Byron was comparatively unknown, not yet was he even a favorite in society, beautiful and brilliant as he was, for he had few friends, not much money, and many enemies, whom he made by his scorn and defiance. A born aristocrat, without having penetrated those exclusive circles to which his birth entitled him. He was always quarreling with his mother, and was treated with indifference by his guardian. He was shunned by those who adhered to the conventionalities of life, and was pursued by bailiffs and creditors. 
since his ancestral estates, small for his rank, were encumbered and mortgaged, and Newstead Abbey itself was in a state of dilapidation. Within a year from leaving Cambridge in 1807, Byron published a volume of his juvenile poems, and although they were remarkable for a young man of twenty, they were not of sufficient merit to attract the attention of the public. At this time he was abstemious in eating, wishing to reduce a tendency to corpulence. He could practice self-denial if it were to make his person attractive, especially to ladies. Nor was he idle. His reading, if desultory, was vast, and from the list of books which his biographer has noted, it would seem that Macaulay never read more than Byron in a given time. All the noted historians of England, Germany, Rome, and Greece, with innumerable biographies, miscellanies, and even divinity, the raw material which he afterwards worked into his poems. How he found time to devour so many solid books is to me a mystery. These were not merely European works, but Asiatic also. He was not a critical scholar, but he certainly had a passing familiarity with almost everything in literature worth knowing, which he subsequently utilized, as seen in his Child Herald's Pilgrimage. A college reputation was nothing to him any more than it was to Swift, Goldsmith, Churchill, Gibbon, and many other famous men of letters, who left on record their dislike of the English system of education. Among these were even such men as Addison, Cowper, Milton, and Dryden, who were scholars, but who alike felt that college honors and native genius did not go hand in hand, which might almost be regarded as the rule, but for a few remarkable exceptions like Sir Robert Peel and Gladstone. And yet it would be unwise to decry college honors, since not one in a hundred of those who obtain them by their industry, aptness, and force of will can lay claim to what is called genius, the rarest of all gifts. Moreover, how impossible it is for college professors to detect in students, with whom they are imperfectly acquainted, extraordinary faculties, more especially if the young men are apparently idle and negligent and contemptuous of the college curriculum. It was a bitter pill for Lord Byron when his juvenile poems, called Hours of Idleness, were so severely attacked by the Edinburgh Review. They might have escaped the searching eyes of the critics had the author not been a lord. At that time, the great reviews had just been started, and it was the especial object of the Edinburgh Review to handle authors roughly, to condemn and not praise. Criticism was not then a science, as it became fifty years later, in the hands of St. Bove, who endeavored to review every production fairly and justly. There was nothing like justice entering into the head of Geoffrey or Sidney Smith or Brougham, or later on of Macaulay, whose articles were often written for political party effect. Critics, from the time of Swift down to the middle of the century, aimed to demolish enemies and to make party capital. Hence, as a general thing, their articles were not criticisms at all, but attacks. And as even an Achilles was vulnerable in his heel, so most intellectual giants have some weak point for the shifts of malice to penetrate. Yet it is the weakness of great men that people like to quote. If Byron was humiliated, enraged, and embittered by the severity of the Edinburgh Review, he was not crushed. He rallied, collected his unsuspected strength, and shattered his opponents by one of the wittiest, most brilliant, and most unscrupulous satires in our literature, which he called English Bards and Scotch Reviewers. At the height of his fame, he regretted and suppressed this youthful production of malice and bitterness. Yet it was the beginning of his great career, both as to a consciousness of his own powers and in attracting the public attention. It was doubtless unwise, since he attacked many who were afterwards his friends, and since he sowed the seeds of hatred among those who might otherwise have been his admirers or apologists. He had to learn the truth that, with what measure you meet it shall be measured to you again. The creators of public opinion in reference to Byron have not been women of fashion or men of the world, but literary lions themselves, like Thackeray, who detested him, and the whole school of Pharisaic ecclesiastical dignitaries, who abhorred in him sentiments which they condoned in Fielding, in Burns, in Rousseau, and in Voltaire. Before his bitter satire was published, however, Byron took his seat in the House of Lords, not knowing any peer sufficiently to be introduced by him. His guardian, Lord Carlyle, treated him very shabbily, refusing to furnish to the Lord Chancellor some important information, of a technical kind, which refusal delayed the ceremony for several weeks, until the necessary papers could be procured from Cornwall relating to the marriage of one of his ancestors. 
Unfriended and alone, Byron sat on the scarlet benches of the House of Lords till he was formally admitted as a peer. But when the Lord Chancellor left the wool sack to congratulate him, and with a smiling face extended his hand, the embittered young peer bowed coldly and stiffly, and simply held out two or three of his fingers, an act of impudence for which there was no excuse. It is difficult to understand why Lord Byron should have had so few friends or even acquaintances at that time among people of his rank. At twenty-one he was a lonely and solitary man, mortified by the attack of the Edinburgh Review, exasperated by injustice, morose even to misanthropy, and decidedly skeptical in his religious opinions. Newstead Abbey was a burden to him since he could not keep it up. He owed ten thousand pounds. He had no domestic ties except to a mother with whom he could not live. His poetry had not brought him fame, for which of all things he most ardently thirsted. His love affairs were unfortunate and tinged his soul with sadness and melancholy. Nor had fashion as yet marked him for her own. He craved excitement, and society to him was dull and conventional. It is not surprising that under these circumstances Byron made up his mind to travel. He did not much care whither, provided he had new experiences. The grand tour which educated young men of leisure and fortune took in that day had no charm for him, since he wished to avoid rather than to seek society in those cities which the English frequented. He did not care to see the literary lions of France or Germany or Italy, for though a nobleman, he was too young and unimportant to be much noticed, and he was too shy and too proud to make advances which might be rebuffed, wounding his amour propre. He set out on his pilgrimage the latter part of June 1809 in a ship bound for Lisbon with a small suite of servants. Going to a land where nature was most enchanting, he was sufficiently enthusiastic over the hills and vales and villages of Portugal. As for comfort, he expected little and found less, but to this he was indifferent, so long as he could swim in the Tagus, and ride on a mule, and procure eggs and wine. He was delighted with Cadiz, to him a Cynthera, with its beautiful but uneducated women, where the wives of peasants were on a par with the wives of dukes in cultivation, and where the minds of both had but one idea, that of intrigue. He hastily traveled through Spain on horseback, in August reaching Gibraltar, from which he embarked for Malta and the East. It was Greece and Turkey that Byron most wished to see and know, and, favored by introductions, he was cordially received by governors and pashas. At Athens and other classical spots, he lingered enchanted, yet suppressing his enthusiasm in the contempt he had for the affected raptures of ordinary travelers. It was not the country alone, with its classical associations, which interested him, but also its maidens, with their dark hair and eyes, whom he idealized almost into goddesses. Everything he saw was picturesque, unique, and fascinating. The days and weeks flew rapidly away in dreamy enchantment. After nearly three months at Athens, Byron embarked for Smyrna and explored the ruins of the old Ionian cities, thence proceeding to Constantinople with a view of visiting Persia and the farther east. In a letter to Mr. Henry Drury, he says, I have left my home and seen part of Africa and Asia and a tolerable portion of Europe. I have been with generals and admirals, princes and pashas, governors and ungovernables. Albania, indeed, I have seen more than any Englishman except Mr. Leake, a country rarely visited from the savage character of the natives, but abounding more in natural beauties than the classical regions of Greece. A glimpse of Byron's inner life at this time is caught in the following extract from a letter to another friend. I have now been nearly a year abroad, and hope you will find me an altered personage. I do not mean in body, but in manners. For I begin to find out that nothing but virtue will do in this damned world. I am tolerably sick of vice, which I have tried in its agreeable varieties, and mean on my return to cut all my dissolute acquaintance, leave off wine and carnal company, and betake myself to politics and decorum. One thing we notice in most of the familiar letters of Byron, that he makes frequent use of a vulgar expletive. But when I remember that the Prince of Wales, the Lord Chancellor, the judges, the lawyers, the ministers of the Crown, and many other distinguished people were accustomed to use the same expression, I would fain hope that it was not meant for profanity, but was a sort of fashionable slang intended only to be emphatic. Fifty years have seen a great improvement in the use of language, and the vulgarism which then appeared to be of slight importance is now regarded, almost universally with gentlemen, to be at least in very bad taste. How far Byron transgressed beyond the frequent use of this expletive does not appear either in his letter or in his biography. 
Yet from his irreverent nature and the society with which he was associated, it is more than probable that in him profanity was added to the other vices of his times. Especially did he indulge in drinking to excess in all convivial gatherings. It was seldom that gentlemen sat down to a banquet without each dispatching two or three bottles of wine in the course of an evening. No wonder that gout was the pervading disease among county squires and even among authors and statesmen. Morality was not one of the features of English society 100 years ago, except as it consisted in a scrupulous regard for domesticity, truth, and honor, and abhorrence of meanness and hypocrisy. It would be difficult to point out any defects and excesses of which Byron was guilty at this period beyond that were common to the other fashionable young men of rank and leisure, except a spirit of religious skepticism and impiety, and a wanton and inexcusable recklessness in regard to women, which made him a slave to his passions. The first alienated him, so far as he was known, from the higher respectable classes, who generally were punctilious in the outward observances of religion, and the second made him abhorred by the virtuous middle class, who never condoned his transgressions in this respect. But at this time his character was not generally known. It was not until he was seated on the pinnacle of fame that public curiosity penetrated the scandals of his private life. He was known only as a young nobleman in quest of the excitements of foreign travel, and his letters of introduction procured him all the society he craved. Not yet had he expressed bitterness and wrath against the country which gave him birth, he simply found England dull and craved adventures in foreign lands as unlike England as he could find. The East stimulated his imagination and revived his classical associations. He saw the Orient only as an enthusiastic poet would see it, and as Lamartine saw Jerusalem. But Byron was more curious about the pagan cities of antiquity than concerning the places consecrated by the sufferings of our Lord. He cared more to swim across the Hellespont with Leander than to wander over the sacred hills of Judea, to idealize a beautiful peasant girl among the ruins of Greece, than converse with the monks of Palestine in their gloomy retreats. The result of Byron's travels was seen in the first two cantos of Child Herald, showing alike the fertility of his mind and the aspirations of a lofty genius. These were published in 1812, soon after his return to England at the age of 24. They took England by storm, creating both surprise and admiration, public curiosity and enthusiasm for the young poet who had mounted up to the front ranks of literature at a single leap was unbounded and universal. As he himself wrote, I awoke one morning and found myself famous. Young Byron was now sought, courted, and adored, especially by ladies of the highest rank. Everybody was desirous to catch even a glimpse of the greatest poet that had appeared since Pope and Dryden. Any palace or drawing room he desired to enter was open to him. He was surfeited with roses and praises and incense. He alone took precedence over Scott and Coleridge and Moore and Campbell. For a time, his preeminence in literature was generally conceded. He was the foremost man of letters of his day and the greatest popular idol. His rank added to his éclat, since not many noblemen were distinguished for genius or literary excellence. His singular beauty of face and person, despite his slight lameness, attracted the admiring gaze of women. What Abelard was in the schools of philosophy, Byron was in the drawing rooms of London. People forgot his antecedents, so far as they were known, in the intoxication of the universal admiration and unbounded worship of genius. No poet in English history was ever seated on a prouder throne, and no heathen deity was ever more indifferent than he to the incense of idolaters. End of section 7. Section 8 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Lord Byron, Part 2. Far be it from me to attempt an analysis of the merits of the poem with which the fame of Byron will be forever identified. Its great merits are universally conceded, and while it has defects, great inequalities in both style and matter, some stanzas supernal in beauty and others only mediocre, on the whole, the poem is extraordinary. Byron adopted the Spenserian measure, perhaps the most difficult of all measures, hard even to read aloud, in which blank verse seems to blend with rhyme. It might be either to the ear, though to the eye it is elaborate rhyme such as would severely task a made poet, 
but which this born poet seems to have thrown off without labor. The leading peculiarity of the poem is description of men and places, of the sea, the mountain, and the river, of nature in her loveliness and mysteries, of cities and battlefields consecrated by the heroism of brave and gifted men, in Greece, in Rome, in medieval Europe, with swift passing glances at salient points in history, showing extensive reading and deep meditation. As to the spirit of Child Harold, it is not satirical. It is more pensive than bitter and reveals the loneliness and sorrows of an unsatisfied soul, the unrest of a pilgrim in search for something new. It seeks to penetrate the secrets of struggling humanity, at war often with those certitudes which are the consolation of our inner life. It everywhere recognizes the soul as that which gives greatest dignity to man. It invokes love as the noblest joy of life. The poem is one of the most ideal of human productions, soaring beyond what is material and transient. It is not religious, not reverential, not Christian, like the Divine Comedy and the Paradise Lost. And yet it is lofty, aspiring, exulting in what is greatest in deed or song, destined to immortality of fame and admiration. It is a confession indirectly of the follies and shortcomings of the author and of their retribution, but complains not of the nemesis that avenges everything. It is sensitive of wrongs and injustices and misrepresentations, but does not hurl anathemas. Speaking in sorrow rather than in anger, except in regard to hypocrisies and shams and lies, when its scorn is intense and terrible. The whole poem is brilliant and original, but does not flash like fire in a dark night. It was written with the heart's blood, and is as earnest as it is penetrating. It does not ascend to the higher mysteries forever veiled from mortal eye, nor descend to the deepest depths of hatred and despair, but confines itself to those passions which have marked gifted mortals, and those questionings in which all thoughtful minds have ever delighted. It does not make revelations like Hamlet or Macbeth. It does not explore secrets hidden forever from ordinary minds like Faust. But it muses and meditates on what fate and time have brought to pass, such events as have been revealed in history. It invokes the neglected but impressive monuments of antiquity to tell the tales of glory and of shame. In moral wisdom, it is vastly inferior to Shakespeare, and it is not rich in those wise and striking lines which pass into the proverbs of the world. But it has the glow of a poetic soul longing for fame, craving love, and not unmindful of immortality. Its most beautiful stanzas are full of tenderness and sadness for lost or unrequited affections, of reproachless sorrow for broken friendships, in which the soul would fain have lived but for inconsistencies and contradictions which made true and permanent love impossible. The poem paints a paradise lost rather than a paradise regained. I wonder at its popularity, for it seems to me too deep and learned for popular appreciation, except in those stanzas where pathos or enthusiasm, expressed in matchless language, appeal to the heart and soul. Of all modern poets, Byron is the most human and outspoken, daring to say what many would fear or blush to meditate upon. He fearlessly reveals the infirmities and audacities of a double and mysterious nature, made up of dust and deity, now groveling in the mire, then borne aloft to the skies. The football of the eternal powers of good and evil enslaved and yet to be emancipated, as we may hope, in the last and final struggle when the soul is rescued by omnipotence. I have alluded to the triumphs of Byron on the publication of Child Harold, but his joys were more than balanced by his sorrows. His mother died suddenly without seeing him. His dearest friend Matthews was drowned. He was hampered by creditors. He made no mark in the House of Lords and was sick of what he called parliamentary mummeries. His habits became more and more dissipated among the boon companions who courted his society. His reputation after a while began to wane, for people became ashamed of their enthusiasm. Some critics disparaged his poetry, and conventional circles were shocked by his morals. Three years of London life told on his constitution, and he was completely disenchanted. He sought retirement and solitude, for not even the most brilliant society satisfied him. He wearied of such a woman and admirer as Madame de Stal. He went to Holland House, that resort of all the eminent ones of the time, as seldom as he could. He buried himself with a few intimate friends, chiefly poets, among whom were Moore and Rogers. He saw and liked Sir Walter Scott, but did not push his acquaintance to intimacy. The larger part of his letters were written to Murray, the publisher, who treated him generously. 
but Byron gave away his literary gains to personal friends in need. He seemed to scorn copyrights for support. He would write only for fame. At the age of 27, in January 1815, Byron married Miss Milbank, a lady whom he did not love, but to whom he was attracted by her supposed wealth, which would patch up his own fortunes. He had great respect for this lady and some friendship, but with all her virtues and attainments, she was cold, conventional, and exacting. A mystery shrouds this unfortunate affair, which has never been fully revealed. The upshot was that, to Byron's inexpressible humiliation, in less than a year she left him, never to return. No reasons were given. It was enough that both parties were unhappy and had cause to be, and both kept silence. But the voice of rumor and scandal was not silent. All the failings of Byron were now exaggerated and dwelt upon by those who envied him and by those who hated him, for his enemies were more numerous than his friends. Those whom he had snubbed or ridiculed or insulted now openly turned against him. The conventional public had a rare subject for their abuse or indignation. Proper people, religious people, and commonplace people joined in the cry against a man with whom a virtuous woman could not live. Indeed, no woman could have lived happily with Byron, and very few were the women with whom he could have lived happily, by reason of that irritability and unrest which is so common with genius. The habits of abstraction and contemplation which absorbed much of his time at home were not easily understood by an ordinary woman, to whom social life is necessary. Byron lived much in his library, which was his solitary luxury. In the revelry of the imagination, his heart became cold. To follow poetry, says Pope, one must leave father and mother and cleave to it alone, as Dante and Petrarch and Milton did. Not even Byron's intense craving for affection could be satisfied when he was dwelling on the ideals which his imagination created and which scarcely friendship could satisfy. Even so good a man as Carlyle lived among his books rather than in the society of his wife, whom he really loved, and whose virtues and attainments he appreciated and admired. An affectionate woman runs a great risk in marrying an absorbed and preoccupied man of genius, even if his character be reproachless. Unfortunately, the character of Byron was anything but reproachless, and no one knew this better than his wife, which knowledge doubtless alienated what little affection she had for him. He seems to have sought low company even after his marriage, and Lady Byron has intimated that she did not think him altogether sane. Living with him as his wife was insupportable, but though she separated from him, she did not seek a divorce. Byron would not have married at all if he had consulted his happiness, and still more his fame. In reviewing the great names of philosophy and science, we shall find that those who have most distinguished themselves have virtually admitted their own unfitness for the marriage tie by remaining in celibacy. Newton, Gassendi, Galileo, Descartes, Bale, Locke, Leibniz, Boyle, Hume, Gibbon, Macaulay, and a host of others. The scandal which Byron's separation from his wife created, and his known and open profligacy, at last shut him out from the society of which he had been so bright an ornament. It is a peculiarity of the English people, which redounds to their honor, to exclude from public approbation any man, however gifted or famous, who has outraged the moral sense by open and ill-disguised violation of the laws of morality. The cases of Dilke and Parnell in our own day are illustrations known to all. What in France or Italy is condoned is never pardoned or forgotten in England. Not even a Voltaire, a Rousseau, or a Mirabeau, had they lived in England, could have been accepted by English society, much less a man who scorned and ridiculed it. Even Byron, for a few years the pet, the idol, and the glory of the country, was not too high to fall. To quote one of his own stanzas, He who ascends to mountain tops shall find the loftiest peaks most wrapped in clouds and snow. He who surpasses or subdues mankind must look down on the hate of those below. Though high above the sun of glory glow, and far beneath the earth and ocean spread, round him are icy rocks and loudly blow, contending tempests on his naked head. Embarrassed in his circumstances, filled with disgust, mortification, and shame, excluded from the proudest circles, Byron now resolved to leave England forever and bury himself in such foreign lands as were most congenial to his tastes and habits. But for his immorality, he might still have shined at an exalted height, for he had not yet written anything which shocked the practical English mind. The worst he had written was bitter satire, yet not more bitter than that of Swift or Pope. 
no defiance, no blasphemous sentiments, or what seemed to many to be such, had yet escaped him. His corsair and his bride of Abydos appeared soon after the child Harold, and added to his fame by their exquisite melody of rhyme and sentimental admiration for Oriental life, though even these were tinged with that abandon which afterwards made his later poems a scandal and reproach. The disappointment of youthful passion and the lassitude and remorse of premature excess, the lone friendlessness of his life, and, I may add, the reproaches of society induced him to fly from the scene of his brilliant successes, filled with blended sentiments of scorn, hatred, defiance, and despair. In the spring of 1816, at the age of 28, Byron left England forever, a voluntary exile on the face of the earth, saddened, embittered, and disappointed. It was to Italy that he turned his steps, passing through Brussels and Flanders, lingering on the Rhine, enamored with its ruined castles, still more with nature, and making a long stay in Switzerland. Here he visited the castle of Chilon, and all the spots made memorable by the abodes of Rousseau, Gibbon, and Madame de Stal, and all the most interesting scenery of the Bernese Alps, Lake Leman, Interlaken, Thun, the Jungfrau, the glaciers, Barents, Chamuni, Bern, and on to Geneva, where he made the acquaintance of Shelley and his wife. The Shelleys he found most congenial, and stayed with them some time. While in the neighborhood of Geneva, he produced the third canto of Child Harold, the prisoner of Chilon, a dream, and other things. In October, he passed on to Milan, Verona, and Venice, and in this latter city, he took up his residence. Oh, that we could blot out Byron's life in Venice, made up of love adventures and dissipation and utter abandonment to those pleasures that appealed to his lower nature, as if he were possessed by a demon, utterly reckless of his health, his character, and his fame. Venice was, then, the most immoral city in Italy, given over to idleness and pleasure. It was here that Byron's contempt for woman became fixed, seeing only her weaknesses and follies, and it was this contempt for woman which intensified the abhorrence in which his character was generally held, in the most respectable circles in England. Even in distant Venice, his baleful light was not under a bushel, and the scandals of his life extended far and wide, especially that in reference to Margarita Cogni, an illiterate Viraggio who could neither read nor write, and whom he was finally compelled to discard on account of the violence of her temper, after living with her in the most open manner. And yet, in all this degradation, he was not idle. How could so prolific a writer be? Byron did not ordinarily rise till two o'clock in the afternoon, and spent the interval between his breakfast and dinner in riding on the Lido one of those long, narrow islands which lie between the Adriatic and the lagoon, in the midst of which Venice is built, on the islets arising from its shallow waters. Yet he found time to begin his Don Juan, besides writing The Lament of Tasso, The Tragedy of Manfred, and an Arminian Grammar, all which appeared in 1817, in 1818 Beppo, and in 1819 Mazeppa. He also made a flying trip to Florence and Rome, and some of the finest stanzas of Child Harold are descriptions of the classic ruins and the masterpieces of Grecian and medieval art, the beauties and the associations of Italy's great cities. I stood in Venice on the bridge of Sighs, a palace and a prison on each hand. I saw from out the wave her structures rise, as from the stroke of the enchanter's wand. A thousand years their cloudy wings expand around me, and a dying glory smiles, o'er the far times when many a subject land looked to the winged lion's marble piles, where Venice sate in state, throned on her hundred isles. Byron's correspondence was small, being chiefly confined to his publisher, to more, and to a few intimate friends. These letters are interesting because of their frankness and wit, although they are not models of fine writing. Indeed, I do not know where to find any specimens of masterly prose in all his compositions. He was simply a poet, facile in every form of measure from Spencer to Campbell. No remarkable prose writings appeared in England at all, at that time, until Sir Walter Scott's novels were written, and until Macaulay, Carlyle, and Lamb wrote their inimitable essays. Nothing is more heavy and unartistic than Moore's Life of Byron. There is hardly a brilliant paragraph in it, and yet Moore is one of the most musical and melodious of all the English poets. Milton, indeed, was equally great in prose and verse, but very few men have been distinguished as prose writers and poets at the same time. 
Sir Walter Scott and Southey are the most remarkable exceptions. I think that Macaulay could have been distinguished as a poet if he had so pleased, but he would have been a literary poet like Wordsworth or Tennyson or Coleridge, not a man who sings out of his soul because he cannot help it, like Byron or Burns, or like Whittier among our American poets. It was not until 1819, when Byron had been three years in Venice, that he fell in love with the Countess Guccioli, the wife of one of the richest nobles of Italy, young, beautiful, and interesting. This love seems to have been disinterested and lasting, and while it was a violation of all the rules of morality, and would not have been allowed in any other country than Italy, it did not further degrade him. It was pretty much such a love as Voltaire had for Madame de Châtelet, and with it he was at last content. There is no evidence that Byron ever afterward loved any other woman, and what is very singular about the affair is that it was condoned by the husband until it became a scandal even in Italy. The countess was taken ill on her way to Ravenna, and thither Byron followed her and lived in the same palace with her, the palace of her husband, who courted the poet's society, and who afterward left his young countess to free intercourse with Byron at Bologna, not without a compensation in revenue, which was more disgraceful than the Amour itself. About this time, Byron would probably have returned to England, but for the enchantment which enslaved him. He could not part from the Countess, nor she from him. The Pope announced the separation of the Count from his wife, and she returned to her father's house on a pittance of two hundred pounds a year. She sacrificed everything for the young English poet, her splendid home, her relatives, her honor, and her pride. Never was there a sadder episode in the life of a man of letters. If Byron had married such a woman in his early life, how different might have been his history. With such a love as she inspired, had he been faithful to it, he might have lived in radiant happiness, the idol and the pride of all admirers of genius wherever the English language is spoken, seated on a throne which kings might envy. So much have circumstances to do with human destinies. Since Abelard, never was there a man more capable of a genuine, fervid love than Byron, and yet he threw himself away. He was his own worst enemy, and all from an ill-regulated nature which he inherited both from his father and his mother, with no mentor to whom he would listen. And thus his star sunk down in the eternal shades, a fallen Lucifer expelled from bliss. I would not condone the waywardness and vices of Byron or weaken the eternal distinctions between right and wrong. The impression I wish to convey is that there were two very distinctly marked sides to his character, that his conduct was not without palliations in view of his surroundings, the force of his temptations and his wayward nature, uncurbed by parental care or early training, indeed rather goaded on by the unfortunate conditions of his youth to find consolation in doing as he liked, without regard to duty or the opinions of society. Born with the keenest sensibilities, the emotive powers of tremendous sweep and force, neglected, crossed, mortified, with no wise guidance, he was driven in upon himself and developed an intense self-will which would endure no control. Unhappy will be the future of that man, however amiable, affectionate, and generous, who, whether from neglect in youth, like Byron, or from sheer willfulness in manhood, determines to act as the mood takes him, because he has freedom of will without regard to the social restraints imposed upon conscience by the unwritten law, which pursues him wherever he goes, even should he fly to the uttermost parts of the earth. No one can escape from moral accountability, whether in a seductive paradise or in a dungeon or in a desert. The only stability for society must be in the character of its individual members. Before pleasure comes duty, to family, to friends, to country, to self, and to the maker. This sense of moral accountability Byron seems never to have had in regard to anybody or anything, his self-indulgence culminating in an egotism melancholy to behold. He would go where he pleased, say what he pleased, write as he pleased, do what he pleased, without any constraint, whether in opposition or not to the customs and rules of society, his own welfare, or the laws of God. It was moral madness pursuing him to destruction, the logical and necessary sequence of unrestrained self-will, sometimes assuming the form of angelic loveliness and inspiration in the eyes of his idolaters. No counselor guided him wiser than Moore or Shelley. Even the worldly advice of Rogers and Madame de Stahl was thrown away whenever they presumed to counsel him. 
Nobody could influence him. His abandonment to fitful labors or pleasures was alike his glory and his shame. After a day of frivolity, he would consume the midnight hours in the intensest studies, stimulated by gin, to awake in the morning in lassitude or pain, for work he must, as well as play. The consequence of this burning the candle at both ends was failing health and diminished energies, until his short race was run. He had produced more poetry at 34 years of age than any other English poet at the age of 50, some of almost transcendent merit, but more of questionable worth, though not of questionable power. Aside from the child Harold, the Hebrew Melodies, the Prisoner of Chillon, and perhaps the Corsair, the Bride of Abydos, Lara, and the Siege of Corinth, the rest, excepting minor poems, however beautiful in measure and grand in thought, give a shock to the religious or to the moral sentiments. Cain and Manfred are regarded as almost blasphemous, though probably not so meant to be by the poet, in view of the stirring questions of Grecian tragedy. While the longest of his poems, Don Juan, is an insult to womanhood and a disgrace to genius, for although containing some of the most exquisite touches of description and finest flights of poetic feeling, its theme is along the lowest level of human passion. Whatever Byron wrote was unhesitatingly published and read, whether good or evil, whatever were those follies and defiances which excluded him from the best society. And it is a matter of surprise to me that any noted and wealthy publisher could be found, in respectable and conventional England, venal enough to publish perhaps the most corrupting poem in our language. Worse than anything which Boccaccio wrote for his Italian readers, or anything which plain-spoken fielding and the dramatists of the reign of Charles II ever allowed to go into print. For though they were coarser in their language, they were not so seductive in their spirit, and did not poison the soul like Don Juan, the very name of which has become a synonym for extreme depravity. That abominable poem was read because Lord Byron wrote it, and because its immorality was slightly veiled by the beauty of the language, even when a copy could not be found on the table of any respectable drawing room, and the name of the author was seldom mentioned except with stern and honest censure. It is perhaps fair to quote Murray's own words, throwing the responsibility on the public. They talked of his immoral writings, but there is a whole row of sermons glued to my shelf. I hate the sight of them. Why don't they buy those? A fair enough retort, and yet, like the newspaper purveyors of the records of vice in our own day, the publisher was responsible for making the vile stuff accessible and thus debasing the public taste. End of section 8. Section 9 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Lord Byron, Part 3. How different was Byron's painting of Spanish life from that of the immortal Cervantes, whom Lowell places among the five master geniuses of the world? In Don Quixote, there is not a sentence which does not exalt woman, or which degrades man. A lofty ideal of purity and chivalrous honor permeates every page, even in the most ludicrous scenes. The whole work blazes with wit and with the wisdom of a proverbial philosophy, uttered by the ignorant squire of a fanatical and bewildered knight. But amidst the practical jokes and follies of all the characters in that marvelous work of fiction, we see also a moral beauty, idealized, of course, such as were rivaled only in Spanish art in the Madonnas of Murillo. I believe that in the imaginary sketches of Spanish life as portrayed by Byron, slanders and lies deface the poem from beginning to end. Who is the best authority for truthfulness in the description of Spanish people, Cervantes or Byron? The spiritual loftiness portrayed in the lives of Spanish heroes and heroines mixed up as it was with the most ludicrous pictures of common life, has made the Spaniard's work of fiction one of the most treasured and endearing monuments of human fame. Whereas the insulting innuendos of the English poet have gone far to rob him of the glory which he had justly won in his earlier productions, and to make his name a doubt. If in the course of generations yet to come, the evil which Byron did by that one poem alone shall be forgotten in the services he rendered to our literature by other works, which cannot die, then he may some day be received into the pantheon of the benefactors of mind. 
I would speak with less vehemence in reference to those poems which are generally supposed to be permeated with defiance, scorn, and misanthropy. In Manfred and Cain, it was with Byron a work of art to describe the utterances of impious spirits against the sovereign rule of God. Had he not fallen from high estate as an interpreter of the soul, the critics might have seen here nothing more to condemn than in some of the Grecian tragedies, many passages in the Paradise Lost, and in the general spirit of Faust. It is no proof that he was a blasphemer in his heart because he painted blasphemy. To describe a wanderer on the face of the earth, driven hither and thither by pursuing vengeance as the first recorded murderer, the poet was obliged by all the rules of art to put such sentiments into his mouth as accorded with his unrepented crime and his dreadful agonies of mind and soul. Where is the proof that they were his own agonies, remorse, despair? Surely we may pardon in Byron what we excuse in Goethe in the delineation of unique characters, the great creations which belong to the realm of the imagination alone. The imputation that the sayings of his fallen fiends were the cherished sentiments of the poet himself may have been one cause of his contempt for the average intelligence of his countrymen and for their inveterate and incurable prejudices. Nothing in Dante is more intense and concentrated in language than the malediction of Eve upon her fratricidal son. May the grass wither from thy feet, the woods deny thee shelter, earth a home, the dust a gravel, the sun his light, and heaven her God. Yet the reader feels the naturalness of this bitter cursing of her own son by the frenzied mother. How could a great artist like Byron put sentiments into the mouth of Cain such as would be harmless in the essays of a country parson. If he painted Lucifer, he must make him speak like Lucifer, not like a theological professor. Nothing could be more ungenerous and narrow than to abuse Byron for a dramatic poem in which some of his characters were fiends rather than men. We have no more right to say that he was an infidel because Cain or Lucifer blasphemed than to say that Goethe was an atheist because Mephistopheles denied God. If Byron had avowed atheistical opinions in letters or conversations, that would be another thing, but there is no evidence that he did, and much to the contrary. A few months before he died, he was visited by a pious crank, who out of curiosity or Christian zeal sought to know his theological views. Byron treated him with the greatest courtesy and freely communicated his opinions on religious subjects, from which it would appear that he differed from church people generally only on the matter of eternal punishment, which he did not believe was consistent with infinite love or infinite justice. Perhaps it would have been wiser if he had not written Cain at all, considering how many readers there are without brains, and how large was the class predisposed to judge him harshly in everything. No doubt he was irreligious and skeptical, but it does not follow from this that he was atheistical or blasphemous. There is doubtless a misanthropic vein in all Byron's later poetry, which is not wholesome for many people to read, especially in Manfred, one of the bitterest of his productions by reason of sorrows and disappointments and misrepresentations. It was Byron's misfortune to appear worse than he really was, owing to his unconcealed contempt for the opinions of mankind. Yet he could not complain that he reaped what he had not sown. Some of his biographers thought him to be at this time even morbidly desirous of a bad reputation, going so far as to write paragraphs against himself in foreign journals, and being filled with glee at the joke, when they were republished in English newspapers. He despised and defied all conventionalities, and conventional England dropped him from her list of favorites. The life of Byron, strange to say, was less exposed to scandal after he made the acquaintance of the countess who enslaved him, and who was also enslaved in turn. His heart now opened to many noble sentiments. He returned in a degree to society, and gave dinners and suppers. He associated with many distinguished patriots and men of genius. He had a strong sympathy with the Italians in their struggle for freedom. One quarter of his income he devoted to charities. He was regular in his athletic exercises and could swim four hours at a time. He was always proud of swimming across the Hellespont. He was devoted to his natural daughter and educated her in a Catholic school. He studied more severely all works of art, though his admiration for art was never so great as it was for nature. The glories and wonders of nature inspired him with perpetual joys. There is nothing finer in all his poetry than the following stanza. Ye stars which are the poetry of heaven, if in your bright leaves we would read the fate of men and empires, 
it is to be forgiven that in our aspirations to be great our destinies or leap their mortal state and claim a kindred with you for ye are a beauty and a mystery and create in us such love and reverence from afar that fortune fame power life have named themselves a star there was never a time when byron did not seek out beautiful retreats in nature as the source of his highest happiness hence solitude was nothing to him when he could commune with the works of god his biographer declares that in eighteen twenty one he was greatly improved in every respect in genius in temper in moral views in health and happiness he has had mischievous passions but these he seems to have subdued he was always temperate in his diet living chiefly on fish and vegetables and if he drank more wine and spirits than was good for him it was to rally his exhausted energies his powers of production were never greater than at this period but his literary labors were slowly wearing him out he could not live without work while pleasure palled upon him in a letter to a stranger who sought to convert him he showed anything but anger or contempt do me says he the justice to suppose that video meliora provoque however the deteriora secor may have been applied to my conduct writing to murray in eighteen twenty two he says it is not impossible that i may have three or four cantos of don juan ready by autumn as i obtained a permission from my dictatress the countess guccioli to continue it provided always it was to be more guarded and decorous in the continuation than in the commencement alas he could not undo the mischief he had done about this time byron received a visit from lord clare his earliest friend at cambridge to whom through life he was devotedly attached a friendship which afforded exceeding delight he never forgot his few friends although he railed at his enemies he was ungenerously treated by lee hunt to whom he rendered every kindness he says i have done all i could for him since he came here genoa but it is all most useless his wife is ill his six children far from tractable and in worldly affairs he himself is a child the death of shelley left them totally aground and i could not see them in such a state without using the common feelings of humanity and what means were in my power to set them afloat again as to any community of feeling thought or opinion between him or me there is little or none but i think him a good principled man and must do as i would be done by toward shelley byron entertained the greatest respect and affection for his suavity gentleness and good breeding and shelley's accidental death was a great shock to him among his other intimate acquaintances in italy were lord and lady bellessington with whom he kept up a pleasant correspondence the most plaintive sad and generous of all his letters was the one he wrote to lady byron from pisa in eighteen twenty one in acknowledgment of the receipt of a tress of his daughter ada's hair the time which has elapsed since our separation has been considerably more than the whole brief period of our union and of our prior acquaintance we both made a bitter mistake but now it is over and irrecoverably so but this very impossibility of reunion seems to me at least a reason why on all the few points of discussion which can arise between us we should preserve the courtesies of life and as much of its kindness as people who are never to meet may preserve more easily than nearer connections i assure you i bear you now no resentment whatever whether the offence has been solely on my side or reciprocal or on yours chiefly i have ceased to reflect upon any but two things that you are the mother of my child and that we shall never meet again at that period about a year before byron's death moore thus writes to the world and more especially england he presented himself in no other aspect than that of a stern haughty misanthrope self banished from the society of men and most of all from that of englishmen the more beautiful and genial inspirations of his muse were looked upon but as lucid intervals between the paroxysms of an inherent malignancy of nature but how totally all this differed from the byron of the social hour they who lived in familiar intercourse with him may be safely left to tell as it was no english gentleman ever approached him with the common forms of introduction that did not come away at once surprised and charmed by the kind courtesy of his manners the unpretending play of his conversation and on nearer intercourse the frank youthful spirits to the flow of which he gave way with such zest as to produce the impression that gaiety was after all the true bent of his disposition scott writing of him after his death says in talents he was unequalled and his faults were those rather of a bizarre temper 
arising from an eager and irritable nervous habit, than any depravity of disposition. He was devoid of selfishness, which I take to be the basest ingredient in the human composition. He was generous, humane, and noble-minded, when passion did not blind him. About this time, 1823, the great struggle of the Greeks to shake off the Ottoman yoke was in progress. I have already in another volume attempted to give the facts in relation to that memorable movement. Christendom sympathized with the gallant but apparently hopeless struggle of a weak nation to secure its independence, both from a sentiment of admiration for the freedom of ancient Greece in the period of its highest glories, and from the love of liberty which animated the liberal classes amid the political convulsions of the day. But the governments of Europe were loath to complicate the difficulties which existed between nations in that stormy period, and dared not extend any open aid to struggling Greece, beyond giving their moral aid to the Greek cause, lest it should embroil Europe in a war, of which she was weary. Less than ten years had elapsed since Europe had combined to dethrone Napoleon, and some of her leading powers, like Austria and Russia, had a detestation of popular insurrections. In this complicated state of political affairs, when any indiscretion on the part of friendly governments might kindle anew the flames of war, Lord Byron was living in Genoa, taking such an interest in the Greek struggle that he abandoned poetry for politics. He had always sympathized with enslaved nations struggling for independence and was driven from Ravenna on account of his alliance with the Revolutionary Society of the Carbonari. A new passion now seized him. He entered heart and soul into the struggles of the Greeks. Their cause absorbed him. He would aid them to the full extent of his means, with money and arms, as a private individual. He would be a political or military hero, a man of action, not of literary leisure. Every lover of liberty must respect Byron's noble aspiration to assist the Greeks. It was a new field for him, but one in which he might retrieve his reputation, for it must be borne in mind that his ruling passion was fame and that he had gained all that he could expect by his literary productions. Whether loved or hated, admired or censured, his poetry had placed him in the front rank of literary geniuses throughout the world. As a poet, his immortality was secured. In literary efforts, he had also probably exhausted himself. He could write nothing more which would add to his fame unless he took a long rest and recreation. He was weary of making poetry, but by plunging into a sea of fresh adventures, and by giving a new direction to his powers, he might be sufficiently renovated, in the course of time, to write something grander and nobler than even Child Harold or Cain. Lord Byron at this time was only thirty-five years old, a period when most men begin their best work. His constitution, it is true, was impaired, but he was still full of life and enterprise. He could ride or swim as well as he ever could. The call of a gallant people summoned him to arms, and of all nations he most loved the Greeks. He was an enthusiast in their cause. He believed that the day of their deliverance was at hand. So he made up his mind to consecrate his remaining energies to effect their independence. He opened a correspondence with the Greek committee in London. He selected a party, including a physician, to sail with him from Geneva. He raised a sum of about 10,000 pounds and on the 13th of July, 1823, embarked with his small party and eight servants on board the Hercules for Greece. After a short delay at Leghorn, the poet reached Cephalonia on the 24th of July. He was enthusiastically received by the Greeks of Argostoli, the principal port, but deemed it prudent to remain there until he could get further intelligence from Corfu and Missoloni, visiting in the interval some of the neighboring islands consecrated by the muse of Homer. The dissensions among the Greek leaders greatly embarrassed Byron, but did not destroy his ardor. He saw that the people were degenerate, faithless, and stained with atrocities as disgraceful as those of the Turks themselves. He dared not commit himself to any one of the struggling, envious parties which rallied round their respective chieftains. He lingered for six weeks in Cephalonia without the ordinary comforts of life, yet against all his habits, rising at an early hour and attending to business, negotiating bills, and corresponding with the government, so far as there was a recognized central power. At last, after the fall of Corinth, taken from the Turks, and the arrival at Missoloni of Prince Mavrocodato, the only leader of the Greeks worthy of the name of statesman, Byron sailed for that city, then invested by a Turkish fleet, and narrowly escaped capture. Here he did all he could to produce union among the chieftains, and took into his pay five hundred Suliotes, acting as their leader. He meditated an attack on Lepanto, which commanded the navigation of the Gulf of Corinth, and received from the government a commission for that enterprise, 
but dissensions among his men and intrigues between rival generals prevented the execution of his project. It was in Missolonghi, January 22, 1824, that, with the memorandum, on this day I completed my 36th year, Byron wrote his latest verses, most pathetically regretting his youth and his unfortunate life, but arousing himself to find in a noble cause a glorious death. The fire that in my bosom prays is like to some volcanic isle, no torches kindled at its blaze, a funeral pile. Awake, not Greece, she is awake. Awake, my spirit, think through whom thy life blood tastes its parent lake, and then strike home. Seek out, less often sought than found, a soldier's grave for thee the best. Then look around and choose thy ground and take thy rest. Vexations, disappointments, and exposure to the rains of February so wrought upon Byron's eager spirit and weakened body that he was attacked by convulsive fits. The physician, in accordance with the custom of the time, bled their patient several times against the protest of Byron himself, which reduced him to extreme weakness. He rallied from the attack for a time and devoted himself to the affairs of Greece, hoping for the restoration of his health when spring should come. He spent in three months $30,000 for the cause into which he had so cordially entered. In April, he took another cold from severe exposure and fever set in, to relieve which bleeding was again resorted to and often repeated. He was now confined to his room, which he never afterwards left. He at last realized that he was dying and sent incoherent messages to his sister, to his daughter, and to a few intimate friends. The end came on the 19th of April. The Greek government rendered all the honor possible to the illustrious dead. His remains were transferred to England. He was not buried in Westminster Abbey, however, but in the church of Hucknall, near Newstead, where a tablet was erected to his memory by his sister, the Honorable Augusta Maria Lee. So Harold ends in Greece his pilgrimage, there fitly ending, in that land renowned, whose mighty genius lives in glory's page. He on the muses consecrated ground, sinking to rest, while his young brows are bound with their unfading wreath. To bands of mirth no more in Tempe let the pipe resound. Harold, I follow to thy place of birth, the slow hearse, and thy last sad pilgrimage on earth. I can add but little to what I have already said in reference to Byron, either as to his character or his poetry. The Edinburgh Review, which in Brougham's article on his early poems had stung him into satire and aroused him to a sense of his own powers, in years later, by Geoffrey's hand, gave a most appreciative account of his poems, while mourning over his morbid gloom. Words that breathe and thoughts that burn are not merely the ornaments but the common staple of his poetry and he is not inspired or impressive only in some happy passages, but through the whole body and tissue of his composition. The keen insight and exceptional intellect of the philosopher-poet Goethe recognized in him the greatest talent of our century. His marvelous poetic genius was universally acknowledged in his own day, and more than that, so human was it, that it attracted the sympathies of all civilized nations, and as Lamartine said, made English literature known throughout Europe. Byron's poetry was politically influential also by reason of its liberty-loving spirit, arousing Italy, inspiring the young revolutionists of Germany, and awakening a generous sympathy for Greece. Without the consciousness of any mission beyond the expression of his own ebullient nature, this poet contributed no mean impulse to the general emancipation of spirit which has signalized the 19th century. Two generations have passed away since Byron's mortal remains were committed to the dust, and the verdict of his country has not since materially changed. Admiration for his genius alone. The light of lesser stars than he shines with brighter radiance. What the enlightened verdict of mankind may be two generations hence, no living mortal can tell. The worshippers of intellect may attempt to reverse or modify the judgment already passed, but the impressive truth remains that no man, however great his genius, will be permanently judged aside from character. When Lord Bacon left his name and memory to men's charitable judgments and the next age, he probably had in view his invaluable legacy to mankind of earnest searchings after truth, which made him one of the greatest of human benefactors. How far the poetry of Byron has proved a blessing to the world must be left to an abler critic than I lay claim to be. 
In him, the good and evil went hand in hand in the eternal warfare, which ancient Persian sages saw between the powers of light and darkness in every human soul. A consciousness of which warfare made Byron himself in his saddest hours wish he had never lived at all. If we could, in his life and in his works, separate the evil from the good, and let only the good remain, then his services to literature could hardly be exaggerated, and he would be honored as the greatest English poet, so far as native genius goes, after Shakespeare and Milton. End of section 9. Section 10 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Thomas Carlyle, Part 1. 1785 to 1881. Criticism and Biography. The now famous biography of Thomas Carlyle by Mr. Froude shed a new light on the eccentric Scotch essayist, and in some respects changed the impressions produced by his own reminiscences and the letters of his wife. It is with the aid of those two brilliant and interesting volumes on Carlyle's earlier life and Life in London, issued about two years after the death of their distinguished subject, that I have rewritten my own view of one of the most remarkable men of the 19th century. Of the men of genius who have produced a great effect on their own time, there is no one concerning whom such fluctuating opinions have prevailed within forty years as in regard to Carlyle. His old admirers became his detractors, and those who first disliked him became his friends. When his earlier works appeared, they attracted but little general notice, though there were many who saw in him a new light, or a new power to brush away cobwebs and shams, and to exalt the spiritual and eternal in man over all materialistic theories and worldly conventionalities. Carlyle's Miscellanies, essays published first in the leading reviews when he lived in his moorland retreat, created enthusiasm among young students and genuine thinkers of every creed. Lord Jeffrey detected the new genius and gave him a lift. Carlyle's French Revolution took the world by surprise and established his fame. His Oliver Cromwell modified and perhaps changed the opinions of English and American people respecting the great protector. It was then that his popularity was greatest and that the eccentric genius of Chain Row, so long struggling with poverty, was assured of a competence and was received in some of the proudest families of the kingdom as a teacher and a sage. Thus far he was an optimist, taking cheerful views of human life and encouraging those who had noble aspirations. But for some unaccountable reason, whether from discontent or dyspepsia or disappointment or disgust with this world, Carlyle gradually became a pessimist and attacked all forms of philanthropy, thus alienating those who had been his warmest supporters. He grew more bitter and morose, until at last he howled almost like a madman, and was steeped in cynicism and gloom. He put forth the doctrine that might was right, and that thrones belonged to the strongest. He saw no reliance in governments save upon physical force and expressed the most boundless contempt for all institutions established by the people. Then he wrote his Friedrich the Great, his most ambitious and elaborate production, received as an authority from its marvelous historical accuracy, but not so generally read as his French Revolution, and not, like his Cromwell, changing the opinions of mankind. Soon after this, the death of his wife plunged him into renewed gloom from which he never emerged, and he virtually retired from the world and was lost sight of by the younger generation, until his reminiscences appeared, injudiciously published at his request by his friend and pupil Froude, in which his scorn and contempt for everybody and everything turned the current of public opinion strongly against him. This was still further increased when the letters of his wife appeared. Carlyle's bitterest assailants were now agnostics of every shade and degree, especially of the humanitarian school, that to which Mill and George Eliot belonged. It was seen that this reviler of hypocrisy and shams, this disbeliever in miracles and in mechanisms to save society, was after all a believer in God Almighty and in immortality, a stern advocate of justice and duty, appealing to the conscience of mankind, a man who detested Comte the positivist as much as he despised Mill the agnostic, and who exalted the old religion of his fathers, stripped of supernaturalism, as the only hope of the world. 
The biography by Froude, while it does not conceal the atrabilious temperament of Carlyle, his bad temper, his intense egotism, his irritability, his overweening pride, his scorn, his profound loneliness and sorrow, and the deep gloom into which he finally settled, made clear at the same time his honest and tender nature, his noble independence, his heroic struggles with poverty of which he never complained, his generous charities, his conscientiousness and allegiance to duty, his constant labors amid disease and excessive nervousness, and his profound and unvarying love for his wife, although he was deficient in those small attentions and demonstrations of affection which are so much prized by women. If it be asked whether he was happy in his domestic relations, I would say that he was as much so as a man could be. But it was a physical and moral impossibility that, with his ailment and temper, he could be happy. He was not sent into this world to be happy, but to do a work which only such a man as he could do. So displeasing, however, were the personal peculiarities of Carlyle that the man can never be popular. This Hyperborean literary giant, speaking a Babylonian dialect, smiting remorselessly all pretenders and quacks, and even honest fools, was himself personally a bundle of contradictions, fierce and sad by turns. He was a compound of Diogenes, Jeremiah, and Dr. Johnson, like the Grecian cynic in his contempt and scorn, like the Jewish prophet in his melancholy lamentations, like the English moralist in his grim humor and overbearing dogmatism. It is unfortunate that we know so much of the man. Better would it be for his fame if we knew nothing at all of his habits and peculiarities. In our blended admiration and contempt, our minds are diverted from the lasting literary legacy he has left, which, after all, is the chief thing that concerns us. The mortal man is dead, but his works live. The biography of a great man is interesting, but his thoughts go coursing round the world, penetrating even the distant ages, modifying systems and institutions. What a mighty power is law! Yet how little do we know or care comparatively for lawgivers? Thomas Carlyle was born in the year 1795 of humble parentage in an obscure Scotch village. His father was a stonemason much respected for doing good work and for his virtue and intelligence, a rough, rugged man who appreciated the value of education. Although kind-hearted and religious, it would seem that he was as hard and undemonstrative as an old-fashioned Puritan farmer, one of those men who never kiss their children or even their wives before people. His mother also was sagacious and religious and marked by great individuality of character. For these stern parents, Carlyle ever cherished the profoundest respect and affection, regularly visiting them once a year wherever he might be, writing to them frequently, and yielding as much to their influence as to that of anybody. At the age of 14, the boy was sent to the University of Edinburgh with but little money in his pocket and forced to practice the most rigid economy. He did not make a distinguished mark at college, nor did he cultivate many friendships. He was reserved, shy, awkward, and proud. After leaving college, he became a school teacher with no aptness and much disdain for his calling. It was then that he formed the acquaintance of Edward Irving, which ripened into the warmest friendship of his life. He was much indebted to this celebrated preacher for the intellectual impulse received from him. Irving was at the head of a school at Kirkcaldy, and Carlyle became his assistant. Both these young men were ambitious and aspired to preeminence. Like Napoleon at the military school of Brienne, they would not have been contented with anything less, because they were conscious of their gifts, and both attained their end. Irving became the greatest preacher of his day, and Carlyle the greatest writer, but Carlyle had the most self-sustained greatness. Irving was led by the demon of popularity into extravagances of utterance which destroyed his influence. Carlyle, on the other hand, never courted popularity, but becoming bitter and cynical in the rugged road he climbed to fame, he too lost many of his admirers. In ceasing to be a country schoolmaster, Carlyle did not abandon teaching. He removed to Edinburgh for the study of divinity and supported himself by giving lessons. He had been destined by his parents to be a minister of the Kirk of Scotland, but at the age of 23 he entered upon a severe self-examination to decide whether he honestly believed and could preach its doctrines. Weeks of intense struggle freed him from the intellectual bonds of the Kirk, but fastened upon him the chronic disorder of his stomach which embittered his life, and in later years distorted his vision of the world about him. 
At the recommendation of his friend Irving, then a preacher at Hatton Gardens, Carlyle now became private tutor to the son of Mr. Charles Buller, an Anglo-Indian merchant, on a salary of two hundred pounds. And the tutor had the satisfaction of seeing his pupil's political advancement as a member of the House of Commons and one of the most promising men in England. About this time, Carlyle, who had been industriously studying German and French, published a translation of Legendre's Elements of Geometry, and in 1824 brought out a Life of Schiller, a work that he never thought much of, but which was a very respectable performance. In fact, he never thought much of any of his works. They were always behind his ideal. He wrote slowly and took great pains to be accurate, and in this respect he reminds us of George Eliot. Carlyle had no faith in rapid writing of any sort, any more than Daniel Webster had in extempore speaking. After he had become a master of composition, it took him thirteen years of steady work to write Frederick the Great. About the same length of time it took Macaulay to write the history of fifteen years of England's life, whereas Gibbon wrote the whole of his voluminous and exhaustive history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in twenty years. Schiller being finished, Carlyle was now launched upon his life work as a writer of books. He translated Goethe's Wilhelm Meister, for which he received 180 pounds. I do not see the transcendent excellence of this novel except in its original and forcible criticism and its undercurrent of philosophy, but it is nevertheless famous. These two works gave Carlyle some literary reputation among scholars, but not much fame. Although Carlyle was thus fairly embarked on a literary career, the trade of literature he always regarded as a poor one, and never encouraged a young man to pursue it as a profession unless forced into it by his own irresistible impulses. Its nobility he ranked very high, but not its remunerativeness. He regarded it as a luxury for the rich and leisurely, but a very thorny and discouraging path for a poor man. How few have ever got a living by it unless allied with other callings? as a managing clerk or professor or lecturer or editor. The finest productions of Emerson were originally delivered as lectures. Novelists and dramatists, I think, are the only class who, without doing anything else, have earned a comfortable support by their writings. Historians have, with very few exceptions, been independent in their circumstances. In the year 1826, at the age of 31, Carlyle married Jane Welsh, the only child of a deceased physician of Haddington, who had some little property in expectancy from the profits of a farm in the moorlands of Scotland. She was beautiful, intellectual, and nervously intense. She had been a pupil of Edward Irving, who had introduced his friend Carlyle to her. On the whole, it was a fortunate marriage for Carlyle, although it would have been impossible for him to have or to give happiness in constant and intimate companionship with any woman. He was very fond of his wife, but in an undemonstrative sort of way except in his letters to her, which are genuine love letters, tender and considerate. As in the case of most superior women, clouds at times gathered over her, which her husband did not or could not dissipate. But she was very proud of him and faithful to him, and careful of his interest and fame. Nor is there evidence from her letters, or from the late biography which Frauda has written, that she was, on the whole, unhappy. She was very frank, very sharp with her tongue, and sometimes did not spare her husband. She had a good deal to put up with from his irritable temper, but she also was irritable, nervous, and sickly, although in her loyalty she rarely complained, while she had many privations to endure. For Carlyle, until he was nearly fifty, was a poor man. During the first two years of their residence in London, they were obliged to live on one hundred pounds a year. He was never in even moderately easy circumstances until after his Oliver Cromwell was published. After his marriage, Carlyle lived 18 months near Edinburgh, but there was no opening for him in the exclusive society there. His merits were not then recognized as a man of genius in that cultivated capital, as it preeminently was at that time. But he made the acquaintance of Geoffrey, who acknowledged his merit, admired his wife, and continued to be as good a friend as that worldly but accomplished man could be to one so far beneath him in social rank. The next seven years of Carlyle's life were spent at the Scotch moorland farm of Craigenputtock, belonging to his wife's mother, which must have contributed to his support. How any brilliant woman, fond of society as Mrs. Carlyle was, could have lived contentedly in that dreary solitude, fifteen miles from any visiting neighbor or town, is a mystery. She had been delicately reared, and the hard life wore upon her health. 
Yet it was here that the young couple established themselves, and here that some of the young author's best works were written, as the Miscellanies and Sartor Resartus. From here it was that he sent forth those magnificent articles on Hein, Goethe, Novalis, Voltaire, Burns, and Johnson, which published in the Edinburgh and other reviews, attracted the attention of the reading world and excited boundless admiration among students. The earlier of these remarkable productions, like those on Burns and Jean-Paul Richter, were free from those eccentricities of style which Carlyle persisted in retaining with amazing pertinacity as he advanced in life, except again in his letters to his wife, which are models of clear writing. The essay on German literature appeared in the same year, 1827, a longer and more valuable article, a blended defense and eulogium of a terra incognita, somewhat similar in spirit to that of Madame de Stahl's revelations twenty years before, and in which the writer shows great admiration of German poetry and criticism. Perhaps no Englishman, with the possible exceptions of Julius Hare and Coleridge, the latter then a broken-down old man, had at that time so profound an acquaintance as Carlyle with German literature, which was his food and life during the seven years' retirement on his moorland farm. This essay also was comparatively free from the involved, grotesque, but vivid style of his later works, and it was religious in its tone. It is mournful, writes he, to see so many noble, tender, and aspiring minds deserted of that light which once guided all such, mourning in the darkness because there is no home for the soul, or, what is worse, pitching tents among the ashes and kindling weak earthly lamps which we are to take for stars. But this darkness is very transitory. These ashes are the soil of future herbage and richer harvests. Religion dwells in the soul of man, and is as eternal as the being of man. In this extract, we see the optimism which runs through Carlyle's earlier writings. The faith in creation, which is to succeed destruction, the immortal hopes which sustain the soul. He believed in the God of Abraham, and was as far from being a scoffer as the heavens are higher than the earth. He had renounced historical Christianity, but he adhered to its essential spirit. The next article which Carlyle published seems to have been on Werner, followed the same year, 1828, by one on Goethe's Helena, a continuation of his Faust. This transcendent work of German art, which should be studied rather than read, is commented on by the reviewer with boundless admiration. If there was one human being whom Carlyle worshipped, it was the dictator of German literature, who reigned at Weimar as Voltaire had reigned at Ferney. If he was not the first to introduce the writings of Goethe into England, he was the great German's warmest admirer. If Goethe had faults, they were to Carlyle the faults of a god, and he exalted him as the greatest light of modern times, a new force in the world, a new fire in the soul, who inaugurated a new era in literature which went to the heart of cultivated Europe, weary of the doubts and denials that Voltaire had made fashionable. It seemed to Carlyle that Goethe entered into the sorrows, the solemn questionings and affirmations of the soul, seeking emancipation from dogmas and denials alike, and in the spirit of Plato, resting on the certitudes of a higher life, calm, self-poised, many-sided, having subdued passion as he had outgrown Kant, full of benignity, free from sarcasm, a man of mighty and deep experiences with knowledge of himself, of the world, and the whole realm of literature, a great artist as well as a great genius, seated on the throne of letters, not to scatter thunderbolts, but to instruct the present and future generations. The next great essay which Carlyle published, this time in the Edinburgh Review, was on Burns, a hackneyed subject, yet treated with masterly ability. This article, in some respects his best, entirely free from mannerisms and affectation of style, is just in its criticism, glowing with eloquence, and full of sympathy with the infirmities of a great poet, showing a remarkable insight into what is noblest and truest. This essay is likely to live for style alone, aside from its various other merits. It is complete, exhaustive, brilliant, such as only a Scotchman could have written who was familiar with the laborious lives of the peasantry, living in the realm of art and truth, careless of outward circumstances and trappings, and exalting only what is immortal and lofty. While Carlyle sees in Goethe the impersonation of human wisdom, in every aspect a success, outwardly and inwardly, serene and potent as an Olympian deity, he sees in Burns a highly gifted genius also, but yet a wreck and a failure, a man broken down by the force of that degrading habit which unfortunately and peculiarly 
and even mysteriously, robs a man of all dignity, all honor, and all sense of shame. Amid the misfortunes, the mistakes, and the degradations of the born poet, whom he alike admires and pities and mildly blames, he sees also the noble elements of the poet's gifted soul and loves him, especially for his sincerity, which next to labor he uniformly praises. It was the truthfulness he saw in Burns which constrained Carlyle's affection, the poet's sympathy and humanity, speaking out of his heart in unconscious earnestness and plaintive melody sad and sorrowful of course since his life was an unsuccessful battle with himself but free of egotism and full of a love which no misery could crush so unlike that other greatest poet of our century whose exemplar was satan the hero of his poetry and the model of his life in this most beautiful and finished essay carlyle paints the man in his true colors sinning and sinned against courageous while yielding poor but proud scornful yet affectionate singing in matchless lyrics the sentiments of the people from whom he sprung and among whom he died, which lyrics, though but fragments indeed, are precious and imperishable. In the same year appeared the life of Hain, the great German scholar, pushing his way from the depths of poverty and obscurity, by force of patient industry and genius, to a proud position and a national fame. Let no unfriended son of genius despair, exclaims Carlyle. If he have the will, the power will not be denied him. Like the acorn, carelessly cast abroad in the wilderness, yet it rises to be an oak. On the wild soil it nourishes itself. It defies the tempest and lives for a thousand years. The whole outward life of Carlyle himself, like that of Hain, was an example of heroism among difficulties and hope amid the storms. The next noticeable article which Carlyle published was on Voltaire and appeared in the Quarterly Review in 1829. It would appear that he hoped to find in this great oracle and guide of the 18th century something to admire and praise commensurate with his great fame, but vainly. Voltaire, though fortunate beyond example in literary history, versatile, laborious, brilliant in style, poet, satirist, historian, and essayist, seemed to Carlyle to be superficial, irreligious, and egotistical. The critic ascribes his power to ridicule, a Lucian, who destroyed but did not reconstruct, worldly, material, skeptical, defiant, utterly lacking that earnestness, without which nothing permanently great can be effected. Carlyle says, Voltaire read history not with the eye of a devout seer or even critic, but through a pair of mere anti-Catholic spectacles. It is not a mighty drama, enacted on the theater of infinitude, with suns for lamps and eternity as a background, whose author is God and whose purport leads to the throne of God, but a poor, wearisome debating club dispute spun through ten centuries between the Encyclopedia and the Sarbonne. Carlyle's essays for the next two years, chiefly on German literature, which he admired and sought to introduce to his countrymen, were published in various reviews. I could only allude to one on Richter, whose whimsicality of style he unconsciously copied, and whose original ideas he made his own. In this essay, Carlyle introduced to the English people a great German, but a grotesque, whose writings will probably never be read much out of Germany, excellent as they are, on account of the jarring combination of parentheses, dashes, hyphens, figures without limit, one tissue of metaphors and similes interlaced with epigrammatic bursts and sardonic turns. A heterogeneous, unparalleled imbroglio of perplexity and extravagance. There was another on Schiller, not an idol to Carlyle as Goethe was, yet a great poet and a true man with deep insight and intense earnestness. His works, said Carlyle, in the memory of what he was, will arise afar off, like a towering landmark in the solitude of the past, when distance shall have dwarfed into invisibility many lesser people that once encompassed him, and hid them forever from the near beholder. Thus far, Carlyle had confined himself to biography and essays on German literature, in which his extraordinary insight is seen, but now he enters another field and writes a strictly original essay called Characteristics, published in the Edinburgh Review in the prolific year of 1831, in which essay we see the germs of his philosophy. The article is hard to read and is disfigured by obscurities which leave a doubt on the mind of the reader as to whether the author understood the subject about which he was writing. For Carlyle was not a philosopher, but a painter and prose poet. 
there is no stream of logic running consistently through his writings. In characteristics, he seems to have had merely glimpses of great truths which he could not clearly express, and which won him the reputation of being a German transcendentalist. Its leading idea is the commonplace one of the progress of society, which no sane and Christian man has ever seriously questioned. Not an uninterrupted progress, but a general advance brought about by Christian ideas. Any other view of progress is dreary and discouraging, nor is this inconsistent with great catastrophes and national backslidings, with the fall of empires and French revolutions. End of section 10. Section 11 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Thomas Carlyle, Part 2. We note at this time in Carlyle's writings, on the whole, a cheerful view of human life in spite of sorrows, hardships, and disappointments, which are made by divine providence to act as healthy discipline. We see nothing of the angry pessimism of his later writings. Those years at Craig and Puttick were healthy and wholesome. He labored in hope and had great intellectual and artistic enjoyment, which reconciled him to solitude, the chief evil with which he had to contend, after dyspepsia. His habits were frugal, but poverty did not stare him in the face, since he had the income of the farm. It does not appear that the deep gloom which subsequently came over his soul oppressed him in his moorland retreat. He did not sympathize with any religion of denials, but felt that out of the jargon of false and pretentious philosophies would come at last a positive belief which would once more enthrone God in the world. After writing another characteristic article on biography, he furnished for Fraser's magazine one of the finest biographical portraits ever painted, that of Dr. Johnson, in which that cyclopean worker stands out, with even more distinctness than in Boswell's life, as one of the most honest, earnest, patient laborers in the whole field of literature. Carlyle makes us almost love the man, in spite of his awkwardness, dogmatism, and petulance. Johnson, in his day, was an acknowledged dictator on all literary questions, surrounded by admirers of the highest gifts, who did homage to his learning. A man of more striking individuality than any other celebrity in England, and a man of intense religious convictions in an age of religious indifference. We now wonder why this struggling, poorly paid, and disagreeable man of letters should have had such an ascendancy over men superior to himself in learning, genius, and culture, as Burke and Gibbon doubtless were. Even Goldsmith, whom he snubbed and loved, is now more popular than he. It was the heroism of his character which Carlyle so much admired and so vividly described, contending with so many difficulties, yet surmounting them all by his persistent industry and noble aspirations never losing faith in himself or his maker, never servilely bowing down to rank and wealth, as others did, and maintaining his self-respect in whatever condition he was placed. In this delightful biography, we are made to see the superiority of character to genius and the dignity of labor when idleness was the coveted desire of most fortunate men, as well as the almost universal vice of the magnates of the land. Labor, to the mind of Johnson as well as to that of Carlyle, is not only honorable, but is a necessity which nature imposes as the condition of happiness and usefulness. Nor does Carlyle sneer at the wedded life of Johnson, made up of drizzle and dry weather, but reverences his fidelity to his best friend, uninteresting as she was to the world, and his plaintive and touching grief when she passed away. Carlyle, in this essay, exalts a life of letters, however poorly paid, which Pope, in his Dunciad, did so much to depreciate, showing how it contributes to the elevation of a nation and to those lofty pleasures which no wealth can purchase. But it is the moral dignity of Johnson which the essay makes to shine most conspicuously in his character, supported as he was by the truths of religion, in which, under all circumstances, he proudly glories, and without which he must have made shipwreck of himself amid so many discouragements, maladies, and embarrassments for his greatest labors were made with poverty, distress, and obscurity for his companions, until, at last, victorious over every external evil and vile temptation, he emerged into the realm of peace and light, and became an oracle and a sage wherever he chose to go. 
Johnson was the greatest master of conversation in his day, whose detached sayings are still quoted more often than his most elaborate periods. I apprehend that there was a great contrast between Johnson's writings and his conversation. While the former are Ciceronian, his talk was epigrammatic, terse, and direct, and its charm and power were in his pointed and vehement Saxon style. Had he talked as he wrote, he would have been wearisome and pedantic. Still, like Coleridge and Robert Hall, he preached rather than conversed, thinking what he himself should say rather than paying attention to what others said, except to combat and rebuke them. A discourser, as Macaulay was, not one to suggest interchange of ideas, as Addison did. But neither power of conversation nor learning would have made Johnson a literary dictator. His power was in the force of his character, his earnestness and sincerity, even more than in his genius. I will not dwell on the other review articles which Carlyle wrote in his isolated retreat, since published as miscellanies, on which his fame in no small degree rests, even as the essays of Macaulay may be read when his more elaborate history will lie neglected on the shelves of libraries. Carlyle put his soul into these miscellanies, and the labor and enjoyment of writing made him partially forget his ailments. I look upon those years at Craig and Puddock as the brightest and healthiest of his life, removed as he was from the sight of levities and follies which tormented his soul and irritated his temper. Carlyle contrived to save about 200 pounds from his literary earnings, so frugal was his life and so free from temptations. His recreation was in wandering on foot or horseback over the silent moors and unending hills, watered by nameless rills and shadowed by mists and vapors. His life was solitary, but not more so than that of Moses amid the deserts of Midian, isolation indeed, but in which the highest wisdom is matured. Into this retreat Emerson penetrated a young man with boundless enthusiasm for his teacher, for Carlyle was a teacher to him as to hundreds of others in this country. Carlyle never had a truer and better friend than Emerson, who opened to him the great reward of recognition in distant America, while yet his own land refused to take knowledge of him. And this friendship continued to the end, an honor to both, for Carlyle never saw in Emerson's writings the genius and wisdom which his American friend admired in the Scottish sage. Nor were their opinions so harmonious as some suppose. Emerson despised Calvinism and had no definite opinions on any theological subject. Carlyle was a Calvinist without the theology of Calvinism, if that be possible. He did not, indeed, believe in historical Christianity, but he had the profoundest convictions of an overruling God, reigning in justice and making the wrath of man to praise him. Carlyle, too, despised everything visionary and indefinite, and had more respect for what is brought about by revolution than by evolution. But of all things, he held in profoundest abhorrence the dreary theories of materialists and political economists. It was the spirit and not the body which stood out in his eyes as of most importance. It was the manly virtues which he reverenced in a man, not his clothes and surroundings. And it was on this lofty spiritual plane that Carlyle and Emerson stood in complete harmony together. I cannot quit this part of Carlyle's life without mention of what I conceive to be his most original and remarkable production, Sartor Resartus, The Stitcher Restitched, or The Tailor Done Over, the title of an old Scotch song. It is a quaintly conceived reproduction of the work of an imaginary German professor on the philosophy of clothes, under which the external figure he includes all institutions, customs, beliefs, in which humanity has draped itself, as distinguished from the inner reality of man himself. The beginning of all wisdom, he says, is to look fixedly on clothes, or even with armed eyesight, till they become transparent. And thus, in grotesque fashion, with amazing vigor, he ranges the universe in search of the real. In one of his letters to Emerson, Carlyle, discussing a project of lecturing in America, takes on his sartorial professor's name and writes, Could any one but appoint me lecturing professor of Tufelstrock's science? Things in general. This work was written in his remote solitude, yet not published for years after it was finished, and for the best of reasons, because with all his literary repute, Carlyle could not find a publisher. The Sartor was not appreciated, and Carlyle, knowing its value, locked it up in his drawer and waited for his time. The Sartor Resartus is a sort of prose poem, written with a heart's blood, vivid as fire in a dark night, 
a Dantean production, a revelation probably of the author's own struggles and experiences from the dark gulf of the everlasting nay to the clear and serene heights of the everlasting yea. To me, the book is full of consolation and encouragement, a battle of the spirits with infernal doubts, a victory over despair, over all external evils and all spiritual foes. It is also a bold and grotesque but scorching sarcasm of the conventionalities and hypocrisies of society, and a savage thrust at those quackeries which seem to reign in this world in spite of their falsity and shallowness. It is not, I grant, easy to read. It is full of conceits and affectations of style, a puzzle to some, a rebuke to others. Every page of this unique collection of confessions and meditations, of passionate, invective, and solemn reflection, is stamped with the seal of genius, and yet was the last of Carlyle's writings to be appreciated. I believe that this is the ordinary fate of truly original works, those that are destined to live the longest, especially if they burn no incense to the idols of prevailing worship, and be characterized by a style which, to say the least, is extraordinary. Flashy, brilliant, witty, yet superficial pictures of external life which everybody has seen and knows are the soonest to find admirers. But a revelation of what is not seen, this is the work of seers and prophets whose ordinary destiny has been anything other than to wear soft raiment and sit in king's palaces. The Sartor was at last in 1833 to 1834 printed in Fraser's magazine, meeting no appreciation in England, but very enthusiastically received by Emerson, Channing, Ripley, and a group of advanced thinkers in New England, through whose efforts it was published here in book form. And so, in spite of timid London publishers, it drifted back to London and a slow-growing fame. In our time, 60 years later, it sells by scores of thousands annually, in cheap and in luxurious editions throughout the English-speaking world. In respect of early recognition and popularity, Carlyle differs from his great contemporary Macaulay, who was so immediately and so magnificently rewarded, and yet received no more than his due as the finest prose writer of his day. Macaulay's essays are generally word pictures of remarkable men and remarkable events, but of men of action rather than of quiet meditation. His heroes are such men as Clive and Hastings and Pitt, not such men as Pascal or Augustine or Leibniz or Goethe. But Carlyle in his heroes paints the struggling soul in its deepest aspirations, and the truths evolved by profound meditations. These are not such as gain instant popular acceptance, yet they are the longer lived. The time came at last for Carlyle to leave his retirement among moors and hills, and in 1831 he directed his steps to London, spending the winter with his wife in the great center of English life and thought, and being well received, so that in 1834 he removed permanently to the metropolis. But he was scarcely less buried at his modest house in Chelsea than he had been on his farm, for he came to London with only two hundred pounds and was obliged to practice the most rigid economy. For two years he labored in his London workshop without earning a shilling and with a limited acquaintance. Not yet was his society sought by the great world which he mocked and despised. Fortunately, he had the genial and agreeable Lee Hunt for a neighbor and Edward Irving for his friend. He was known to the critics by his writings, but his circle of personal friends was small. He was more or less intimate with John Stuart Mill, Charles Austin, Sir William Molesworth, and the advanced section of the philosophical radicals, the very class of men from whom he afterwards was most estranged. None of these men forwarded his fortunes, but they lent him books and helped him at the libraries, for no carpenter can work without tools. The work to which Carlyle now devoted himself was a history of the French Revolution, the principal characters of which he had already studied and written about. It was a subject adapted to his genius for dramatic writing and for the presentation of his views as to retribution. His whole theology, according to Fraude, was underlaid by the belief in punishment for sin, which was impressed upon his mind by his God-fearing parents and was one of his firmest convictions. The French were, to his mind, the greatest sinners among Christian nations, and therefore were to reap a fearful penalty. To paint in a new and impressive form the inevitable calamities attendant on violated law and justice was the aspiration of Carlyle. He had money enough to last him with economy for two years. In this time he hoped to complete the work. The possibility was due to the intelligent thrift of his wife. 
Commenting on one of her letters describing their snug little house, he writes, From birth upwards she had lived in opulence, and now, for my sake, had become poor, so nobly poor. Truly her pretty little brag, in this letter, was well founded. No such house for beautiful thrift, quiet, spontaneous, nay, as it were, unconscious, minimum of money, reconciled to human comfort and human dignity, have I anywhere looked upon. He devoted himself to his task with intense interest and was completely preoccupied. In the winter of 1835, after a year of general study, collection of material and writing, and at last, by dint of continual endeavor for many weary weeks, the first volume was completed and submitted to his friend Mill. The valuable manuscript was accidentally and ignorantly destroyed by a servant, and Mill was in despair. Carlyle bore the loss like a hero. He did not chide or repine. If his spirit sunk within him, if his spirit sunk within him, it was when he was alone in his library or in the society of his sympathizing wife. He generously writes to Emerson, I could not complain, or the poor man would have shot himself. We had to gather ourselves together and show a smooth front to it, which happily, though difficult, was not impossible to do. I began again at the beginning, such a wretched, paralyzing torpedo of a task as my hand never found to do. Mill made all the reparation possible. He gave his friend 200 pounds, but Carlyle would only accept 100 pounds. Few men could have rewritten with any heart that first volume. It would be almost impossible to revive sufficient interest. The precious inspiration would have been wanting. Yet Carlyle manfully accomplished his task, and I am inclined to think that the second writing was better than the first, that he probably left out what was unessential and made a more condensed narrative, a more complete picture, for his memory was singularly retentive. I do not believe that any man could do his best at the first heat. See how the great poets revise and rewrite. Brougham rewrote his celebrated peroration on the trial of Queen Caroline 17 times. Carlyle had to rewrite his book, but his materials remained. His great pictures were all in his mind. In this second writing, there may have been less emotion, less fire in his descriptions, but there was fire enough, for his vivacity was excessive. Even his work could be pruned, not by others, but by himself. The household at Chelsea was never closer drawn together than in those times of trial. Carlyle lost time and spirits, but he could afford the loss. The entire work was delayed, but was done at last. The final sentence of Volume 3 was written at 10 o'clock on a damp evening, January 14, 1837. This great work the most ambitious and famous of all Carlyle's writings, and in many respects his best, was not received by the public with the enthusiasm it ought to have awakened. It was not appreciated by the people at large. Ordinary readers were not enraptured by the Iliad swiftness and vividness of the narrative. Its sustained passion, the flow of poetry, the touches of grandeur and tenderness, and the masterly touches by which he made the great actors stand out in their individuality. It seemed to many to be extravagant, exaggerated, at war with all the feudalities of literature. Partisans of all kinds were offended. The style was startlingly broken, almost savage in strength, vivid and distinct as lightning. Doubtless the man himself had grown away from the quieter moods of his earlier essays. Frauda quotes this from Carlyle's journal. The poor people seem to think a style can be put off or on, not like a skin, but like a coat. Is not a skin verily a product and a close kinfellow of all that lies underneath it, exact type of the nature of the beast, not to be plucked off without flaying and death? The public is an old woman. Let her maunder and mumble. But the extraordinary merits of the book made a great impression on the cultivated intellects of England. Such men as Geoffrey, Macaulay, Southey, Hallam, Brougham, Thackeray, Dickens, who saw and admitted that a great genius had arisen, whether they agreed with his views or not. In America, we may be proud to say, the work created general enthusiasm, and its republication through Emerson's efforts brought some money as well as larger fame to its author. Of the first monies that Emerson sent Carlyle as fruits of this adventure, the dyspeptic Scotchman wrote that he was half resolved to buy myself a sharp little nag with twenty of these transatlantic pounds and ride him till the other thirty be eaten. I will call the creature Yankee, my kind friends. And Yankee was duly bought and ridden. 
Carlyle still remained in straitened circumstances, although his reputation was now established. In order to assist him in his great necessities, his friends got up lectures for him, which were attended by the elite of London. He gave several courses in successive years during the London season, which brought him more money than his writings at the time, gave him personal éclat, and added largely to his circle of admirers. His second course of twelve lectures brought him three hundred pounds, a year's harvest, and a large sum for lectures in England, where the literary institutions rarely paid over five pounds for a single lecture. Even in later times, the Philosophical Society of Edinburgh, which commanded the finest talent, paid only ten pounds to such men as Frauda and the Archbishop of York. But lecturing, to many men an agreeable excitement, seems to have been very unpleasant to Carlyle, even repulsive. Though the lectures brought both money and fame, he abominated the delivery of them. They broke his rest, destroyed his peace of mind, and depressed his spirits. Nothing but direst necessity reconciled him to the disagreeable task. He never took any satisfaction or pride in his success in this field, nor was his success probably legitimate. People went to see him as a new literary lion, to hear him roar, not to be edified. He had no peculiar qualification for public speaking, and he affected to despise it. Very few English men of letters have had this gift. Indeed, popular eloquence is at a discount among the cultivated classes in England. They prefer to read at their leisure. Popular eloquence best thrives in democracies, as in that of ancient Athens. Aristocrats disdain it and fear it. In their contempt for it, they even affect hesitation and stammering, not only when called upon to speak in public, but also in social converse, until the Halton style has come to be known among Americans as very English. In absolute monarchies, eloquence is rare except in the pulpit or at the bar. Cicero would have had no field, and would not probably have been endured, in the reign of Nero. Yet Basset and Bartolo were the delights of Louis the Fourteenth. What would that monarch have said to the speeches of Mirabeau? After the publication in 1837 of the French Revolution, that roaring conflagration of anarchies, that series of graphic pictures rather than a history or even a criticism, it was some time before Carlyle could settle down upon another great work. He delivered lectures, wrote tracts and essays, gave vent to his humors, and nursed his ailments. He was now famous, a man whom everybody wished to see and know, especially Americans when they came to London, but whom he generally snubbed, as he did me, and pronounced them bores. It was at this time that he made the acquaintance of Monckton Milnes, afterward Lord Houghton, who invited him to breakfast where he met other notabilities, among them Bunsen, the Prussian ambassador at London, Lord Mahon, the historian, and Mr. Baring, afterward Lord Ashburton, the warmest and truest of his friends, who extended to him the most generous hospitalities. Carlyle was now in what is called high society and was taking life easy, writing little, yet reading much, especially about Oliver Cromwell, whose life he thought of writing. His lectures at this period were more successful than ever, attended by great and fashionable people, and from them his chief income was derived. End of section 11. Section 12 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Thomas Carlyle, Part 3 While collecting materials for his life of Cromwell, Carlyle became deeply interested in the movements of the Chartists, composed chiefly of working men with socialistic tendencies. He was called a radical, and he did believe in a radical reform of men's lives, especially of the upper classes who showed but little sympathy for the poor. He was not satisfied with the Whigs, who believed that the reform bill would usher in a political millennium. He had more sympathy with the conservative Tories than the liberal Whigs, but his opinions were not acceptable to either of the great political parties. They alike distrusted him. Even Mill had, a year before, declined an article on the working classes for his review, the Westminster. Carlyle took it to Lockhart of the Quarterly, but Lockhart was afraid to publish it. Mill, then about to leave the Westminster, wished to insert it as a final shout 
but Carlyle declined and in 1839 expanded his article into a book called Chartism, which was rapidly sold and loudly noticed. It gave but little satisfaction, however. It offended the conservatives by exposing sores that could not be healed, while on the other hand, the radicals did not wish to be told that men were far from being equal, that in fact they were very unequal, and that society could not be advanced by debating clubs or economical theories, but only by gifted individuals as instruments of divine providence guiding mankind by their superior wisdom. These views were expanded in a new course of lectures on heroes and hero worship, and subsequently printed, the most able and suggestive of all Carlyle's lectures, delivered in the spring of 1840 with great éclat. He never appeared on the platform again. Lecturing, as we have said, was not to his taste. He preferred to earn his living by his pen, and his writings had now begun to yield a comfortable support. He received on account of them 400 pounds from America alone, thanks to the influence of his friend Emerson. Carlyle now began to weary of the distraction of London life and pined for the country. But his wife would not hear a word about it. She had had enough of the country at Craig and Puttock. Meanwhile, preparations for the life of Cromwell went on slowly, varied by his visits to his relatives in Scotland, travels on the continent, and interviews with the distinguished men. His mind at this period, 1842, was most occupied with the sad condition of the English people. Everywhere, riots, disturbances, physical suffering, and abject poverty among the masses, for the Corn Laws had not then been repealed, and to Carlyle's vision there was a most melancholy prospect ahead. Not revolution, but universal degradation, and the reign of injustice. This sad condition of the people was contrasted in his mind with what it had been centuries before, as it appeared from an old book which he happened to read, Jocelyn's Chronicles, which painted English life in the twelfth century. He fancied that the world was going on from bad to worse, and in this gloomy state of mind he wrote his Past and Present, which appeared in 1843, and created a storm of anger as well as admiration. It was a sort of protest against the political systems of economy then so popular. Lockhart said of it that he could accept none of his friend's inferences except one, that we were all wrong and were all like to be damned. Gloomy and satirical as the book was, it made a great impression on the thinkers of the day, while it did not add to the author's popularity. It seemed as if he were a prophet of wrath, an Ishmaelite whose hand was against everybody. He offended all political parties, the Tories by his radicalism, and the radicals by his scorn of their formulas, the high churchmen by his Protestantism, and the low churchmen by evident unorthodoxy. Yet all parties and sects admitted that much he said was true, while at the same time they had no sympathy with his fierce ravings. For ten years after the publication of the French Revolution, Carlyle assumed the functions of a prophet, hurling anathemas and pronouncing woes. To his mind everything was alike disjointed or false or pretentious, in view of which he uttered groans and hisses and maledictions. The very name of a society designed to ameliorate evils seemed to put him into a passion. Every reformer appeared to him to be a blind teacher of the blind. Exeter Hall, then the scene of every variety of social and religious and political discussion, was to him a veritable pandemonium. Everybody at that period of agitation and reform was giving lectures, and everybody went to hear them, and Carlyle ridiculed them all alike as peddlers of nostrums to heal diseases which were incurable. He lived in an atmosphere of disdain. The English people, said he, number some thirty millions, mostly fools. His friends expostulated with him for giving utterance to such bitter expressions and for holding such gloomy views. John Mill was mortally offended and walked no more with him. De Quincey said, you have made a new hole in your society kettle. How do you propose to mend it? Yet all this, while Carlyle had not lost faith in providence, as it might seem, but felt that God would inflict calamities on peoples for their sins. He resembled Savonarola more than he did Voltaire. What seemed to some to be mockeries were really the earnest protests of his soul against universal corruption, to be followed by downward courses in retribution. His mind was morbid from intense reflection on certain evils and from his physical ailments. He doubtless grieved and alienated his best friends by his diatribes against popular education and free institutions. He even appeared to lean to despotism and the rule of tyrants, provided only they were strong. Thus, Carlyle destroyed his influence even while he moved the mind to reflection. 
It was seen and felt that he had no sympathy with many movements designed to benefit society and that he cherished utter scorn for many active philanthropists. In his bitterness, wrath, and disdain, he became himself intolerant. In some of his wild utterances, he brought upon himself almost universal reproach, as when he said, I never thought the rights of Negroes worth much discussing, nor the rights of man in any form, a sentiment which militated against his whole philosophy. In this strange and unhappy mood of mind, the latter-day pamphlets, past and present, and other essays were written, which undermined the reverence in which he had been held. These were the blots on his great career, which may be traced to sickness and a disordered mind. In fact, Carlyle cannot be called a sound writer at any period. He contradicts himself. He is a great painter, a prose poet, a satirist, not a philosopher. Perhaps the most suggestive writer of the 19th century, often giving utterance to the grandest thoughts, yet not a safe guide at all times, since he is inconsistent and full of exaggerations. The morbid and unhealthy tone of Carlyle's mind at this period may be seen by an extract from one of his letters to Sterling. I see almost nobody. I avoid sight, rather, and study to consume my own smoke. I wish you would build me, among your buildings, some small profit chamber fifteen feet square, with a flue for smoking, sacred from all noises of dogs, cocks, and pianofortes, engaging some dumb old woman to light a fire for me daily and boil some kind of a kettle. Thus quaintly he expressed his desire for uninterrupted solitude where he could work to advantage. He was then engaged on Cromwell, and the few persons with whom he exchanged letters show how retired was his life. His friends were also few, although he could have met as many persons as pleased him. He was too much absorbed with work to be what is called a society man, but what society he did see was of the best. At last, Carlyle's task on the life of Oliver Cromwell was finished in August 1845, when he was fifty years of age. It was the greatest contribution to English history, Mr. Froude thinks, which has been made in the present century. Carlyle was the first to make Cromwell and his age intelligible to mankind. Indeed, he reversed the opinions of mankind respecting that remarkable man, which was a great accomplishment. No one doubts the genuineness of the portrait. Cromwell was almost universally supposed, fifty years ago, to be a hypocrite as well as a usurper. In Carlyle's hands, he stands out visionary, perhaps, but yet practical, sincere, earnest, God-fearing a patriot devoted to the good of his country. Carlyle rescued a great historical personage from the accumulated slanders of two centuries, and did his work so well that no hostile criticisms have modified his verdict. He has painted a picture which is immortal. The insight, the sagacity, the ability, and the statesmanship of Cromwell are impressed upon the minds of all readers. That England never had a greater or more enlightened ruler, everybody is now forced to admit and not merely a patriotic, but a Christian ruler, who regarded himself simply as the instrument of providence. People still differ as to the cause in which Cromwell embarked, and few defend the means he used to accomplish his ends. He does not stand out as a perfect man. He made mistakes and committed political crimes which can be defended only on grounds of expediency. But his private life was above reproach, and he died in the triumph of Christian faith, after having raised his country to a higher pitch of glory than had been seen since the days of Queen Elizabeth. The faults of the biographer center in confounding right with might, and this conspicuously false doctrine is the leading defect of the philosophy of Carlyle, runs through all his writings, and makes him an unsound teacher. If this doctrine be true, then all the usurpers of the world from Caesar to Napoleon can be justified. If this be true, then an irresistible imperialism becomes the best government for mankind. It is but fair to say that Carlyle himself denied this inference. Writing of Lecky's having charged him with believing in the divine right of strength, he says, With respect to that poor heresy of might being the symbol of right to a certain great and venerable author, I shall have to tell Lecky one day that quite the converse or reverse is the great and venerable author's real opinion, namely, that right is the eternal symbol of might. In fact, he probably never met with a son of Adam more contemptuous of might except when it rests on the above origin. Yet the impression of all his strongest work is the other way. Certain no other kindred doctrines may be inferentially drawn from Carlyle's defense of Cromwell, namely that a popular assembly is incapable of guiding successfully the destinies of a nation, that behind all constitutions lies an ultimate law of force, that majorities as such have no more right to rule than kings and nobles, 
that the strongest are the best and the best are the strongest, that the right to rule lies with those who are right in mind and heart, as he supposed Cromwell to be, and who can execute their convictions. Such teachings, it need not be shown, are at war with the whole progress of modern society and the enlightened opinion of mankind. The great merit of Carlyle's history is in the clearness and vividness with which he paints his hero and the exposure of the injustice with which he has been treated by historians. It is an able vindication of Cromwell's character, but the deductions drawn from his philosophy lead to absurdity and are an insult to the understanding of the world. It was about this time, on the conclusion of the Cromwell, when he was on the summit of his literary fame and the world began to shower its favors upon him, that Carlyle's days were saddened by a domestic trouble which gave him inexpressible solicitude and grief. His wife, with whom he had lived happily for so many years, was exceedingly disturbed on account of his intimate friendship with Lady Ashburton. Nothing can be more plaintive and sadly beautiful than the letters he wrote to her on the occasion of her starting off in a fit of spleen after a stormy scene to visit friends at a distance. And what is singular is that we do not find in those letters, when his soul was moved to its very depths, any of his peculiarities of style. They are remarkably simple as well as serious. Carlyle's friendship for one of the most brilliant and cultivated women of England, which the breath of scandal never for a moment assailed, was reasonable and natural and was a great comfort to him. He persisted in enjoying it, knowing that his wife disliked it. In this matter, which was a cloud upon his married life and saddened the family hearth for years, Mrs. Carlyle was doubtless exacting and unreasonable, though some men would have yielded the point for the sake of a faithful wife, or even for peace. There are those who think that Carlyle was selfish in keeping up an intercourse which was hateful to his wife, but the Ashburtons were the best friends that Carlyle ever had after he became famous, and in their various country seats he enjoyed a hospitality rarely extended to poor literary men. There he met an enjoyable and helpful intercourse when he could not have seen them in his own house, some of the most distinguished men of the day men of rank and influence, as well as those of literary fame. Until this intimacy with the Ashburtons, no domestic disturbances of note had taken place in the Carlyle household. The wife may occasionally have been sad and lonely when her husband was preoccupied with his studies, but this she ought to have anticipated in marrying a literary man whose only support was from his pen. Carlyle, too, was an inveterate smoker, and she detested tobacco, so that he did not spend as much time in the parlor as he did in his library, where he could smoke to his heart's content. On the whole, however, their letters show genuine mutual affection and as much connubial happiness as is common to most men and women, with far more of intimate intellectual and spiritual congeniality. Carlyle certainly, in all his letters, ever speaks of his wife with admiration and gratitude. He regarded her as not only the most talented woman that he had ever known, but as the one without whom he was miserable. They were the best of comrades and companions from first to last, when at home together. For a considerable period after the publication of The Life of Cromwell, Carlyle was apparently idle. He wrote for several years nothing of note except his Latter-day Pamphlets, 1850, and A Life of His Friend John Sterling, 1851, to whom he was tenderly attached. It would seem that he was now in easy circumstances, although he retained to the end his economical habits. He amused himself with traveling and with frequent visits to distinguished people in the country. If not a society man, he was much sought. He dined often at the tables of the great and personally knew almost every man of note in London. He sturdily took his place among distinguished men, the intellectual peer of the greatest. He often met Macaulay, but was not intimate with him. I doubt if they even exchanged visits. The reason for this may have been that they were not congenial to each other in anything, and that the social position of Macaulay was immeasurably higher than Carlyle's. It would be hard to say which was the greater man. It was not until 1852 or 1853, when Carlyle was 58, that he seriously set himself to write his life of Friedrich II, his last great work, on which he perseveringly labored for 13 years. It is an exhaustive history of the Prussian hero, and is regarded in Germany as the standard work on that great monarch in general. The first volume came out in 1858 and the last in 1865. It is a marvel of industry and accuracy, the most elaborate of all his works, but probably the least read because of its enormous length and scholastic pedantries. It might be said to bear the same relation to his French Revolution that Romola does to Adam Bede. In this book, Carlyle made no new revelations, as he did in his life of Cromwell. 
he did not change essentially the opinion of mankind. Friedrich the Great, in his hands, still stands out as an unscrupulous public enemy, a robber, and a tyrant. His crimes are only partially redeemed by his heroism, especially when Europe was in arms against him. There is the same defect in this great work that there is in the life of Cromwell, the inculcation of the doctrine that might makes right, that we may do evil that good may come, thus putting expediency above eternal justice and palliating crimes because of their success. It is difficult to account for Carlyle's decline in moral perceptions when we consider that his personal life was so far above reproach. Although the life of Friedrich is a work of transcendent industry, it did not add to Carlyle's popularity, which had been undermined by his bitter attacks on society in his various pamphlets. At this period, he was still looked up to with reverence as a great intellectual giant, but that love for him, which had been felt by those who were aroused to honest thinking by his earlier writings, had passed away. A new generation looked upon him as an embittered and surly old man. His services were not forgotten, but he was no longer a favorite, no longer an inspiring guide. His writings continued to stimulate thought, but were no longer regarded as sound. Commonplace people never did like him, probably because they never understood him. His admirers were among the young, the enthusiastic, the hopeful, the inquiring, and when their veneration passed away, there were few left to uphold his real greatness and noble character. One might suppose that Carlyle would have been unhappy to alienate so many persons, especially old admirers. In fact, I apprehend that he cared little for anybody's admiration or flattery. He lived in an atmosphere so infinitely above small and envious and detracting people that he was practically independent of human sympathies. Had he been doomed to live with commonplace persons, he might have sought to conciliate them. But he really lived in another sphere, not perhaps higher than theirs, but eternally distinct in the sphere of abstract truth. To him, most people were either babblers or bores. What did he care for their envious shafts or even for their honest disapprobation? Hence, the last days of this great man were not his best days, although he was not without honor. He was made Lord Rector of the University of Edinburgh and delivered a fine address on the occasion. And later, Disraeli, when Prime Minister, offered him knighthood with the Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath and a pension, which he declined. The author of Sartor Resartus did not care for titles. He preferred to remain simply Thomas Carlyle. While Carlyle was in the midst of honors in Edinburgh, his wife, who had long been in poor health, suddenly died April 21, 1866. This affliction was a terrible blow to Carlyle, from which he never recovered. It filled out his measure of sorrow, deep and sad, and hard to be borne. His letters after this are full of pathos and plaintive sadness. He could not get resigned to his loss, for his wife had been more and more his staff and companion as years had advanced. The queen sent her sympathy, but nothing could console him. He was then seventy-one years old, and his work was done. His remaining years were those of loneliness and sorrow and suffering. He visited friends, but they amused him not. He wrote reminiscences, but his isolation remained. He sought out charities when he himself was the object of compassion, a sad old man who could not sleep. He tried to interest himself in politics, but time hung heavy on his hands. He read much and thought more, but assumed no fresh literary work. He had enough to do to correct proof sheets of new editions of his works. His fiercest protests were now against atheism in its varied forms. In 1870, Mr. Erskine, his last Scotch friend, died. In 1873, he writes, More and more dreary, barren, base, and ugly seem to me all the aspects of this poor, diminishing quack world. Fallen openly anarchic, doomed to a death which one can wish to be speedy. Poor old man. He has survived his friends, his pleasures, his labors, almost his fame. He is sick and weary of life, which to him has become a blank. Pity it is, he could not have died when Cromwell was completed. He drags on in his forlorn life without wife or children and with only a few friends, in disease and ennui and discontent, almost alone, until he is eighty-five. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps on this petty pace from day to day, to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. 
It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. The relief came at last. It was on a cold day in February 1881 that Lecky, Frauda, and Tyndall, alone of his London friends, accompanied his mortal remains to Eckel Fetchen, where he was buried by the graves of his father and mother. He might have rested in the vaults of Westminster, but he chose to lie in a humble churchyard near where he was born. In future years, says his able and interesting biographer, Scotland will have raised a monument over his remains, but no monument is needed for one who has made an eternal memorial for himself in the hearts of all to whom truth is the dearest possession. For giving his soul to the common cause, he won for himself a wreath which will not fade, and a tomb the most honorable, not where his dust is decaying, but where his glory lives in everlasting remembrance. For of illustrious men all the earth is the sepulcher, and it is not the inscribed column in their own land which is the record of their virtues, but the unwritten memories of them in the hearts and minds of all mankind. Thomas Carlyle will always have an honorable place among the great men of his time. He was preeminently a profound thinker, a severe critic, a great word painter, a man of uncommon original gifts who aroused and instructed his generation. In the literal sense, he was neither philosopher nor poet nor statesman, but a man of genius, who cast his searching and fearless glance into all creeds, systems, and public movements, denouncing hypocrisies, shams, and lies with such power that he lost friends almost as fast as he made them, without, however, losing the respect and admiration of his literary rivals, or of the ablest and best men both in England and America. Although no believer in the scientific philosophies of our time, he was a great breaker of ground for them, having been a pioneer in the cause of honest thinking and plain speaking. His passion for truth and courage in declaring his own vision of it were potent for spiritual liberty. He stands as one of the earliest and stoutest champions of that revolt against authority in religious, intellectual, and social matters, which has chiefly marked the 19th century. End of section 12. Section 13 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Lord Macaulay, Part 1. 1800 to 1859. Artistic Historical Writing. Among the eminent men of letters of the present century, Thomas Babington Macaulay takes a very high position. In original genius, he was inferior to Carlyle, but he was greater in learning, in judgment, and especially in felicity of style. He was an historical artist of the foremost rank, the like of whom has not appeared since Voltaire, and he was, moreover, no mean poet, and might have been distinguished as such, had poetry been his highest pleasure and ambition. The same may be said of him as a political orator. Very few men in the House of Commons ever surpassed him in the power of making an eloquent speech. He was too impetuous and dogmatic to be a great debater, like Fox or Pitt or Peel or Gladstone but he might have reached a more exalted and influential position as a statesman had he confined his remarkable talents to politics. But letters were the passion of Macaulay, from his youth up, and his remarkably tenacious memory, abnormal as it seems to me, enabled him to bring his vast store of facts to support plausibly any position he chose to take. At fifty years of age he had probably read more books than any man in Europe since Gibbon and Niebuhr, he literally devoured everything he could put his hands upon without cramming for a special object, especially the Greek and Latin classics, which he read over and over again, not so much for knowledge as for the pleasure it gave him as a literary critic and a student of artistic excellence. Macaulay was of Scotch descent, like so many eminent historians, poets, critics, and statesmen who adorned the early and middle part of the 19th century. Scott, Burns, Carlyle, Jeffrey, Dundas, Playfair, Wilson, Napier, Mackintosh, Robertson, Allison. A group of geniuses who lived in Edinburgh and made its society famous, to say nothing of great divines and philosophers like Chalmers and Stuart and Hamilton. Macaulay belonged to a good family, the most distinguished members of which were clergymen, with the exception of his uncle, General Macaulay, who made a fortune in India, and his father, the celebrated merchant and philanthropist Zachary Macaulay, who did more than any other man, Wilberforce accepted, to do away with the slave trade and to abolish slavery in the West India Islands. 
Zachary Macaulay was the most modest and religious of men, and after an eventful life in Africa as governor of the colony of Sierra Leone, settled in Clapham near London with a handsome fortune. He belonged to that famous evangelical set who made Clapham famous, and whose extraordinary piety and philanthropy are commemorated by Sir James Stephen in one of his most interesting essays. They resembled in peculiarities the early Quakers and primitive Methodists, and though very narrow, were much respected for their unostentatious benevolence blended with public spirit. Macaulay was born at Rothley Temple in Leicestershire, October 25, 1800, but it was at Clapham that his boyhood was chiefly spent. His precocity startled everyone who visited his father's hospitable home. At the age of three, he would lie at full length on the carpet, eagerly reading. He was never seen without an open book in his hands, even during his walks. He cared nothing for the sports of his companions. He could neither ride nor drive nor swim nor row a boat nor play a game of tennis or football. He cared only for books of all sorts, which he seized upon with inextinguishable curiosity and stored their contents in his memory. When a boy, he had learned the Paradise Lost by heart. He did not care to go to school because it interrupted his reading. Hannah Moore, a frequent visitor at Clapham and a warm friend of the family, gazed upon him with amazement, but was too wise and conscientious to spoil him by her commendations. At eight years of age, he also had great facility in making verses, which were more than tolerable. Zachary Macaulay objected to his son being educated in one of the great schools in England, like Westminster and Harrow, and he was therefore sent to a private school kept by an evangelical divine who had been a fellow at Cambridge, a good scholar but narrow in his theological views. Indeed, Macaulay got enough of Calvinism before he went to college and was so unwisely crammed with it at home and at school that through life he had a repugnance to the evangelical doctrines of the low church, with which, much to the grief of his father, he associated Kant, always his especial abhorrence and disgust. While Macaulay venerated his father, he had little sympathy with his views and never loved him as he did his own sisters. He did his filial duty, and that was all, contributed largely to his father's support later in life, treated him with profound respect, but was never drawn to him in affectionate frankness and confidence. It cannot be disguised that Macaulay was worldly in his turn of mind, intensely practical, and ambitious of distinction as soon as he became conscious of his great powers, although in his school days he was very modest and retiring. He was not religiously inclined, nor at all spiritually minded. An omnivorous reader seldom is narrow and seldom is profound. Macaulay was no exception. He admired Pascal, but only for his exquisite style and his trenchant irony. He saw little in Augustine except his vast acquaintance with Latin authors. He carefully avoided writing on the schoolmen or Calvin or the great divines of the 17th century. Bunyan he admired for his genius and perspicuous style rather than for his sentiments. Even his famous article on Bacon is deficient in spiritual insight. It is a description of the man rather than the dissertation on his philosophy. Macaulay's greatness was intellectual rather than moral, and his mental power was that of the scholar and the rhetorical artist rather than the thinker. In his masterly ways of arraying facts, he has never been surpassed, and in this he was so skillful that it mattered little which side he took. Like Daniel Webster, he could make any side appear plausible. Doubtless in the law he might have become a great advocate had he not preferred literary composition instead. Had he lived in the times of the Grecian sophists, he might have baffled Socrates, not by his logic, but by his learning and his aptness of illustration. Macaulay entered Trinity College, Cambridge in 1818, being a healthy, robust young man of 18, after five years training in Greek and Latin, having the eldest son of Wilberforce for a school companion. Among his contemporaries and friends at Cambridge were Charles Austin, Prade, Derwent Coleridge, Hyde Villers, and Romilly, but I infer from his life by Trevelyan that his circle of intimate friends was not so large as it would have been had he been fitted for college at Westminster or Eton. Nor at this time were his pecuniary circumstances encouraging. After he had obtained his first degree, he supported himself while studying for a fellowship by taking a couple of pupils for £100 a year. Eventually, he gained a fellowship worth £300 a year, which was his main support for seven years, until he obtained a government office in London. He probably would have found it easier to get a fellowship at Oxford than at Cambridge, since mathematics were uncongenial to him, his forte being languages. He was most distinguished at college for English composition and Latin declamation. In 1819, he wrote a poem, Pompeii, which gained him the Chancellor's Medal. 
A distinction won again in 1821 by a poem on evening, while the same year gave him the Craven Scholarship for his classical attainments. He took his bachelor's degree in 1822 and was made a fellow of Trinity College. He did not obtain his fellowship, however, until his third trial, being no favorite with those who had prizes and honors to bestow, because of his neglect of science and mathematics. As a profession, Macaulay made choice of the law, being called to the bar in 1826, and at Leeds joined the Northern Circuit, of which Brougham was the leading star. But the law was not his delight. He did not like its technicalities. He spent most of his time in his chambers in literary composition or in the galleries of the House of Commons listening to the debates. He never applied himself seriously to anything which went against the grain. At court he got no briefs, but his fellowship enabled him to live by practicing economy. He also wrote occasional essays, excellent but not remarkable, for Knight's Quarterly Magazine. It was in this periodical, too, that his early poems were published, but he did not devote much time to this field of letters, although, as we have said, he might undoubtedly have succeeded in it. His poetry, if he had never written anything else, would not be considered much inferior to that of Sir Walter Scott, being full of life and action, and, like most everything else he did, winning him applause. Years later, he felt the risk of publishing his Lays of Ancient Rome, but as he knew what he could do and what he could not do, or rather what would be popular, he was not disappointed. The poems were well received, for they were eminently picturesque and vital, as well as strong, masculine, and unadorned. The rhyme and meter were also felicitous. He had no obscurities, and the spirit of his lays was patriotic and ardent, showing his love of liberty. I think his Battle of Ivory is equal to anything that Scott wrote. Yet Macaulay is not regarded by the critics as a true poet. That is, he did not write poetry because he must, like Burns and Byron. His poetry was not spontaneous. It was a manufactured article, very good of its kind, but not such as to have given him the fame which his prose writings made for him. It was not, however, until his article on Milton appeared in the Edinburgh Review in 1825 that Macaulay's great career began. Like Byron, he woke up one morning to find himself famous. Everybody read and admired an essay, the style of which was new and striking. Where did you pick up that style, wrote Geoffrey to the briefless barrister. It transcended in brilliancy anything which had yet appeared in the Edinburgh or Quarterly. Brougham became envious and treated the rising light with no magnanimity or admiration. Of course, the author of such an uncommon article as that on Milton, the praise of which was in everybody's mouth, had invitations to dinner from distinguished people, and these were most eagerly accepted. Macaulay rapidly became a social favorite, sought for his brilliant conversation, which was as remarkable for a young man of 26 as were his writings in the foremost literary journal of the world. He was not handsome and was carelessly dressed, but he had a massive head and rugged yet benevolent features which lighted up with peculiar animation when he was excited. One of the first persons of note to welcome him to her table was Lady Holland, an accomplished but eccentric and plain-spoken woman who seems to have greatly admired him. He was a frequent guest at the Holland House, where for nearly half a century the courtly and distinguished Lord Holland and his wife entertained the most eminent men and women of the time. This gratified young Macaulay's inordinate social ambition. He scarcely mentions in his letters at this time any but peers and peeresses. And yet he did not court the society of those he did not respect. He was not a parasite or a flatterer even of the great, but met them apparently on equal terms as a monarch of the mind. He was at home in any circle that was not ignorant or frivolous. He was more easy than genial, for his prejudices or intellectual pride made him unkind to persons of mediocrity. It was a bold thing to cross his path, for he came down like an avalanche on those who opposed him, not so much in anger as in contempt. I do not find that his circle of literary friends was large or intimate. He seldom alludes to Carlyle or Bulwer or Thackeray or Dickens. He has more to say of Rogers and Lord Jeffrey and other pets of aristocratic circles. Those who were conventionally favored, like Sidney Smith, or those who gave banquets to people of fashion, like Lord Lansdowne. These were the people he loved best to associate with, who listened to his rhetoric with rapt admiration, who did not pique his vanity, and who had something to give him, position and éclat. Macaulay was not a vain man, nor even egotistical, but he had a tremendous self-consciousness, which annoyed his equals in literary fame, and repelled such a giant as Brougham, who had no idea of sharing his throne with anyone, being more overbearing even than Macaulay, but more human. This new rival in the Edinburgh Review, of which for a long time Brougham had been dictator, 
was, much to Geoffrey's annoyance, not convivial. He did not drink two bottles at a sitting, but guarded his health and preserved his simple habits. Though he speaks with gusto of Lord Holland's turtle and turbot and venison and grouse, he was content when alone with a mutton chop and a few glasses of sherry, or the October ale of Cambridge, which was a part of his perquisites as fellow. He was very exclusive, in view of the fact that he was a poor man without aristocratic antecedents or many powerful friends. Outside the class of rank and fashion, his friends seem to have been leading politicians of the liberal school, the staunch Whigs, who passed the reform bill to whom he was true. To his credit, his happiest hours were spent with his sisters in the quiet seclusion of his father's modest home. All his best letters were to them, and in these he detailed his intercourse with the great and the splendor of their banquets and balls. Macaulay's rise, after he had written his famous article on Milton, was rapid. The article itself, striking as it is, must be confessed to be disappointing insofar as it attempted to criticize the Paradise Lost and Milton's other poems. Macaulay's genius was historical, not critical, and the essay is notable rather for its review of the times of Charles I and Archbishop Laud, of the Puritans and the Royalists, than for its literary flavor, except as a brilliant piece of composition. It was, however, the picturesque style of the new writer which was the chief attraction, and the fact that the essay came from so young a man. Macaulay followed the Milton essay with others on Machiavelli, Dryden, Hallam's constitutional history, and on history in general, which displayed to great advantage his unusual learning, his keen historic instinct, and his splendor of style. He became the most popular contributor to the Edinburgh Review, which was beginning to be dull and heavy, and this kept him before the eyes of politicians and professional men. Macaulay's ambition was now divided between literature and politics. His first appearance as a public speaker was at an annual anti-slavery convention in London in 1826, when he made a marked impression. He eagerly embraced the offer of a seat in the House of Commons, which was secured to him in 1830, and as soon as he entered Parliament, he began to make speeches, which were carefully composed and probably committed to memory. At a single bound, he became one of the leading orators of that renowned assembly, some of his orations were masterpieces of argument and rhetoric in favor of reform, and of all liberal movements in philanthropy and education. In the opinion of eminent statesmen, he was the most rising member of the House, and sure to become a leader among the Whigs. But he was poor, having only about five hundred pounds a year, the proceeds of his fellowship and his literary productions, to support his dignity as a legislator, and meet the cause of society. So that in 1833 he was rewarded with an office in the Board of Control, which regulated the affairs of India. This doubled his income and made him independent. But he wanted an office in which he could lay up money for future contingencies. Therefore, in 1834, he gladly resigned his seat in Parliament and accepted the situation of a member of the Supreme Council of India on a salary of £10,000 a year, £7,000 of which he continued to save yearly, so that at the end of four years, when he returned to England, he had become a rich man, or at least independent, with leisure to do whatever he pleased. In India, as chairman of the Board of Education, as legal advisor of the council, and in drafting a code of penal laws for that part of the empire, he was very useful. Although, as a matter of fact, the new code was too theoretically fine to be practical and was never put in force. His personal good sense was equal to his industry and his talents, and he preserved his health by strict habits of temperance. Even in that tropical country, he presented a strong contrast to the sallow, bilious officials with whom he was surrounded, and in due time returned to England in perfect health, one of the most robust of men, capable of indefinite work, which never seemed to weary him. But in Calcutta, as in London, he employed his leisure hours in writing for the Edinburgh Review, and gave an immense impulse to its sale, for which he was amply rewarded. Brougham complained to Geoffrey that his essays took up too much space in the review, but the politic editor knew what was for its interest in popularity. Macaulay's long articles of sometimes over a hundred pages were received without a murmur, and every article he wrote added to his fame, since he always did his best. His essays in 1830 on Southey and Montgomery, and one in 1831 on Croker's edition of Boswell's Life of Johnson, were fierce, scathing onslaughts, even cruel and crushing revealing Macaulay's tremendous powers of invective and remorseless criticism, but reflecting little credit on his disposition or his judgment. His Hampton, 1831, and his Burley, 1832, remain among his finest and most inspiring historical paintings. His first essay on Lord Chatham, 1834, is a notable piece of characterization. The one on Sir James Mackintosh, 1835, is a most acute and brilliant historical criticism. 
The one on Lord Bacon, 1837, is striking and has become famous, but shows Macaulay's deficiency on philosophic thought, besides being sophistical in spirit. And the article on Sir William Temple, 1837, really a history of England during the reign of William III, is thoroughly fine. Macaulay's residence in India, so far as political ambition was concerned, may have been a mistake. It withdrew him from an arena in which he could have risen to great distinction and influence as a parliamentary orator. He might have been a second fox, whom he resembled in the impetuosity of his rhetoric, if he had also possessed Fox's talents as a debater. Yet he was not a born leader of men. As a parliamentary orator, he was simply a speechmaker, like the Unitarian minister Fox, or that still abler man, the Quaker Bright, both of whom were great rhetoricians. It is probable that he himself understood his true sphere, which was that of a literary man, an historical critic appealing to intelligent people rather than to learned pedants in the universities. His service in India enabled him to write for the remainder of his life with an untrammeled pen and to live in comfort and ease, enjoying the otium cum dignitate to which he attached supreme importance. So different from Carlyle, who toiled in poverty at Chelsea to declare truth for truth's sake, grumbling yet lofty in his meditations, the depth of which Macaulay was incapable of appreciating. It is then, as a man of letters rather than as a politician, that our author merits his exalted fame. Respectable as a member of the House of Commons or as a jurist in India in compiling a code of laws, yet neither as a statesman nor as a jurist was he in his right place. The leaders of his party may have admired and praised his oratory, but they wanted something more practical than orations. They wanted the control of men. And so, too, the government demanded a code which would exact the esteem of lawyers and meet the wants of India, rather than a composition which would read well. But as an historical critic and a luminous writer, Macaulay had no superior, a fact which no one knew better than himself. In 1838, on his return from India, where he had regarded himself as an honorable exile, Macaulay had accumulated a fortune of 30,000 pounds, to him more than a competency. This added to the legacy of 10,000 pounds which he had received from his uncle General Macaulay, secured to him independence and leisure to pursue his literary work, which was paramount to every other consideration. If both from pleasure and ambition there ever was a man devoted heart and soul and body to a literary career, it was Macaulay. Nor would he now accept any political office which seriously interfered with the passion of his life. Still less would he waste his time at the dinner parties of the great, no longer to him a novelty. He was eminently social by nature and fond of talk and controversy, with a superb physique capable of digesting the richest dishes and of enduring the fatigues and ceremonies of fashionable life. But even the pleasures of the banquet and of cultivated society, to many a mere relaxation, were sacrificed to his fondness for books, to him the greatest and truest companionship, especially when they introduced him to the life and manners of bygone ages, and to communion with the masterminds of the world. For relaxation, Macaulay preferred to take long walks, lounge around the bookstalls, visit the sights of London with his nieces, invite his intimate friends to simple dinners at the Albany, amuse himself with trifles, especially in company with those he loved best, in the domestic circle of his relatives, whom he treated ever with the most familiar and affectionate sympathy, so that while they loved and revered him, they had no idea that Uncle Tom was a great man. His most interesting letters were to his sisters and nieces, whose amusement and welfare he had constantly in view, and who were more to him than all the world besides. Indeed, he did not write many letters except to his relatives, his publishers, and his intimate friends, who were few, considering the number of persons he was obliged to meet. He was a thoroughly domestic man, although he never married or wished to marry. It surprises me that Macaulay's intercourse with eminent authors was so constrained. He saw very little of them, but while he did not avoid talking with them when thrown among them and keeping up the courtesies of life even with those he thoroughly disliked, I cannot see any evidence that he sought the society of those who were regarded as his equals in genius. He liked Milman and Mackintosh and Napier and Jeffrey and Rogers and a few others, but his intimate intercourse was confined chiefly to these and to his family. Macaulay's fame, however, was substantially founded and built. Sidney Smith's witty characterization of him is worth recalling. I always prophesied his greatness from the first moment that I saw him, then a very young and unknown man on the northern circuit. There are no limits to his knowledge on small subjects as well as great. He is like a book in breeches. Yes, I agree. He is certainly more agreeable since his return from India. 
His enemies might have said before, though I never did so, that he talked rather too much, but now he has occasional flashes of silence that make his conversation perfectly delightful. But what is far better and more important than all this is that I believe Macaulay to be incorruptible. You might lay ribbons, stars, garters, wealth, title before him in vain. He has an honest, genuine love of his country, and the world could not bribe him to neglect her interests. Macaulay now devoted several weeks of every year to travel, visiting different parts of England and the continent as the mood took him. In the autumn of 1838, he visited Italy. It would seem for the first time, and was, of course, enchanted. He appreciated natural scenery, but was not enthusiastic over it, nor did it make a very deep impression on him except for the moment. He loved best to visit cities and places consecrated by classical associations. While at Rome, Macaulay received from Lord Melbourne the offer of the office of judge advocate, but he unhesitatingly declined it. The salary of £2,500 was nothing to a scholar who already had a comfortable independence, and the duties the situation imposed were not only uncongenial, but would interfere with his literary labors. In February 1839, he returned to London, and now the pressure on him by his political friends to re-enter public life was greater than he could resist. He was elected to Parliament as one of the members from Edinburgh and gave his usual support to his party. In September, he became War Secretary, with a seat in the Whig Cabinet under Lord Melbourne. Consequently, he suspended for a while his literary tasks, conducting the business of his department with commendable industry, but without enthusiasm. In the sessions of 1840 and 1841, during the angry discussions pertaining to the registration of votes in Ireland, he gave proof of having profited by the severe legal training he had received from his labors in India. During these years, he found time to write a few reviews, the one on Lord Olive being the most prominent. End of section 13. Section 14 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Lord Macaulay, Part 2. The great subject of political agitation at this period was the repeal of the Corn Laws. The Whig leaders had lost the earnestness which had marked their grand efforts when they carried the Reform Bill of 1832, and were more indifferent to further reforms than suited their constituents, so that, at a dangerous financial crisis in 1841, the direction of the public affairs fell into the hands of the Tories under Sir Robert Peel. This great man not only rescued the nation from its fiscal embarrassments, but having been convinced by the arguments of Cobden of the necessity of repealing the Corn Laws, he carried through that great reform to the disgust of his party and to his own undying fame. I have treated of this period more at large in another volume of this series. Macaulay was not much moved by the fall of the ministry to which he belonged and gladly resumed his literary labors the first fruits of his leisure being an essay on Warren Hastings, a companion piece to the one on Clive. These East Indian essays constitute the most picturesque and graphic account of British conquests in that ancient land that has been given to the public. Macaulay's intimate knowledge of the ground and his literary resources enabled him to picture the dazzling successes of Clive and Hastings so that the careers of those superb military chieftains and commercial robber statesmen in securing for their country the control of a distant province larger than France, and in enriching the British Empire and themselves beyond all precedent in conquest, stand splendidly portrayed forever. Macaulay had now taken apartments in the Albany, on the second floor to which he removed his large library, and in which he comfortably lived for fifteen years. His article on Warren Hastings was followed by that on Frederick the Great. His numerous articles in the Edinburgh Review had now become so popular that there was a great demand for them in a separate form. Curiously enough, as in the case of Carlyle, it was in America that the public appreciation of these essays first took the form of book publication, and Macaulay's Miscellanies were published in Boston in 1840 and in Philadelphia in 1842. As these volumes began to go to England, for Macaulay's own protection they were republished by Longman, revised by the author in 1843, and obtained an immediate and immense sale, reaching 120,000 copies in England, which added to the fame and income of Macaulay. But he was never satisfied with the finish of his own productions. The only thing which seemed to comfort him was that these last essays were better than the first. 
in addition to his labors for the Edinburgh, was the publication of a volume of his poems in 1842, which was also enthusiastically received by his admirers. His last notable essays were a chivalrous article on Madame d'Arblay, January 1843, an entirely charming account of Addison and the wits of Queen Anne's reign, July 1843, an interesting review of the memoirs of Braure, the French revolutionist and writer, April 1844, and finally a second article on Lord Chatham, October 1844, which is considered finer than the first one written 20 years earlier. More and more, however, the project of writing a history of England had taken possession of him, and he began now to forego all other literary occupation and to devote all his leisure time to that great work. During much of the time that Macaulay had continued writing his reviews, at the rate of about two in a year, he was an active member of Parliament, frequently addressing the House of Commons and earning the gratitude of the country by his liberal and enlightened views, especially those in reference to the right of Unitarians to their chapels, to the enlarged money grant given to the Irish Roman Catholic Maynooth College, and to the extension of copyrights. He rarely spoke without careful preparation. His speeches were forcible and fine. In the higher field of debate, however, as we have already intimated, he was not successful. In 1845, Sir Robert Peel retired, the Whigs again coming into power. And in 1846, Macaulay accepted the office of Paymaster of the Forces because its duties were comparatively light and would not much interfere with his literary labors, while it added £2,000 a year to his income. During the session of 1846 and 1847, while still in Parliament, he spoke only five times, although the House was ever ready to listen to him. In the year 1847, the disruption of the Scotch Church was effected, and in the bitterness engendered by that movement, Macaulay lost his popularity with his Edinburgh constituents. He seemed indifferent to their affairs. He answered their letters irregularly and with almost contemptuous brevity. He had no sympathy with the radicals who at that time controlled a large number of votes, and he refused to contribute towards electioneering expenses. Above all, he was absorbed in his history and had lost much of his interest in politics. In consequence, he failed to be re-elected and not unwillingly retired to private life. Macaulay now concentrated all his energies on the history, which occupied his thoughts, his studies, and his pen for the most part during the remainder of his life. The first two volumes were published in the latter part of 1843, and the sale was immense, surpassing that of any historical work in the history of literature, and coming near to the sale of the novels of Sir Walter Scott. The popularity of the work was not confined to scholars and statesmen and critics, but it was equally admired by ordinary readers, and not in England and Scotland alone, but in the United States, in France, in Holland, in Germany, and other countries. The labor expended on these books was prodigious. The author visited in person nearly all the localities in England and Ireland where the events he narrated took place. He ransacked the archives of most of the governments of Europe, and all the libraries to which he could gain access, public and private. He worked 12 hours a day and yet produced on average only two printed pages daily. So careful was he in verifying his facts and in arranging his materials, writing and rewriting until no further improvement could be made. This book was not merely the result of his researches for the last 15 years of his life, but of his general reading for nearly 50 years, when everything he read he remembered. Says Thackeray, he reads 20 books to write a sentence. He travels 100 miles to make a line of description. The extent and exactness of his knowledge were not only marvelous, but almost incredible. Mr. Buckle declared that Macaulay was perfectly accurate in all the facts which Buckle had himself investigated to write his history of civilization. And so particular was he in the selection of words that he never allowed a sentence to pass muster until it was as good as he could make it. He thought little of reconstructing a paragraph, says his biographer, for the sake of one happy illustration. He submitted to the most tiresome mechanical drudgery in the correction of his proof sheets. The clearness of his thought amid the profusion of his knowledge was represented in his writing by a remarkable conciseness of expression. His short, vigorous sentences are compact with details of fact, yet rich with color. His terseness has been compared to that of Tacitus. His power of condensation, aptness of phrase and epithet, and indomitable industry made him a master of rhetorical effect in the use of his multifarious learning for the illustration of his themes. 
As soon as his last proof sheet had been dispatched to the printers, Macaulay at once fell to reading a series of historians from Herodotus downward to measure his writings with theirs. Thucydides especially utterly destroyed all the conceit which naturally would arise from his unbounded popularity, as expressed in every social and literary circle, as well as in the reviews. Like Michelangelo, this Englishman was never satisfied with his own productions, and the only comfort he took in the impossibility of realizing his ideal was in the comparison he made of his own works with similar ones by contemporary authors. Then he was content, and then only appeared in his letters and diary that good-natured, self-satisfied feeling which arose from the consciousness that he was one of the most fortunate authors who had ever lived. There was nothing cynical in his sense of superiority but an amiable self-assertion and self-confidence that only made men smile. As when Lord Palmerston remarked that he wished he was as certain of any one thing as Tom Macaulay was of everything. This confidence rarely provoked opposition, except when he was positive as to things outside his sphere. He wrote and talked sensibly and luminously on financial and social questions, on art, on poetry and the drama, on philosophy and theology, but on these subjects he was not in authority with specialists. In other words, he did not, so to speak, know everything profoundly, but only superficially. Yet in history, especially English history, he was profound in analysis as well as brilliant in the narration of facts, even when there was disagreement between himself and others as to the inductions he drew from those facts, inductions colored by his strong prejudices and aristocratic surroundings. Macaulay was not always consistent with his own theories, however. For instance, he was a firm believer in the progress of society and of civilization. He saw the enormous gulf between the 9th and the 19th centuries, and the unmistakable advance which, since the times of Hildebrand, the world had made in knowledge, in the arts, in liberty, and in the comforts of life, although the tide of progress had its ebb and flow in different ages and countries. Yet when he cast his eye on America, where perhaps the greatest progress had been made in the world's history within fifty years, he saw nothing but melancholy signs of anarchy and decay, signs portending the collapse of liberty and the triumph of ignorance and crime. Thus he writes in 1857 to an American correspondent, As long as you have a boundless extent of fertile and unoccupied land, your laboring population will be far more at ease than the laboring population of the old world. But the time will come when wages will be as low and will fluctuate as much with you as with us. Then your institutions will fairly be brought to the test. Distress everywhere makes the laborer mutinous and discontented and inclines him to listen with eagerness to agitators who tell him that it is a monstrous iniquity that one man should have a million while another cannot get a full meal. In bad years, there's plenty of grumbling here and sometimes a little rioting. But it matters little, for here the sufferers are not the rulers. The supreme power is in the hands of a class deeply interested in the security of property and the maintenance of order. Accordingly, the malcontents are restrained. But with you, the majority is the government and has the rich, who are always a minority, absolutely at its mercy. The day will come when the multitude of people, none of whom has had more than half a breakfast or expects to have more than half a dinner, will choose a legislature. Is it possible to doubt what sort of legislature will be chosen? On the one side is a statesman preaching patience, respect for vested rights, strict observance of the public faith, and on the other a demagogue ranting about the tyranny of capitalists and usurers and asking why anybody should be permitted to drink champagne and ride in a carriage, while thousands of honest folks are in want of necessaries. Which of the two candidates is likely to be preferred by a working man who hears his children cry for more bread? There will be, I fear, spoliation. The spoliation will increase the distress. The distress will produce fresh spoliation. There is nothing to stop you. Your constitution is all sail and no anchor. Either civilization or liberty will perish. Either some Caesar or Napoleon will seize the reins of the government with a strong hand, or your republic will be as fearfully plundered and laid waste by barbarians in the 20th century as the Roman Empire was in the 5th. I do not deny that there is great force in Macaulay's reasoning and prophecy. History points to decline and ruin when public virtue has fled and government is in the hands of demagogues, for their reign has ever been succeeded by military usurpers who have preserved civilization indeed, but at the expense of liberty. Yet this reasoning applies not only to America but to England as well, especially since, by the Reform Bill and subsequent enactments of Parliament, she has opened the gates to an increase of suffrage which now threatens to become universal. 
the enfranchisement of the people, the enlarged powers of the individual under the protection and control of the commonwealth, is the Anglo-Saxon contribution to progress. It is dangerous. So is all power until its use is learned. But there is no backward step possible. The tremendous experiment must go forward, for England and America alike. Macaulay himself was one of the most prominent of English statesmen and orators in 1830, 1831, and 1832 to advocate the extension of the right of suffrage and the increase of popular liberties. All his writings are on the side of liberty in England, and all are in opposition to the Toryism which was so triumphant during the reign of George III. Why did he have faith in the English people of England, and yet show so little in the English people of America? He believed in political and social progress for his own countrymen. Why should he doubt the utility of the same in other countries? If vandalism is to be the fate of America, where education, the only truly conservative element, is more diffused than in England, why should it not equally triumph in that country when the masses have gained political power, as they surely will at some time, and even speedily, if the policy inaugurated by Gladstone is to triumph? For England, Macaulay had unbounded hope because he believed in progress, in liberty, in education, in the civilizing influence of machinery, in the increasing comforts of life through the constant increase of wealth among the middle classes, and especially through the power of Christianity, in spite of the dissensions of sects, the attacks of crude philosophers, socialists, anarchists, scientists, and atheists, from one end of Christendom to the other. Why should he not have equal faith in American civilization, which, in spite of wars and strikes and commercial distresses and political corruption, has yet made a marked progress from the time of Jefferson, the Apostle of Equality, down to our day, as seen especially in the multiplication of schools and colleges, in an untrammeled and watchful press, and in the active benevolence of the rich in the foundation of every kind of institution to relieve misery and want. The truth is that he, in common with most educated Englishmen of his day, and too many even of our own day, cherished a silent contempt for Americans, for their literature and their institutions, and hence he was not only inconsistent in the principles which he advocated, but showed that he was not emancipated, with all his learning, from the prejudices of which he ought to have been ashamed. As time made inroads on Macaulay's strong constitution, he gave up both politics and society in the absorbing interest which he took in his history, confining himself to his library, and sometimes allowing months to pass without accepting any invitation whatever to a social gathering. No man was ever more disenchanted with society. He begrudged his time even when tempted by the calls of friendship. When visitors penetrated to his den, he bowed them out with ironical politeness. He had no favors to ask from friends or foes, for he declined political office, and was as independent as wealth or fame could make him. In 1849 he was made Lord Rector of the University of Glasgow, and the acclamations following his address were prodigious. Lord John Russell gave to Macaulay's brother John a living worth of eleven hundred pounds. Macaulay himself was offered the professorship of history at Cambridge. In one year he received for the first edition of his third and fourth volumes of the history, published in 1855, twenty thousand pounds in a single check from Longman. At the age of forty-nine he writes in his diary, I have no cause for complaint. Tolerable health, competence, liberty, leisure, dear relatives and friends, and a very great literary reputation. With all this prosperity, Macaulay now naturally set up his carriage. He dined often with the Queen and was a great man, according to English notions, more even from his wealth and social position than from his success in letters. Lord John Russell pressed him to accept a seat in his cabinet, but I told him, Macaulay writes, that I should be of no use, that I was not a debater, that it was too late to become one, that my temper, taste, and literary habits alike prevented. He was, however, induced to become again a member of Parliament, and in 1852 was elected once more for Edinburgh, which had repented of its rejection of him in 1847. But he insisted on perfect independence to vote as he pleased. He regarded this re-entrance into public life as a great personal sacrifice, since it might postpone the appearance of his next two volumes of the history. His election, however, was received with great acclamation. Even Professor Wilson, the most conservative of Scotch Tories, voted for him. It was not a party victory, but purely a personal triumph. A serious illness now follows, a weakness of the heart from the effects of which Macaulay died a few years afterwards. He retires to Clifton and gives himself up to getting well, visiting Barleywood and driving in his private carriage among the most interesting scenery in the west of England. But he was never perfectly well again, 
although he continued to work on his history. His intimate friend saw the change in him with sadness, but he himself was serene and uncomplaining. Although he suffered from an oppression of the chest, he still on great occasions addressed the house. His mind was clear, but his voice was faint. The last speech he made was in behalf of the independence of the Scottish Church. The strain of the House of Commons proved to be too great for his now enfeebled constitution. Nor could he conceal from himself and his friends, says Trevelyan, that it was a grievous waste, while the reign of Anne still remained unwritten. For him to consume his scanty stock of vigor in the tedious and exhaustive routine of political existence, waiting the whole evenings for the vote, and then trudging home at three in the morning through the slush of a February thaw. He therefore spared himself as a member of Parliament, and carefully husbanded his powers in order to work upon his book. He gave himself more time for his annual vacation, yet would write when he could on the subjects which engrossed his life. His labors were too severe for his strength, but he worked on, and even harder and harder. At length, on the 25th of November, 1855, Macaulay sent to the printer the last 20 pages of his history, and an edition of 25,000 was ordered. Within a generation, 140,000 copies of the work were sold in the United Kingdom alone. Six rival translators were engaged in turning it into German, and it was published in the Polish, the Danish, the Swedish, the Italian, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, the Hungarian, the Russian, and the Bohemian languages, to say nothing of its immense circulation in the United States. Such extraordinary literary popularity was accompanied by great honors. In 1857, Macaulay was created a British peer and elected Lord Hyde Stewart of the Borough of Cambridge. The academies of Utrecht, Munich, and Turin elected him to honorary membership. The King of Prussia made him a member of the Order of Merit. Oxford conferred on him the degree of Doctor of Civil Law, and he was elected President of the Philosophical Institution of Edinburgh. He could have done little more in the way of academic and governmental honors. The failing health of Macaulay now compelled him to resign his seat in the House of Commons. It was also thought desirable for him to vacate his apartments at the Albany, which he had occupied for 15 years, that he might be more retired and perhaps more comfortable. His friends, at the suggestion of Dean Millman, selected a beautiful house in Kensington, the rooms of which were small except the library, which opened upon a beautiful lawn, adorned with flowers and shrubs. It was called Holly Lodge and was very secluded and attractive. Here his latter days were spent, in the society of his nieces and a few devoted friends, and in dispensing simple hospitalities. His favorite form of entertainment was the breakfast, at which his guests would linger till twelve, enchanted by his conversation, for his mind showed no signs of decay. From this charming retreat, Lord Macaulay very seldom appeared in London society. Years passed without his even accepting invitations. An occasional night at a friend's house in the country, one or two nights at Windsor Castle, and one or two visits to Lord Stanhope's seat in Kent in order to consult his magnificent library, were the only visits which Macaulay made in the course of the year. He always had a dislike of visiting in private houses, much preferring hotels where he could be free from conventional life. Macaulay was always careful in his expenditures, wasting nothing that he might enjoy the pleasure of charity, for he gave liberally, especially to needy and unfortunate men of letters. Once he gave one hundred pounds to a total stranger who implored his aid. In his household he was revered, for he was the kindest and most considerate of masters, while his relatives absolutely worshipped him. At home he made no claim to the privileges of genius. He had few eccentricities. He never interfered with the pleasures of others. He never obtruded his advice or demanded that his own views or tastes should be consulted. He was especially careful not to wound the feelings of those with whom he lived. Children were his delight and solace. Over them he seemed to have unbounding influence. He would spend the half of a busy day in playing with them and in inventing new games for their diversion. One of his pleasures was to take them to see the sights of London. His sympathies were quick and generous, although apparently so cynical in the opinions of his books, he was always affected at any touches of pathos, even to tears. It was hard for Macaulay to realize that the time had come when he must leave untold that portion of English history with which he was more familiar than any other living man, but he submitted to the inevitable without repining. He had done what he could. Even when he was compelled to give up his daily task, his love of reading remained. A book was his solace to the last. He had no extensive acquaintance with the works of some of the best writers of his own generation, preferring the classic authors of antiquity and of England in the time of Anne. He did not relish Coleridge or Carlyle or Buckle or Ruskin, or indeed any writer who seemed to strain after originality of style, 
in defiance of the old and conservative canons. He preferred Miss Austen to Dickens. He felt that he owed a great debt to the masterminds of bygone ages who reached perfection of style so far as it can be attained. Even the English writers of the reign of Anne, to his mind, have never been surpassed. His admiration for Addison was unbounded. Dryden and Pope, to him, were greater poets than anyone who have succeeded them. Such a poet as Tennyson or Wordsworth he pretended he did not understand. He wanted transparent clearness of expression. Browning would have been to him an abomination. He despised the poetry of his own age, with its involved sentences, its obscurity, and its strange meters. His own poetry was as direct as Homer, as simple as Chaucer, and as graphic as Scott. In 1859, Macaulay contrived to visit once more the English lakes and the western highlands, where he was received with great veneration, being recognized everywhere on steamers and railway stations. But his cheerfulness had now departed, although he made an effort to be agreeable. In December of this year, he ceased writing in his diary. The physicians pretended to think that he was better, but fainting fits set in. One Christmas he said but little and was constantly dropping to sleep. His relatives did not seem to think that he was in immediate danger, but the end was near. He died without pain and was buried in Westminster Abbey on the 9th of January, 1860, having for pallbearers the most illustrious men in England. He rests in the poet's corner, among the tombs of Johnson and Garrick, Handel and Goldsmith, Gay and Addison, leaving behind him an immortal fame. And what is this fame? It is not that of a philosophical historian like Guizot, for his history is not marked by profound generalizations or even thoughtful reflections. He was not a judicial historian like Hallam, seeking to present the truth alone, for he was a partisan, full of party prejudices. Nor was he an historian like Rank, raking out the hidden facts of a remote period and unveiling the astute diplomacy of past ages. Macaulay was a great historical painter of the realistic school whose pictures have never been surpassed or even equaled for vividness and interest. In this class of historians, he stands out alone and peerless, the most exciting and the most interesting of all the historians who have depicted the manners, the events, and the characters of a former age. Never by any accident dull, but fatiguing, if at all, only by his wealth of illustration and the over-brilliancy of his coloring. He is the Titian of word-painting, and as such will live like that immortal colorist. Critics may say what they please about his rhetoric, about his partial statements, about his want of insight into deep philosophical questions, but as a painter who made his figures stand out on the historical canvas with unique vividness, Macaulay cannot fail to be regarded, as long as the English language is spoken or written, as one of the great masters of literary composition. This was the verdict pronounced by the English nation at large, and its great political and literary leaders expressed and confirmed it when they gave him fortune and fame, elevated him to the peerage, bestowed on him stars and titles, and buried him with august solemnity among those illustrious men who gave to England its power and glory. End of section 14. Section 15 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Shakespeare, or the Poet, Part 1. 1564 to 1616. By Ralph Waldo Emerson. Great men are more distinguished by range and extent than by originality. If we require the originality which consists in weaving, like a spider, their web from their own bowels, in finding clay and making bricks and building the house, no great men are original. Nor does valuable originality consist in unlikeness to other men. The hero is in the press of night and the thick of events, and seeing what men want and sharing their desire, he adds the needful length of sight and of arm to come at the desired point. The greatest genius is the most indebted man. A poet is no rattle-brain, saying what comes uppermost, and, because he says everything, saying at last something good, but a heart in unison with his time and country. There is nothing whimsical and fantastic in his production, but sweet and sad, earnest, freighted with the weightiest convictions, and pointed with the most determined aim which any man or class knows of in his times. The genius of our life is jealous of individuals and will not have any individual great except through the general. There is no choice to genius. A great man does not wake up on some fine morning and say, I am full of life, 
I will go to sea and find an Antarctic continent today. I will square the circle. I will ransack botany and find a new food for man. I have a new architecture in my mind. I foresee a new mechanic power. No, but he finds himself in the river of the thoughts and events, forced onward by the ideas and necessities of his contemporaries. He stands where all the eyes of men look one way, and their hands all point in the direction in which he should go. The church has reared him amidst rites and pomps, and he carries out the advice which her music gave him, and builds a cathedral needed by her chants and processions. He finds a war raging. It educates him by trumpet in barracks, and he betters the instruction. He finds two counties groping to bring coal or flour or fish from the place of production to the place of consumption, and he hits on a railroad. Every master has found his materials collected, and his power lay in his sympathy with his people and in his love of the materials he wrought in. What an economy of power, and what a compensation for the shortness of life. All is done to his hand. The world has brought him thus far on his way. The human race has gone out before him, sunk the hills, filled the hollows, and bridged the rivers. Men, nations, poets, artisans, women, all have worked for him, and he enters into their labors. Choose any other thing out of the line of tendency, out of the national feeling and history, and he would have all to do for himself. His powers would not be expended in the first preparations. Great genial power, one would almost say, consists in not being original at all, in being altogether receptive, in letting the world do all, and suffering the spirit of the hour to pass unobstructed through the mind. Shakespeare's youth fell in a time when the English people were importunate for dramatic entertainments. The court took offense easily at political illusions and attempted to suppress them. The Puritans, a growing and energetic party, and the religious among the Anglican church would suppress them. But the people wanted them. Inn yards, houses without roofs, and extemporaneous enclosures at county fairs were the ready theaters of strolling players. The people had tasted this new joy, And, as we could not hope to suppress newspapers now, no, not by the strongest party, neither could the king, prelate, or puritan, alone or united, suppress an organ which was ballad, epic, newspaper, caucus, lecture, punch, and library at the same time. Probably king, prelate, and puritan all found their own account in it. It had become, by all causes, a national interest, by no means conspicuous, so that some great scholar would have thought of treating it in an English history, but not a whit less considerable, because it was cheap and of no account, like a baker's shop. The best proof of its vitality is the crowd of writers which suddenly broke into this field. Kidd, Marlowe, Green, Johnson, Chapman, Decker, Webster, Haywood, Middleton, Peel, Ford, Massinger, Beaumont, and Fletcher. The secure possession, by the stage of the public mind, is of the first importance to the poet who works for it. He loses no time in idle experiments. Here is audience and expectation prepared. In the case of Shakespeare, there is much more. At the time when he left Stratford and went up to London, a great body of stage plays of all dates and writers existed in manuscript and were in turn produced on the boards. Here is the tale of Troy, which the audience will bear hearing some part of every week the death of Julius Caesar, and other stories out of Plutarch, which they never tire of. A shelf full of English history, from the chronicles of Brute and Arthur down to the royal Henrys, which men hear eagerly, and a string of doleful tragedies, merry Italian tales, and Spanish voyages, which all the London prentices know. All the mass has been treated with more or less skill by every playwright, and the prompter has soiled and tattered manuscripts. It is now no longer possible to say who wrote them first. They have been the property of the theater so long, and so many rising geniuses have enlarged or altered them, inserting a speech or a whole scene or adding a song, that no man can any longer claim copyright in this work of numbers. Happily, no man wishes to. They are not yet desired in that way. We have few readers, many spectators and hearers. They had best lie where they are. Shakespeare, in common with his comrades, esteemed the mass of old plays waste stock in which any experiment could be freely tried. Had the prestige which hedges about a modern tragedy existed, nothing could have been done. The rude warm blood of the living England circulated in the play, as in street ballads, and gave body which he wanted to his airy and majestic fantasy. 
The poet needs a ground in popular tradition on which he may work, and which, again, may restrain his art within the due temperance. It holds him to the people, supplies a foundation for his edifice, and in furnishing so much work done to his hand, leaves him at leisure and in full strength for the audacities of his imagination. In short, the poet owes to his legend what sculpture owed to the temple. Sculpture in Egypt and in Greece grew up in subordination to architecture. It was the ornament of the temple wall. At first a rude relief carved on pediments, then the relief became bolder and a head or arm was projected from the wall, the groups being still arranged with reference to the building, which serves also as a frame to hold the figures. And when, at last, the greatest freedom of style and treatment was reached, the prevailing genius of architecture still enforced a certain calmness and continence in the statue. As soon as the statue was begun for itself, and with no reference to the temple or palace, the art began to decline. Freak, extravagance, and exhibition took the place of the old temperance. This balance wheel, which the sculptor found in architecture, the perilous irritability of poetic talent found in the accumulated dramatic materials to which the people were already wanted, and which had a certain excellence which no single genius, however extraordinary, could hope to create. In point of fact, it appears that Shakespeare did owe debts in all direction and was able to use whatever he found, and the amount of indebtedness may be inferred from Malone's laborious computations in regard to the first, second, and third parts of Henry V, in which, out of 6,043 lines, 1,771 were written by some author preceding Shakespeare, 2,373 by him, on the foundations laid by his predecessors, and 1,899 were entirely his own. And the preceding investigation hardly leaves a single drama of his absolute invention. Malone's sentence is an important piece of external history. In Henry VIII, I think I see plainly the cropping out of the original rock on which his own finer stratum was laid. The first play was written by a superior, thoughtful man with a vicious ear. I can mark his lines and know well their cadence. See Wolsey's soliloquy and the following scene with Cromwell, where, instead of the meter of Shakespeare, whose secret is that the thought constructs the tune, so that reading for the sense will best bring out the rhythm, here the lines are constructed on a given tune, and the verse has even a trace of pulpit eloquence. But the play contains, through all its length, unmistakable traits of Shakespeare's hand, and some passages, as the account of the coronation, are like autographs. What is odd, the compliment to Queen Elizabeth is in the bad rhythm. Shakespeare knew that tradition supplies a better fable than any invention can. If he lost any credit of design, he augmented his resources, and at that day, our petulant demand for originality was not so much pressed. There was no literature for the million. The universal reading, the cheap press, were unknown. A great poet who appears in illiterate times absorbs into his sphere all the light which is anywhere radiating. Every intellectual jewel, every flower of sentiment it is his fine office to bring to his people, and he comes to value his memory equally with his invention. He is therefore little solicitous whence his thoughts have been derived, whether through translation, whether through tradition, whether by travel in distant countries, whether by inspiration. From whatever source, they are equally welcome to his uncritical audience. Nay, he borrows very near home. Other men say wise things as well as he, only they say a good many foolish things and do not know when they have spoken wisely. He knows the sparkle of the true stone and puts it in a high place wherever he finds it. Such is the happy position of Homer, perhaps, of Chaucer, of Sadi. They felt that all wit was their wit, and they are librarians and historiographers as well as poets. Each romancer was heir and dispenser of all the hundred tales of the world presenting Thebes and Pelops' line, and the tale of Troy divine. The influence of Chaucer is conspicuous in all our early literature, and more recently not only Pope and Dryden have been beholden to him, but in the whole society of English writers a large unacknowledged debt is easily traced. One is charmed with the opulence which feeds so many pensioners. But Chaucer is a huge borrower. Chaucer, it seems, drew continually, through Lydgate and Caxton, from Guido di Colonna, whose Latin romance of the Trojan War was in turn a compilation from Bares Phrygius, Ovid, and Statius. Then Petrarch, Boccaccio, and the provincial poets are his benefactors. The Romance of the Rose is only judicious translation from William of Loris and John of Mung, Troilius and Cressidae 
from Lolius of Urbino, The Cock and the Fox from the Lay de Marie, The House of Fame from the French or Italian, and poor Gower he uses as if he were only a brick kiln or stone quarry out of which to build his house. He steals by this apology, that what he takes has no worth where he finds it, and the greatest where he leaves it. It has come to be practically a sort of rule in literature that a man having once shown himself capable of original writing is entitled thenceforth to steal from the writings of others at discretion. Thought is the property of him who can entertain it and of him who can adequately place it. A certain awkwardness marks the use of borrowed thoughts, but as soon as we have learned what to do with them, they become our own. Thus, all originality is relative. Every thinker is retrospective. The learned member of the legislature, at Westminster or at Washington, speaks and votes for thousands. Show us the constituency and the now invisible channels by which the senator is made aware of their wishes. The crowd of practical and knowing men, who, by correspondence or conversation, are feeding him with evidence, anecdotes, and estimates, and it will bereave his fine attitudes and resistance of something of their impressiveness. As Sir Robert Peel and Mr. Webster vote, so Locke and Rousseau think for thousands. And so there were fountains around Homer, Manu, Sadi, or Milton from which they drew. Friends, lovers, books, traditions, proverbs, all perished, which, if seen, would go to reduce the wonder. Did the bard speak with authority? Did he feel himself overmatched by any companion? The appeal is to the consciousness of the writer. Is there at last in his breast a Delphi whereof to ask concerning any thought or thing, whether it be verily so, yea or nay? and to have answer, and to rely on that. All the debts which such a man could contract to other wit would never disturb his consciousness of originality, for the ministrations of books and of other minds are a whiff of smoke to that most private reality with which he has conversed. It is easy to see that what is best written or done by genius in the world was no man's work, but came by wide social labor, when a thousand wrought like one, sharing the same impulse. Our English Bible is a wonderful specimen of the strength and music of the English language, but it was not made by one man or at one time, but centuries and churches brought it to perfection. There never was a time when there was not some translation existing. The liturgy, admired for its energy and pathos, is an anthology of the piety of ages and nations, a translation of the prayers and forms of the Catholic Church. These collected, too, in long periods, from the prayers and meditations of every saint and sacred writer all over the world. Grotius makes the like remark in respect to the Lord's Prayer that the single clauses of which it is comprised were already in use in the time of Christ, in the rabbinical forms. He picked out the grains of gold. The nervous language of the common law, the impressive forms of our courts, and the precision and substantial truth of the legal distinctions are the contribution of all the sharp-sighted, strong-minded men who have lived in the countries where these laws govern. The translation of Plutarch gets its excellence by being translation on translation. There never was a time when there was none. All the truly idiomatic and national phrases are kept, and all others successively picked out and thrown away. Something like the same process had gone on long before with the originals of these books. The world takes liberties with world books. Vedas, Aesop's Fables, Pilpe, Arabian Nights, Seed, Iliad, Robin Hood, Scottish minstrelsy, are not the work of single men. In the composition of such works, the time thinks, the market thinks, the mason, the carpenter, the merchant, the farmer, the fop, all think for us. Every book supplies its time with one good word. Every municipal law, every trade, every folly of the day, and the generic Catholic genius who is not afraid or ashamed to owe his originality to the originality of all, stands with the next age as the recorder and embodiment of his own. We have to thank the researches of antiquaries and the Shakespeare Society for ascertaining the steps of the English drama from the mysteries celebrated in churches and by churchmen and the final detachment from the church and the completion of secular plays from Ferrex and Porrex and Gammer Girton's Needle down to the possession of the stage by the very pieces which Shakespeare altered, remodeled, and finally made his own. Elated with success and piqued by the growing interest of the problem, they have left no bookstall unsearched, no chest in a garret unopened, no file of old yellow accounts to decompose and damp and worms, so keen was the hope to discover whether the boy Shakespeare poached or not, whether he held horses at the theater door, whether he kept school, and why he left in his will only his second best bed to Anne Hathaway, his wife. 
There is something touching in the madness with which the passing age mischooses the object on which all candles shine and all eyes are turned. The care with which it registers every trifle touching Queen Elizabeth and King James, the Essexes, Leicesters, Burleys, and Buckinghams, and lets pass without a single valuable note the founder of another dynasty, which alone will cause the Tudor dynasty to be remembered, the man who carries the Saxon race in him by the inspiration which feeds him, and on whose thoughts the foremost people of the world are now for some ages to be nourished, and minds to receive this and not another bias. A popular player, nobody suspected he was the poet of the human race, and the secret was kept as faithfully from poets and intellectual men as from courtiers and frivolous people. Bacon, who took the inventory of the human understanding for his times, never mentioned his name. Ben Jonson, though we have strained his few words of regard and panegyric, had no suspicion of the elastic fame whose first vibrations he was attempting. He no doubt thought the praise he has conceded to him generous, and esteemed himself, out of all question, the better poet of the two. If it need wit to know wit, according to the proverb, Shakespeare's time should be capable of recognizing it. Sir Henry Wotton was born four years after Shakespeare and died 23 years after him. And I find, among his correspondents and acquaintances, the following persons. Theodore Beza, Isaac Casaubon, Sir Philip Sidney, the Earl of Essex, Lord Bacon, Sir Walter Raleigh, John Milton, Sir Henry Vane, Isaac Walton, Dr. Don, Abraham Cawley, Bellarmine, Charles Cotton, John Pym, John Hales, Kepler, Vieta, Albericus Gentilius, Paul Sarpy, Arminius, with all of whom exists some token of his having communicated, without enumerating many others whom he doubtless saw. Shakespeare, Spencer, Johnson, Beaumont, Massinger, the two Herbers, Marlowe, Chapman, and the rest. Since the constellation of great men who appeared in Greece in the time of Pericles, there was never any such society. Yet their genius failed them to find out the best head in the universe. Our poet's mask was impenetrable. You cannot see the mountain near. It took a century to make it suspected, and not until two centuries had passed after his death did any criticism which we think adequate begin to appear. It was not possible to write the history of Shakespeare till now, for he is the father of German literature. It was with the introduction of Shakespeare into German by Lessing and the translation of his works by Weiland and Schlegel that the rapid burst of German literature was most intimately connected. It was not until the 19th century, whose speculative genius is a sort of living Hamlet, that the tragedy of Hamlet could find such wondering readers. Now, literature, philosophy, and thought are Shakespeareized. His mind is the horizon beyond which, at present, we do not see. Our ears are educated to music by his rhythm. Coleridge and Goethe are the only critics who have expressed our convictions with any adequate fidelity but there is in all cultivated minds a silent appreciation of his superlative power and beauty, which, like Christianity, qualifies the period. End of section 15. Section 16 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Shakespeare, or the Poet, Part two. The Shakespeare Society have inquired in all directions, advertised the missing facts, offered money for any information that will lead to proof, and with what result? Besides some important illustration of the history of the English stage, to which I have adverted, they have gleaned a few facts touching the property and dealings in regard to the property of the poet. It appears that from year to year he owned a larger share in the Black Friars Theatre, its wardrobe and other appurtenances were his, that he bought an estate in his native village with his earnings as writer and shareholder, that he lived in the best house in Stratford, was entrusted by his neighbors with their commissions in London, as of borrowing money and the like, that he was a veritable farmer. About the time when he was writing Macbeth, he sues Philip Rogers in the borough court of Stratford for thirty-five shillings ten pence for corn delivered to him at different times and in all respects appears as a good husband with no reputation for eccentricity or excess. He was a good-natured sort of man, an actor and shareholder in the theater, not in any striking manner distinguished from other actors and managers. I admit the importance of this information. It was well worth the pains that have been taken to procure it. But whatever scraps of information concerning his condition these researches may have rescued, 
they can shed no light upon that infinite invention which is the concealed magnet of his attraction for us. We are very clumsy writers of history. We tell the chronicle of parentage, birth, birthplace, schooling, schoolmates, earning of money, marriage, publication of books, celebrity, death. And when we have come to an end of this gossip, no ray of relation appears between it and the goddess born. And it seems as if, had we dipped at random into the modern Plutarch and read any other life there, it would have fitted the poems as well. It is the essence of poetry to spring, like the rainbow daughter of wonder from the invisible, to abolish the past and refuse all history. Malone, Warburton, Dice, and Collier have wasted their oil. The famed theaters, Covent Garden, Drury Lane, The Park, and Tremont have vainly assisted. Betterton, Garrick, Kemble, Keane, and Macready dedicate their lives to this genius. Him they crown, elucidate, obey, and express. The genius knows them not. The recitation begins. One golden word leaps out immortal from all this painted pedantry and sweetly torments us with invitations to its own inaccessible homes. I remember I went once to see the hamlet of a famed performer, the pride of the English stage, and all I then heard and all I now remember of the tradition was that in which the tradition had no part. Simply Hamlet's question to the ghost. What may this mean, that thou, dead course, again in complete steel, revilest thus the glimpses of the moon? That imagination which dilates the closest he writes into the world's dimension, crowds it with agents in rank and order, and quickly reduces the big reality to be the glimpses of the moon. These tricks of his magic spoil for us the illusions of the green room. Can any biography shed light on the localities into which the Midsummer Night's Dream admits me? Did Shakespeare confide to any notary or parish recorder, sacristan or surrogate in Stratford, the genesis of that delicate creation? The forest of Arden, the nimble air of Scone Castle, the moonlight of Portia's villa, the antres vast and deserts idol of Othello's captivity? Where is the third cousin or grand nephew, the chancellor's file of accounts or private letter that has kept one word of those transcendent secrets? In fine, in this drama, as in all great works of art, in the Cyclopean architecture of Egypt and India, in the Phidian sculpture, the Gothic masters, the Italian painting, the ballads of Spain and Scotland, the genius draws up the ladder after him when the creative age goes up to heaven and gives way to a new age which sees the works and asks in vain for a history. Shakespeare is the only biographer of Shakespeare, and even he can tell nothing except to the Shakespeare in us, that is, to our most apprehensive and sympathetic hour. He cannot step from off his tripod and give us anecdotes of his inspirations. Read the antique documents extricated, analyzed, and compared by the assiduous Dice and Collier, and now read one of these skyey sentences, aerolites, which seem to have fallen out of heaven, and which not your experience but the man within the breast has accepted as words of fate. And tell me if they match, if the former account in any manner for the latter, or which gives the most historical insight into the man. Hence, though our external history is so meager, yet with Shakespeare for biographer instead of Aubrey and Rowe, we have really the information which is material, that which describes character and fortune, that which, if we were about to meet the man and deal with him, would most import us to know. We have his recorded convictions on those questions which knock for answer at every heart, on life and death, on love, on wealth and poverty, on the prizes of life and the ways whereby we come at them, on the characters of men and the influences, occult and open, which affect their fortunes, and on those mysterious and demoniacal powers which defy our science and yet which interweave their malice and their gift in our brightest hours. Who ever read the volume of the sonnets without finding that the poet had there revealed, under masks that are no masks to the intelligent, the lore of friendship and of love, the confusion of sentiments in the most susceptible, and at the same time the most intellectual of men? What trait of his private mind has he hidden in his dramas? One can discern, in his ample pictures of the gentleman and the king, what forms and humanities pleased him his delight in troops of friends, in large hospitality, in cheerful giving. Let Timon, let Warwick, let Antonio, the merchant, answer for his great heart. 
So far from Shakespeare's being the least known, he is the one person in all modern history known to us. What point of morals, of manners, of economy, of philosophy, of religion, of taste, of the conduct of life has he not settled? What mystery has he not signified his knowledge of? What office or function or district of man's work has he not remembered? What king has he not taught state as Talma taught Napoleon? What maiden has not found him finer than her delicacy? What lover has he not outleft? What sage has he not outseen? What gentleman has he not instructed in the rudeness of his behavior? Some able and appreciating critics think no criticism on Shakespeare valuable that does not rest purely on the dramatic merit, that he is falsely judged as poet and philosopher. I think as highly as these critics of his dramatic merit, but still think it secondary. He was a full man who liked to talk, a brain exhaling thoughts and images, which, seeking vent, found the drama next at hand. Had he been less, we should have had to consider how well he filled his place, how good a dramatist he was, and he is the best in the world. But it turns out that what he has to say is of that weight as to withdraw some attention from the vehicle. And he is like some saint whose history is to be rendered into all languages, into verse and prose, into songs and pictures, and cut up into proverbs, so that the occasion which gave the saint's meaning the form of a conversation, or of a prayer, or of a code of laws, is immaterial compared with the universality of its application. So it fares with the wise Shakespeare and his book of life. He wrote the airs for all our modern music. He wrote the text of modern life, the text of manners. He drew the man of England and Europe, the father of the man in America. He drew the man and described the day and what is done in it. He reads the hearts of men and women, their probity and their second thought and wiles, the wiles of innocence and the transitions by which virtues and vices slide into their contraries. He could divide the mother's part from the father's part in the face of the child, or draw the fine demarcations of freedom and of fate. He knew the laws of repression which make the police of nature, and all the sweets and all the terrors of human lot lay in his mind as truly but as softly as the landscape lies on the eye. And the importance of this wisdom of life sinks the form, as of drama or epic, out of notice. Tis like making a question concerning the paper on which a king's message is written. Shakespeare is as much out of the category of eminent authors as he is out of the crowd. He is inconceivably wise, the others conceivably. A good reader can, in sort, nestle into Plato's brain and think from thence, but not into Shakespeare's. We are still out of doors. For executive faculty, for creation, Shakespeare is unique. No man can imagine it better. He was the farthest reach of subtlety, compatible with an individual self, the subtlest of authors, and only just within the possibility of authorship. With this wisdom of life is the equal endowment of imaginative and of lyric power. He clothed the creatures of his legend with form and sentiments as if they were people who had lived under his roof. And few real men have left such distinct characters as these fictions. And they spoke in language as sweet as it was fit. Yet his talents never seduced him into an ostentation, nor did he harp on one string. An omnipresent humanity coordinates all his faculties. Give a man of talents a story to tell, and his partiality will presently appear. He has certain observations, opinions, topics, which have some accidental prominence, and which he disposes to all exhibit. He crams this part and starves that other part, consulting not the fitness of the thing, but his fitness and strength. But Shakespeare has no peculiarity, no importunate topic, but all is duly given. No veins, no curiosities, no cow painter, no bird fancier, no mannerist is he. He has no discoverable egotism. The great he tells greatly, the small subordinately. He is wise without emphasis or assertion. He is strong as nature is strong, who lifts the land into mountain slopes without effort and by the same rule as she floats a bubble in the air, and likes as well to do one as the other. This makes that equality of power in farce, tragedy, narrative, and love songs a merit so incessant that each reader is incredulous of the perception of other readers. This power of expression, or of transferring the inmost truth of things into music and verse, makes him the type of poet that has added a new problem to metaphysics. This is that which throws him into natural history, as a main production of the globe, 
and as announcing new eras and ameliorations. Things were mirrored in his poetry without loss or blur. He could paint the fine with precision, the great with compass, the tragic and the comic indifferently and without any distortion or favor. He carried his powerful execution into minute details to a hair point, finishes an eyelash or a dimple as firmly as he draws a mountain, and yet these, like nature's, will bear the scrutiny of the solar microscope. In short, he is the chief example to prove that more or less of production, more or fewer pictures, is a thing indifferent. He had the power to make one picture. Daguerre learned to let one flower etch its image on his plate of iodine, and then proceeds at leisure to etch a million. There are always objects, but there was never representation. Here is perfect representation, at last. And now let the world of figures sit for their portraits. No recipe can be given for the making of a Shakespeare, but the possibility of the translation of things into song is demonstrated. His lyric power lies in the genius of the piece. The sonnets, though their excellence is lost in the splendor of the dramas, are as inimitable as they. And it is not a merit of lines, but a total merit of the piece. Like the tone of voice of some incomparable person, so is this a speech of poetic beings, and any clause as unproducible now as a whole poem. Though the speeches in the plays and the single lines have a beauty which tempts the ear to pause on them for their euphemism, yet the sentence is so loaded with meaning and so linked with its foregoers and followers that the logician is satisfied. His means are as admirable as his ends, every subordinate invention by which he helps himself to connect some irreconcilable opposites is a poem too. He is not reduced to dismount and walk because his horses are running off with him in some distant direction. He always rides. The finest poetry was first experience, but the thought has suffered a transformation since it was an experience. Cultivated men often attain a good degree of skill in writing verses, but it is easy to read, through their poems, their personal history. Anyone acquainted with the parties can name every figure. This is Andrew and that is Rachel. The sense thus remains prosaic. It is a caterpillar with wings and not yet a butterfly. In the poet's mind, the fact has gone quite over into a new element of thought and has lost all that is exuvial. This generosity abides with Shakespeare. We say, from the truth and closeness of his pictures, that he knows the lesson by heart. Yet there is not a trace of egotism. One more royal trait properly belongs to the poet. I mean his cheerfulness, without which no man can be a poet, for beauty is his aim. He loves virtue, not for its obligation, but for its grace. He delights in the world, in man, in woman, for the lovely light that sparkles from them. Beauty, the spirit of joy and hilarity, he sheds over the universe. Epicurus relates that poetry hath such charms that a lover might forsake his mistress to partake of them. And the true bards have been noted for their firm and cheerful temper. Homer lies in sunshine, Chaucer is glad and erect, and Saadi says, It was rumored abroad that I was penitent, but what had I to do with repentance? Not less sovereign and cheerful, much more sovereign and cheerful is the tone of Shakespeare. His name suggests joy and emancipation to the heart of men. If he should appear in any company of human souls, who would not march in his troop? He touches nothing that does not borrow health and longevity from his festal style. And now, how stands the account of man with his bard and benefactor, when in solitude, shutting our ears to the reverberations of his fame, we seek to strike the balance? Solitude has austere lessons. It can teach us to spare both heroes and poets, and it weighs Shakespeare also and finds him to share the halfness and imperfection of humanity. Shakespeare, Homer, Dante, Chaucer saw the splendor of meaning that plays over the visible world, knew that a tree had another use than for apples and corn another than for meal, and the ball of the earth than for tillage and roads, that these things bore a second and finer harvest to the mind, being emblems of its thoughts and conveying in all their natural history a certain mute commentary on human life. Shakespeare employed them as colors to compose his picture. He rested in their beauty and never took the step which seemed inevitable to such genius, namely, to explore the virtue which resides in these symbols and imparts this power. What is that which they themselves say? He converted the elements which waited on his command into entertainments. He was master of the revels to mankind. Is it not as if one should have, through majestic powers of science, the comments given into his hand, 
or the planets in their moons and should draw them from their orbits to glare with the municipal fireworks on a holiday night and advertise in all towns very superior pyrotechny this evening. Are the agents of nature and the power to understand them worth no more than a street serenade or the breath of a cigar? One remembers again the trumpet text in the Quran, the heavens and the earth and all that is between them, think ye we have created them in jest? As long as the question is of talent and mental power, the world of men has not his equal to show. But when the question is to life and its materials and its auxiliaries, how does it profit me? What does it signify? It is but a twelfth night, or midsummer night's dream, or winter evening's tale. What signifies another picture, more or less? The Egyptian verdict of the Shakespeare societies comes to mind, that he was a jovial actor and manager. I cannot marry this fact to his verse. Other admirable men have led lives in some sort of keeping with their thought. But this man, in wide contrast, had he been less, had he reached only the common measure of the great authors, of Bacon, Milton, Tasso, Cervantes, we might leave the fact in the twilight of human fate. But that this man of men, he who gave to the science of mind a new and larger subject than had ever existed, and planted the standard of humanity some furlongs forward into chaos, that he should not be wise for himself, it must even go into the world's history that the best poet led an obscure and profane life, using his genius for the public amusement. Well, other men, priest and prophet, Israelite, German, and Swede, beheld the same objects. They also saw through them that which was contained. And to what purpose? The beauty straightway vanished. The red commandments, all excluding mountainous duty and obligation, a sadness as of piled mountains, fell on them. And life became ghastly, joyless, a pilgrim's progress, a probation, beleaguered round with doleful histories of Adam's fall and curse behind us, with doomsdays and purgatorial and penal fires before us, and the heart of the seer and the heart of the listener sank in them. It must be conceded that these are half-views of half-men. The world still wants its poet-priest, a reconciler who shall not trifle, with Shakespeare the player, nor shall grope in graves with Swedenborg the mourner, but who shall see, speak, and act with equal inspiration. For knowledge will brighten the sunshine, right is more beautiful than private affection, and love is compatible with universal wisdom. End of section 16. Section 17 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. John Milton, Poet and Patriot, Part 1. 1608 to 1674 by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Toward the close of the year 1823, Mr. Lemon, deputy keeper of the state papers, in the course of his researches among the presses of his office, met with a large Latin manuscript. With it were found corrected copies of the foreign despatches written by Milton while he filled the office of secretary, and several papers relating to the Popish trials and the Rye House plot. The whole was wrapped up in an envelope, subscribed to Mr. Skinner, merchant, on examination, the large manuscript proved to be the long-lost essay on the doctrines of Christianity, which, according to Wood and Toland, Milton finished after the Restoration and deposited with Syriac Skinner. Skinner, it is well known, held the same political opinions with his illustrious friend. It is therefore probable, as Mr. Lemon conjectures, that he may have fallen under the suspicions of the government during that persecution of the Whigs which followed the dissolution of the Oxford Parliament in that, in consequence of a general seizure of his papers, this work may have been brought to the office in which it has been found. But whatever the adventures of the manuscript may have been, no doubt can exist that it is a genuine relic of the great poet. The book itself will not add much to the fame of Milton. Were it far more orthodox or far more heretical than it is, it would not much edify or corrupt the present generation. The men of our time are not to be converted or perverted by quartos. A few more days, and this essay will follow the Defensio Populi to the dust and silence of the upper shelf. The name of its author and the remarkable circumstances attending its publication will secure to it a certain degree of attention. 
For a month or two, it will occupy a few minutes of chat in every drawing room and a few columns in every magazine. And it will then, to borrow the elegant language of the playbills, be withdrawn to make room for the forthcoming novelties. We wish, however, to avail ourselves of the interest, transient as it may be, which this work has excited. The dexterous Capuchins never chose to preach on the life and miracles of a saint till they have awakened the devotional feelings of their auditors by exhibiting some relic of him, a thread of his garment, a lock of his hair, or a drop of his blood. On the same principle, we intend to take advantage of the late interesting discovery, and while this memorial of a great and good man is still in the hands of all, to say something of his moral and intellectual qualities. Nor, we are convinced, will the severest of our readers blame us, if on occasion, like the present, we turn for a short time from the topics of the day to commemorate, in all love and reverence, the genius and virtues of John Milton, the poet, the statesman, the philosopher, the glory of English literature, the champion and martyr of English liberty. It is by his poetry that Milton is best known, and it is of his poetry that we wish first to speak. By the general suffrage of the civilized world, his place has been assigned among the greatest masters of the art. His detractors, however, though outvoted, have not been silenced. There are many critics, and some of great name, who contrive in the same breath to extol the poems and to decry the poet. The works they acknowledge, considered in themselves, may be classed among the noblest productions of the human kind, but they will not allow the author to rank with those great men who, born in the infancy of civilization, supplied by their own powers the want of instruction, and, though destitute models of themselves, bequeathed to posterity models which defy imitation. Milton, it is said, inherited what his predecessors created. He lived in an enlightened age. He received a finished education, and we must, therefore, if we would form a just estimate of his powers, make large deductions in consideration of these advantages. We venture to say, on the contrary, paradoxical as the remark may appear, that no poet has ever had to struggle with more unfavorable circumstances than Milton. He doubted, as he himself owned, whether he had not been born an age too late. For this notion, Johnson has thought fit to make him the butt of much clumsy ridicule. The poet, we believe, understood the nature of his art better than the critic. He knew that his poetical genius derived no advantage from the civilization which surrounded him, or from the learning which he had acquired, and he looked back with something like regret to the ruder age of simple words and vivid impressions. We think that, as civilization advances, poetry almost necessarily declines. Therefore, though we fervently admire those great works of imagination which have appeared in dark ages, we do not admire them the more because they have appeared in dark ages. On the contrary, we hold that the most wonderful and splendid proof of genius is a great poem produced in a civilized age. We cannot understand why those who believe in that most orthodox article of literary faith, that the earliest poets are generally the best, should wonder at the rule as if it were the exception. Surely the uniformity of the phenomenon indicates a corresponding uniformity in the cause. The fact is that common observers reason from the progress of the experimental sciences to that of the imitative arts. The improvement of the former is gradual and slow. Ages are spent in collecting materials, ages more in separating and combining them. Even when a system has been formed, there is still something to add, to alter, or to reject. Every generation enjoys the use of a vast hoard bequeathed to it by antiquity and transmits that hoard, augmented by fresh acquisitions, to future ages. In these pursuits, therefore, the first speculators lie under great disadvantages and, even when they fail, are entitled to praise. Their pupils, with far inferior intellectual powers, speedily surpass them in actual attainments. Every girl who has read Mrs. Marsett's little dialogues on political economy could teach Montague or Walpole many lessons in finance. Any intelligent man may now, by resolutely applying himself for a few years to mathematics, learn more than the great Newton knew after half a century of study and meditation. But it is not thus with music, with painting, or with sculpture. Still less is it thus with poetry. The progress of refinement rarely supplies these arts with better objects of imitation. It may indeed improve the instruments which are necessary to the mechanical operations of the musician, the sculptor, and the painter. But language, the machine of the poet, is best fitted for his purpose in its rudest state. Nations, like individuals, first perceive and then abstract. They advance from particular images to general terms. Hence, the vocabulary of an enlightened society is philosophical. That of a half-civilized people is poetical. 
This change in the language of men is partly the cause and partly the effect of a corresponding change in the nature of their intellectual operations, of a change by which science gains and poetry loses. Generalization is necessary to the advancement of knowledge, but particularity is indispensable to the creations of the imagination. In proportion as men know more and think more, they look less at individuals and more at classes. They therefore make better theories and worse poems. They give us vague phrases instead of images and personified qualities instead of men. They may be better able to analyze human nature than their predecessors. But analysis is not the business of the poet. His office is to portray, not to dissect. He may believe in a moral sense like Shaftesbury. He may refer all human actions to self-interest like Havelticus. Or he may never think about matter at all. His creed on such subjects will no more influence his poetry, properly so-called, than the notions which a painter may have conceived respecting the lacrimal glands, or the circulation of the blood, will affect the tears of his Niobe, or the blushes of his Aurora. If Shakespeare had written a book on the motives of human actions, it is by no means certain that it would have been a good one. It is extremely improbable that it would have contained half so much able reasoning on the subject as is to be found in the fable of the bees. But could Mandeville have created an Iago? Well, as he knew how to resolve characters into their elements, would he have been able to combine those elements in such a manner as to make a man a real, living, individual man? Perhaps no person can be a poet, or can even enjoy poetry, without a certain unsoundness of mind, if anything which gives so much pleasure ought to be called unsoundness. By poetry we mean not all writing in verse, nor even all good writing in verse. Our definition excludes many metrical compositions, which on other grounds deserve the highest praise. By poetry we mean the art of employing words in such a manner as to produce an illusion on the imagination, the art of doing by means of words what the painter does by means of colors. Thus, the greatest of poets has described it, in lines universally admired for the vigor and felicity of their diction, and still more valuable on account of the just notion which they convey of the art in which he excelled. As imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. These are the fruits of the fine frenzy which he ascribes to the poet, a fine frenzy doubtless, but still a frenzy. Truth, indeed, is essential to poetry, but it is the truth of madness. The reasonings are just, but the premises are false. After the first suppositions have been made, everything ought to be consistent, but those first suppositions require a degree of credulity which almost amounts to a partial and temporary derangement of the intellect. Hence, of all people, children are the most imaginative. They abandon themselves without reserve to every illusion. Every image which is strongly presented to their mental eye produces on them the effect of reality. No man, whatever his sensibility may be, is ever affected by Hamlet or Lear as a little girl is affected by the story of poor Red Riding Hood. She knows that it is all false, that wolves cannot speak, that there are no wolves in England. Yet in spite of her knowledge, she believes, she weeps, she trembles, she dares not go into a dark room lest she should feel the teeth of the monster at her throat. Such is the despotism of the imagination of her uncultivated mind. In a rude state of society, men are children with a greater variety of ideas. It is therefore in such a state of society that we may expect to find the poetical temperament in its highest perfection. In an enlightened age, there will be much intelligence, much science, much philosophy, abundance of just classification and subtle analysis, abundance of wit and eloquence, abundance of verses, and even of good ones, but little poetry. Men will judge and compare, but they will not create. They will talk about the old poets and comment on them, and to a certain degree, enjoy them. But they will scarcely be able to conceive the effect which poetry produced on their ruder ancestors. The agony, the ecstasy, the plentitude of belief. The Greek rhapsodists, according to Plato, could scarce recite Homer without falling into convulsions. The Mohawk hardly feels the scalping knife while he shouts his death song. The power which the ancient bards of Wales and Germany exercised over their auditors seems to modern readers almost miraculous. Such feelings are very rare in civilized community, and most rare among those who participate most in its improvements. They linger longest among the peasantry. Poetry produces an illusion on the eye of the mind as a magic lantern produces an illusion on the eye of the body. 
And as the magic lantern acts best in a dark room, poetry affects its purpose most completely in a dark age. As the light of knowledge breaks in on its exhibitions, as the outlines of certainty become more and more definite, and the shades of probability more and more distinct, the hues and lineaments of the phantoms which the poet calls upon grows fainter and fainter. We cannot unite the incompatible advantages of reality and deception, the clear discernment of truth, and the exquisite enjoyment of fiction. He who, in an enlightened and literary society, aspires to be a great poet, must first become a little child. He must take to pieces the whole web of his mind. He must unlearn much of that knowledge which has, perhaps, constituted hitherto his chief title to superiority. His very talents will be a hindrance to him. His difficulties will be proportioned to his proficiency in the pursuits which are fashionable among his contemporaries. And that proficiency in general will be proportioned to the vigor and activity of his mind. And it is well, if after all his sacrifices and exertions, his works do not resemble a lisping man or a modern ruin. We have seen in our own time great talents, intense labor, and long meditation employed in this struggle against the spirit of the age, and employed, we will not say absolutely in vain, but with dubious success and feeble applause. If these reasonings be just, no poet has ever triumphed over greater difficulties than Milton. He received a learned education. He was a profound and elegant classical scholar. He had studied all the mysteries of rabbinical literature. He was intimately acquainted with every language in modern Europe from which either pleasure or information was then to be derived. He was perhaps the only poet of later times who has been distinguished by the excellence of his Latin verse. The genius of Petrarch was scarcely of the first order, and his poems in the ancient language, though much praised by those who have never read them, are wretched compositions. Cowley, with all his admirable wit and ingenuity, had little imagination, nor, indeed, do we think his classical diction comparable to that of Milton. The authority of Johnson is against us on this point, but Johnson had studied the bad writers of the Middle Ages till he had become utterly insensible to the Augustan elegance, and was as ill-qualified to judge between two Latin styles as an habitual drunkard to set up for a wine taster. Versification in a dead language is an exotic, a far-fetched, costly, sickly imitation of that which elsewhere may be found in healthful and spontaneous perfection. The soils on which this rarity flourishes are in general as ill-suited to the production of vigorous native poetry as the flower pots of a hothouse to the growth of oaks. That the author of The Paradise Lost should have written the epistle to Manso was truly wonderful. Never before were such marked originality and such exquisite mimicry found together. Indeed, in all the Latin poems of Milton, the artificial manner indispensable to such works is admirably preserved, while at the same time his genius gives to them a peculiar charm, an air of nobleness and freedom, which distinguishes them from all other writings of the same class. They remind us of the amusements of those angelic warriors who compose the cohort of Gabriel. About him exercised heroic games the unarmed youth of heaven, but o'er their heads celestial armory, shield, helm, and spear hung high, with diamond flaming and with gold. We cannot look upon the sportive exercises for which the genius of Milton ungirds itself without catching a glimpse of the gorgeous and terrible panoply which it is accustomed to wear. The strength of his imagination triumphed over every obstacle. So intense and ardent was the fire of his mind that it not only was not suffocated beneath the weight of fuel, but penetrated the whole superincumbent mass with its own heat and radiance. It is not our intention to attempt anything like a complete examination of the poetry of Milton. The public has long been agreed as to the merit of the most remarkable passages, the incomparable harmony of the numbers, and the excellence of that style which no rival has been able to equal and no parodist to degrade which displays in their highest perfection the idiomatic power of the English tongue, and to which every ancient and every modern language has contributed something of grace, of energy, or of music. In the vast field of criticism on which we are entering, innumerable reapers have already put their sickles. Yet the harvest is so abundant that the negligent search of a straggling gleaner may be rewarded with a sheaf. The most striking characteristic of the poetry of Milton is the extreme remoteness of the associations by means of which it acts on the readers. Its effect is produced not so much by what it expresses as by what it suggests, not so much by the ideas which it directly conveys as by other ideas which are connected with them. He electrifies the mind through conductors. The most unimaginative man must understand the Iliad. 
Homer gives him no choice and requires from him no exertion, but takes the whole upon himself and sets the images in so clear a light that it is impossible to be blind to them. The works of Milton cannot be comprehended or enjoyed unless the mind of the reader cooperate with that of the writer. He does not paint a finished picture or a play for a mere passive listener. He sketches and leaves others to fill up the outline. He strikes the keynote and expects his hearer to make out the melody. We often hear of the magical influence of poetry. The expression in general means nothing, but applied to the writings of Milton, it is most appropriate. His poetry acts like an incantation. Its merit lies less in its obvious meaning than in its occult power. There would seem at first sight to be no more in his words than in other words, but they are words of enchantment. No sooner are they pronounced than the past is present and the distant near. New forms of beauty start at once into existence, and all the burial places of the memory give up their dead. Change the structure of the sentence, substitute one synonym for another, and the whole effect is destroyed. The spell loses its power, and he who should then hope to conjure with it would find himself as mistaken as Kasim in the Arabian tale, when he stood crying open wheat, open barley, to the door that obeyed no sound but open sesame. The miserable failure of Dryden in his attempt to translate into his own diction some parts of the Paradise Lost is a remarkable instance of this. In support of these observations, we may remark that scarcely any passages in the poems of Milton are more generally known or more frequently repeated than those which are little more than muster rolls of names. They are not always more appropriate or more melodious than other names, but they are charmed names. Every one of them is the first link in a long chain of associated ideas. Like the dwelling place of our infancy revisited in manhood, like the song of our country heard in a strange land, they produce upon us an effect wholly independent of their intrinsic value. One transports us back to a remote period of history. Another places us among the novel scenes and manners of a distant region. A third evokes all the dear classical recollections of childhood, the schoolroom, the dog-eared Virgil, the holiday, and the prize. A fourth brings before us the splendid phantoms of a chivalrous romance, the trophied lists, the embroidered housings, the quaint devices, the haunted forests, the enchanted gardens, the achievements of enamored knights, and the smiles of rescued princesses. In none of the works of Milton is his peculiar manner more happily displayed than in the Allegro and the Penseroso. It is impossible to conceive that the mechanism of language can be brought to a more exquisite degree of perfection. These poems differ from others as otar of roses differs from ordinary rose water, the close-packed essence from the thin, diluted mixture. They are, indeed, not so much poems as collections of hints, from each of which the reader is to make out a poem for himself. Every epithet is a text for a stanza. The Comos and the Samson Agonists are works which, though of very different merit, offer some marked points of resemblance. Both are lyric poems in the form of plays. There are perhaps no two kinds of composition so essentially dissimilar as the drama and the ode. The business of the dramatist is to keep himself out of sight and to let nothing appear but his characters. As soon as he attracts notice to his personal feelings, the illusion is broken. The effect is as unpleasant as that which is produced on the stage by the voice of a prompter or the entrance of a scene shifter. Hence it was that the tragedies of Byron were his least successful performances. They resembled those pasteboard pictures invented by the friends of children, Mr. Newberry, in which a single movable head goes round twenty different bodies so that the same face looks out upon us successfully, for the uniform of a hussar, the furs of a judge, and the rags of a beggar. In all the characters, patriots and tyrants, haters and lovers, the frown and sneer of Harold were discernible in an instant. But this species of egotism, though fatal to the drama, is the inspiration of the ode. It is the part of the lyric poet to abandon himself without reserve to his own emotions. Between these hostile elements, many great men have endeavored to effect an amalgamation, but never with complete success. The Greek drama, on the model of which the Samson was written, sprang from the ode. The dialogue was engrafted on the chorus and naturally partook of its character. The genius of the greatest of the Athenian dramatists cooperated with the circumstances under which tragedy made its first appearance. Aeschylus was, head and heart, a lyric poet. In his time, the Greeks had far more intercourse with the East than in the days of Homer. 
and they had not yet acquired that immense superiority in war, in science, and in the arts, which in the following generation led them to treat the Asiatics with contempt. From the narrative of Herodotus, it should seem that they still looked up, with the veneration of disciples, to Egypt and Assyria. At this period, accordingly, it was natural that the literature of Greece should be tinctured with the Oriental style. And that style, we think, is discernible in the works of Pindar and Aeschylus. The latter often reminds us of the Hebrew writers. The book of Job, indeed, in conduct and diction, bears a considerable resemblance to some of his dramas. Considered as plays, his works are absurd. Considered as choruses, they are above all praise. If, for instance, we examine the address of Clytemnestra to Agamemnon on his return, or the description of the seven Argive chiefs by the principles of dramatic writing, we shall instantly condemn them as monstrous. But if we forget the characters and think only of the poetry, we shall admit that it has never been surpassed in energy and magnificence. Sophocles made the Greek drama as dramatic as was consistent with its original form. His portraits of men have a sort of similarity, but it is the similarity not of a painting, but of a bas-relief. It suggests a resemblance, but it does not produce an illusion. Euripides attempted to carry the reform further, but it was a task far beyond his powers, perhaps beyond any powers. Instead of correcting what was bad, he destroyed what was excellent. He substituted crutches for stilts, bad sermons for good odes. Milton, it is well known, admired Euripides highly, much more highly than, in our opinion, Euripides deserved. Indeed, the caresses which this partiality leads our countryman to bestow on sad electress poet sometimes reminds us of the beautiful queen of fairyland kissing the long ears of bottom. At all events, there can be no doubt that this veneration for the Athenian, whether just or not, was injurious to the Samson Agonestes. Had Milton taken Aeschylus for his model, he would have given himself up to the lyric inspiration and poured out profusely all the treasures of his mind, without bestowing a thought on those dramatic properties which the nature of the work rendered it impossible to preserve. In the attempt to reconcile things in their own nature, inconsistent, he has failed, as everyone else must have failed. We cannot identify ourselves with the characters, as in a good play. We cannot identify ourselves with the poet, as in a good ode. The conflicting ingredients, like an acid and an alkali mixed, neutralize each other. We are by no means insensible to the merits of this celebrated piece, to the severe dignity of the style, the graceful and pathetic solemnity of the opening speech, or the wild and barbaric melody which gives so striking an effect to the choral passages. But we think it, we confess, the least successful effort of the genius of Milton. End of section 17. Section 18 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 13, Great Writers, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. John Milton, Poet and Patriot, Part 2. The Comus is framed on the model of the Italian mask, as the Samson is framed on the model of the Greek tragedy. It is certainly the noblest performance of the kind which exists in any language. It is as far superior to the faithful shepherdess as the faithful shepherdess is to the Aminta, or the Aminta to the Pastor Fido. It was well for Milton that he had here no Euripides to mislead him. He understood and loved the literature of modern Italy, but he did not feel for it the same veneration which he entertained for the remains of Athenian and Roman poetry, consecrated by so many lofty and endearing recollections. The faults, moreover, of his Italian predecessors were of a kind to which his mind had a deadly antipathy. He could stoop to a plain style, sometimes even to a bald style, but false brilliancy was his utter aversion. His muse had no objection to a russet attire, but she turned with disgust from the finery of Guarini, as tawdry and as paltry as the rags of a chimney sweeper on May Day. Whatever ornaments she wears are of massive gold, not only dazzling to the sight, but capable of standing the severest test of the crucible. Milton attended in the Comus to the distinction which he afterward neglected in the Samson. He made his mask what it ought to be, essentially lyrical and dramatic only in semblance. He has not attempted a fruitless struggle against a defect inherent in the nature of that species of composition, and he has therefore succeeded wherever success was not impossible. The speeches must be read as majestic soliloquies, and he who so reads them will be enraptured with their eloquence, 
their sublimity, and their music. The interruptions of the dialogue, however, impose a constraint upon the writer and break the illusion of the reader. The finest passages are those which are lyric in form as well as in spirit. I should much commend, says the excellent Sir Henry Wotton in a letter to Milton, the tragical part, if the lyrical did not ravish me with a certain Doric delicacy in your songs and odes, whereunto I must plainly confess to you, I have seen yet nothing parallel in our language. The criticism was just. It is when Milton escapes from the shackles of the dialogue, when he is discharged from the labor of uniting two incongruous styles, when he is at liberty to indulge his choral raptures without reserve, that he rises even above himself. Then, like his own good genius bursting from the earthly form and weeds of Thyrsus, he stands forth in celestial freedom and beauty. He seems to cry exultantly, Now my task is smoothly done. I can fly or I can run. To skim the earth, to soar above the clouds, to bathe in the Elysian dew of the rainbow, and to inhale the balmy smells of nard and cassia, which the musky winds of the zephyr scatter through the cedared alleys of the Hesperides. There are several of the minor poems of Milton on which we would willingly make a few remarks. Still more willingly would we enter into a detailed examination of that admirable poem, The Paradise Regained, which, strangely enough, is scarcely ever mentioned except as an instance of the blindness of the parental affection which men of letters bear toward the offspring of their intellects. That Milton was mistaken in preferring this work, excellent as it is, to The Paradise Lost, we readily admit. But we are sure that the superiority of the paradise lost to the paradise regained is not more decided than the superiority of the paradise regained to every poem which has since made its appearance. Our limits, however, prevent us from discussing the point at length. We hasten on to that extraordinary production which the general suffrage of critics has placed in the highest class of human compositions. The only poem of modern times which can be compared with the paradise lost is the Divine Comedy. The subject of Milton in some points resembled that of Dante, but he has treated it in a widely different manner. We cannot, we think, better illustrate our opinion respecting our own great poet than by contrasting him with the father of Tuscan literature. The poetry of Milton differs from that of Dante as the hieroglyphics of Egypt differed from the picture writing of Mexico. The images which Dante employs speaks for themselves. They stand simply for what they are. Those of Milton have a signification which is often discernible only to the initiated. Their value depends less on what they directly represent than what on they remotely suggest. However strange, however grotesque may be the appearance which Dante undertakes to describe, he never shrinks from describing it. He gives us the shape, the color, the sound, the smell, the taste. He counts the numbers, he measures the size. His similes are the illustrations of a traveler. Unlike those of other poets, and especially of Milton, they are introduced in a plain, business-like manner, not for the sake of any beauty in the objects from which they are drawn, not for the sake of any ornament which they may impart to the poem, but simply in order to make the meaning of the writer as clear to the reader as it is to himself. The ruins of the precipice which led from the sixth to the seventh circle of hell were like those of the rock which fell into the Adige on the south of Trent. The cataract of Phlegathon was like that of Aquacheta at the monastery of St. Benedict. The place where the heretics were confined in burning tombs resembled the vast cemetery of Arles. Now let us compare with the exact details of Dante the dim imitations of Milton. We will cite a few examples. The English poet has never thought of taking the measure of Satan. He gives us merely a vague idea of vast bulk. In one passage, the fiend lies stretched out, huge in length, floating many a rood, equal in size to the earth-born enemies of Jove, or to the sea monster which the mariner mistakes for an island. When he addresses himself to battle against the guardian angels, he stands like Tenerife or Atlas. His stature reaches the sky. Contrast with these descriptions the lines in which Dante has described the gigantic specter of Nimrod. His face seemed to me as long and as broad as the ball of St. Peter's at Rome, and his other limbs were in proportion, so that the bank, which concealed him from the waist downwards, nevertheless showed so much of him that three tall Germans would in vain have attempted to reach his hair. We are sensible that we do no justice to the admirable style of the Florentine poet, but Mr. Carey's translation is not at hand, and our version, however rude, is sufficient to illustrate our meaning. 
Once more, compare the laser house in the 11th book of the Paradise Lost with the last word of Malibulge in Dante. Milton avoids the loathsome details and takes refuge in indistinct but solemn and tremendous imagery. Despair hurrying from couch to couch to mock the wretches with his attendants. Death shaking his dart over them, but in spite of supplications, delaying the strike. What says Dante? There was such a moan there as there would be if all the sick, who between July and September are in the hospitals of Valdechiana, and of the Tuscan swamps and of Sardinia, were in one pit together, and such a stench was issuing forth as is wont to issue from decayed limbs. We will not take upon ourselves the invidious office of settling precedency between two such writers. Each in his own department is incomparable, and each, we may remark, has wisely, or fortunately, taken a subject adapted to exhibit his peculiar talent to the greatest advantage. The Divine Comedy is a personal narrative. Dante is the eyewitness and earwitness of that which he relates. He is the very man who has heard the tormented spirits crying out for the second death, who has read the dusky characters on the portal within which there is no hope, who has hidden his face from the terrors of the Gorgon, who has fled from the hooks and the seething pitch of Babarikia and Drasignazo. His own hands have grasped the shaggy sides of Lucifer. His own feet have climbed the mountain of expiation. His own brow has been marked by the purifying angel. The reader would throw aside such a tale in incredulous disgust unless it were told with the strongest air of veracity, with a sobriety even in its horrors, with the greatest precision and multiplicity in its details. The narrative of Milton in this respect differs from that of Dante, as the adventures of Amadis differ from those of Gulliver. The author of Amadis would have made his book ridiculous if he had introduced those minute particulars which give such a charm to the work of Swift. The nautical observations, the affected delicacy about names, the official documents transcribed at full length, and all the unmeaning gossip and scandal of the court springing out of nothing and tending to nothing. We are not shocked at being told that a man who lived, nobody knows when, saw many very strange sights, and we can easily abandon ourselves to the illusion of the romance. But when Lemuel Gulliver, surgeon resident at Rotherhith, tells us of pygmies and giants, flying islands and philosophizing horses, nothing but such circumstantial touches could produce for a single moment a deception on the imagination. Of all the poets who have introduced into their works the agency of supernatural beings, Milton has succeeded best. Here, Dante decidedly yields to him, and, as this is a point on which many rash and ill-considered judgments have been pronounced, we feel inclined to dwell on it a little longer. The most fatal error which a poet can possibly commit in the management of his machinery is that of attempting to philosophize too much. Milton has often been censured for ascribing to spirits many functions of which spirits must be incapable. But these objections, though sanctioned by eminent names, originate, we venture to say, in profound ignorance of the art of poetry. What is spirit? What are our own minds, the portion of spirit with which we are best acquainted? We observe certain phenomena. We cannot explain them into material causes. We therefore infer that there exists something which is not material. But of this something we have no idea. We can define it only by negatives. We can reason about it only by symbols. We use the word, but we have no image of the thing. And the business of poetry is with images and not with words. The poet uses words indeed, but they are merely the instruments of his art, not its objects. They are the materials which he is to dispose in such a manner as to present a picture to the mental eye. And if they are not so disposed, they are no more entitled to be called poetry than a bale of canvas and a box of colors to be called a painting. Logicians may reason about abstractions, but the great mass of men must have images. The strong tendency of the multitude in all ages and nations to idolatry can be explained on no other principle. The first inhabitants of Greece, there is reason to believe, worshipped one invisible deity, but the necessity of having something more definite to adore produced, in a few centuries, the innumerable crowd of gods and goddesses. In like manner, the ancient Persians thought it impious to exhibit the Creator under a human form. Yet even these transferred to the sun the worship which, in speculation, they considered due only to the supreme mind. The history of the Jews is the record of a continued struggle between pure theism, supported by the most terrible sanctions, and the strangely fascinating desire of having some visible and tangible object of adoration. 
Perhaps none of the secondary causes which Gibbon has assigned for the rapidity with which Christianity spread over the world, while Judaism scarcely ever acquired a proselyte, operated more powerfully than this feeling. God, the uncreated, the incomprehensible, the invisible, attracted few worshippers. A philosopher might admire so noble a conception, but the crowd turned away in disgust from words which presented no image to their minds. It was before deity embodied in a human form, walking among men, partaking of their infirmities, leaning on their bosoms, weeping over their graves, slumbering in the manger, bleeding on the cross, that the prejudices of the synagogue and the doubts of the academy and the pride of the portico and the fasces of the lictor and the swords of thirty legions were humbled in the dust. Soon after Christianity had achieved its triumph, the principle which had assisted it began to corrupt it. It became a new paganism. Patron saints assumed the offices of household gods. St. George took the place of Mars. St. Elmo consoled the mariner for the loss of Castor and Pollux. The Virgin Mother and Cecilia succeeded to Venus and the Muses. The fascination of sex and loveliness was again joined to that of celestial dignity, and the homage of chivalry was blended with that of religion. Reformers have often made a stand against these feelings, but never with more than apparent and partial success. The men who demolished the images in cathedrals have not always been able to demolish those which were enshrined in their minds. It would not be difficult to show that in politics the same rule holds good. Doctrines, we are afraid, must generally be embodied before they can excite a strong public feeling. The multitude is more easily interested for the most unmeaning badge or the most insignificant name than for the most important principle. From these considerations, we infer that no poet who should affect that metaphysical accuracy for the want of which Milton has been blamed would escape a disgraceful failure. Still, however, there was another extreme, which, though far less dangerous, was also to be avoided. The imaginations of men are in a great measure under the control of their opinions. The most exquisite art of poetical coloring can produce no illusion when it is employed to represent that which is at once perceived to be incongruous and absurd. Milton wrote in an age of philosophers and theologians. It was necessary, therefore, for him to abstain from giving such a shock to their understandings as might break the charm for which it was his object to throw over their imaginations. This is the real explanation of the indistinctness and inconsistency with which he has often been reproached. Dr. Johnson acknowledges that it was absolutely necessary that the spirit should be clothed with material forms. But, says he, the poet should have secured the consistency of his system by keeping immateriality out of sight and seducing the reader to drop it from his thoughts. This is easily said, but what if Milton could not seduce his readers to drop immateriality from their thoughts? What if the contrary opinion had taken so full a possession of the minds of men as to leave no room even for the half-belief which poetry requires? Such we suspect to have been the case. It was impossible for the poet to adopt altogether the material or the immaterial system. He therefore took his stand on the debatable ground. He left the whole in ambiguity. He has doubtless, by so doing, laid himself open to the charge of inconsistency. But, though philosophically in the wrong, we cannot but believe that he was poetically in the right. This task, which almost any other writer would have found impracticable, was easy to him. The peculiar art which he possessed of communicating his meaning circuitously through a long succession of associated ideas, and of intimating more than he expressed, enabled him to disguise those incongruities which he could not avoid. Poetry which relates to the beings of another world ought to be at once mysterious and picturesque. That of Milton is so. That of Dante is picturesque indeed beyond any that ever was written. Its effect approaches to that produced by the pencil or the chisel but it is picturesque to the exclusion of all mystery. There is a fault on the right side, a fault inseparable from the plan of Dante's poem, which, as we have already observed, rendered the utmost accuracy of description necessary. Still, it is a fault. The supernatural agents excite an interest, but it is not the interest which is proper to supernatural agents. We feel that we could talk to the ghosts and demons without any emotion of unearthly awe. We could, like Don Juan, ask them to supper and eat heartily in their company. Dante's angels are our good men with wings. His devils are spiteful, ugly executioners. His dead men are merely living men in strange situations. The scene which passes between the poet and Farinata is justly celebrated. Still, Farinata in the burning tomb is exactly what Farinata would have been at an auto de fe. 
Nothing can be more touching than the first interview of Dante and Beatrice. Yet what is it but a lovely woman chiding with sweet, austere composure the lover for whose affection she is grateful, but whose vices she reprobates? The feelings which give the passage its charm would suit the streets of Florence as well as the summit of the Mount of Purgatory. The spirits of Milton are unlike those of almost all other writers. His fiends, in particular, are wonderful creations. They are not metaphysical abstractions. They are not wicked men. They are not ugly beasts. They have no horns, no tails, none of the fee fall foam of Tasso and Klopstock. They have just enough in common with human nature to be intelligible to human beings. Their characters are, like their forms, marked by a certain dim resemblance to those of men, but exaggerated to gigantic dimensions and veiled in mysterious gloom. Perhaps the gods and demons of Aeschylus may best bear a comparison with the angels and devils of Milton. The style of the Athenian had, as we have remarked, something of the oriental character, and the same peculiarity may be traced in his mythology. It has nothing of the amenity and elegance which we generally find in the superstitions of Greece. All is rugged, barbaric, and colossal. The legends of Aeschylus seem to harmonize less with the fragrant groves and graceful porticos in which his countrymen paid their vows to the god of light and goddess of desire than with those huge and grotesque labyrinths of eternal granite in which Egypt enshrined her mystic Osiris, or in which Hindustan still bows down to her seven-headed idols. His favorite gods are those of the elder generation, the sons of heaven and earth, compared with whom Jupiter himself was a stripling and an upstart, the gigantic titans and the inexorable furies. Foremost among his creations of this class stands Prometheus, half-fiend, half-redeemer, the friend of man, the sullen and implacable enemy of heaven. Prometheus bears undoubtedly a considerable resemblance to the Satan of Milton. In both we find the same impatience of control, the same ferocity, the same unconquerable pride. In both characters also are mingled, though in very different proportions, the same kind of generous feelings. Prometheus, however, is hardly superhuman enough. He talks too much of his chains and his uneasy posture. He is rather too much depressed and agitated. His resolution seems to depend on the knowledge which he possesses that he holds the fate of his torturer in his hands and that the hour of his release will surely come. But Satan is a creature of another sphere. The might of his intellectual nature is victorious over the extremity of pain. Amidst agonies which cannot be conceived without horror, he deliberates, resolves, and even exults. Against the sword of Michael, against the thunder of Jehovah, against the flaming lake, and the moral burning with solid fire, against the prospect of an eternity of unintermitted misery, his spirit bears up unbroken, resting on its own innate energies, requiring no support from anything external, nor even from hope itself. To return for a moment to the parallel which we have been attempting to draw between Milton and Dante, we would add that the poetry of these great men has in a considerable degree taken its character from their moral qualities. They are not egotists. They rarely obtrude their idiosyncrasies on their readers. They have nothing in common with those modern beggars for fame who extort a pittance from the compassion of the inexperienced by exposing the nakedness and sores of their minds. Yet it would be difficult to name two writers whose works have been more completely, though undesignedly, colored by their personal feelings. The character of Milton was peculiarly distinguished by loftiness of spirit and that of Dante by intensity of feeling. In every line of the Divine Comedy, we discern the asperity which is produced by pride struggling with misery. There is perhaps no work in the world so deeply and uniformly sorrowful. The melancholy of Dante was no fantastic caprice. It was not, as far as at this distance of time can be judged, the effect of external circumstances. It was from within. Neither love or glory, neither the conflicts of earth, nor the hope of heaven could dispel it. It turned every consolation and every pleasure into its own nature. It resembled that noxious Sardinian soil of which the intense bitterness is said to have been perceptible even in its honey. His mind was, in the noble language of the Hebrew poet, a land of darkness as darkness itself, and where the light was as darkness. The gloom of his character discolors all the passions of men and all the face of nature, and tinges with its own livid hue the flowers of paradise and the glories of the eternal throne. All the portraits of him are singularly characteristic. No person can look on the features, noble even to ruggedness, the dark furrows of the cheek, the haggard and woeful stare of the eye, the sullen and contemptuous curve of the lip, and doubt that they belong to a man too proud and too sensitive to be happy. 
Milton was, like Dante, a statesman and a lover, and like Dante, he had been unfortunate in ambition and in love. He had survived his health and his sight, the comforts of his home, and the prosperity of his party. Of the great men by whom he had been distinguished at his entrance into life, some had been taken away from the evil to come, some had carried into foreign climates their unconquerable hatred of oppression, some were pining in dungeons, and some had poured forth their blood on scaffolds. Venal and licentious scribblers, with just sufficient talent to clothe the thoughts of a pander in the style of a bellman, were now the favorite writers of the sovereign and of the public. It was a loathsome herd, which could be compared to nothing so fitly as to the rabble of Comus, grotesque monsters, half bestial, half human, dripping with wine, bloated with gluttony, and reeling in obscene dances. Amidst these that fair muse was placed, like the chaste lady of the mask, lofty, spotless, and serene, to be chattered at and pointed at and grinned at by the whole rout of satyrs and goblins. If ever despondency and asperity could be excused in any man, they might have been excused in Milton. But the strength of his mind overcame every calamity. Neither blindness, nor gout, nor age, nor penury, nor domestic afflictions, nor political disappointments, nor abuse, nor prescription, nor neglect, had power to disturb his sedate and majestic patience. His spirits do not seem to have been high, but they were singularly equable. His temper was serious, perhaps stern, but it was a temper which no sufferings could render sullen or fretful. Such as it was when, on the eve of great events, he returned from his travels in the prime of health and manly beauty, loaded with literary distinctions, and glowing with patriotic hopes, such it continued to be, after having experienced every calamity which is incident to our nature, old, poor, sightless, and disgraced, he retired to his hovel to die. Hence it was, that though he wrote The Paradise Lost at a time of life when images of beauty and tenderness are in general beginning to fade, even from those minds in which they have not been effaced by anxiety and disappointment, he adorned it with all that is most lovely and delightful in the physical and in the moral world. Neither Theocritus nor Aristo had a finer or more healthful sense of the pleasantness of external objects, or loved better to luxuriate amidst sunbeams and flowers, the songs of nightingales, the juice of summer fruits, and the coolness of shady fountains. His conception of love unites all the voluptuousness of the Oriental harem, and all the gallantry of the chivalric tournament with all the pure and quiet affection of an English fireside. His poetry reminds us of the miracles of alpine scenery. Nooks and dells, beautiful as fairyland, are embosomed in its most rugged and gigantic elevations. The roses and myrtles bloom unchilled on the verge of an avalanche. End of section 18